Welcome to Billionaire Romance Audiobooks. Please subscribe to this YouTube channel. It helps more than you know and is the best way to stay up to date on our latest releases. When you subscribe, you'll also get notified when we release new videos. Cowboy Protector A Bad Boy Secret Baby Romance Audiobook Book 2 of the Accidental Love Series By Jessica Fox Narrated by Google Play Auto Narrated Voice. Audio copyright 2024 BFA Publishing. Blurbs. I'm hell bent on claiming Bryn, even if it goes against doctor's orders. Being stuck in a hospital bed for seven days is not how I wanted to spend time here in my hometown in Texas. But that bucking Bronco at the rodeo had other plans for me. Bruised tailbone banged up ribs in a cracked tibia. Sadly, my rodeo days might be over. One thing that's brightening my bedridden days here is Nurse Bryn. Her warm smile, caring touch and killer curves under that uniform are driving me wild. And she's sneaking me sodas behind her boss's back. Score. With every massage from her we're getting close. A little too close. Nurses getting romantically involved with patients is completely off-limits. She could lose her job, and I could have this whole town talking trash about me. I don't care. Life's short and we only live once. The doctor in charge has noticed the fire between Bryn and me, and we're paying the price. He's being an absolute jerk to me, and he's trying to control Bryn's every move. He has ulterior motives and wants her all for himself. There's no way I'll let that happen. I'll do whatever it takes to protect Bryn from this snake. The stakes are high, but I'm determined to show Bryn what this cowboy is made of and give her the ride of her life. Roman It felt good to hear the crowd cheering for me. My hometown of Carthage, Texas had always held my most avid supporters, and I needed all the support that I could get. Sitting atop a 1,500-pound bull, my hand tethered to it with a bull rope, I gripped the leather lacing, making sure it didn't slip. All that was left to do was to give the cowboys who held the bull inside the chute a nod. Then they'd set him free, and my ride would begin. Are you ready? The sound of the announcer's voice over the loudspeaker did nothing to calm my nerves. Not that I was scared, I had done this plenty of times before. Adrenaline coursed through my veins, making the blood inside them boil. Sweat formed on my forehead, the way it always did when I was in this particular position. The not knowing what would happen was the hardest part of bull riding. You could watch the same bull do its thing 20 times, and not two of those times would be exactly the same. Rodeo fans, allow me to introduce you to Old Yeller, the bull beneath our hometown rider, Roman Etheridge, the announcer said. This is the young bull's debut. Raised right here in Carthage, Texas, on the Whisper Ranch, owned by the Gentry Brothers. Roman is not only a rodeo cowboy. He's also the man who raised this young bull from a little calf. Roman manages the bucking bull breeding program for Whisper Ranch. What better cowboy to introduce this bull to the world of rodeo? The crowd roared, and I began to get pumped up for the ride. I nodded my head, signaling the cowboys to release Old Yeller. He bucked forward, nearly unseating me right there in the chute. I held on tight though, tightening my grip around the rope with both hands. The bull continued to get more excited, jumping up and down. Settle down, boy. It's just me, your old buddy from the ranch. Now let's give these people a good show. Once the bull settled down, I leaned forward, gripping the rope with all my strength. The cowboy in charge of opening the chute asked, You ready, Roman? As I'll ever be. I gave one more nod and this time, the gate came open, and out we slipped like molten lava. The bull jumped up in the air, and then started running in a circle, coming back around to where he had started. I tried my best to stay on top of him, but when he came down from a jump, my hand slipped along with the rest of me. Unfortunately, my hand didn't slip all the way out of the rope, leaving me dangling off the side of the monstrous bull who acted like we'd never met before. Yeller slowed down. The bull wasn't listening to me at all, as he continued to jump, kick, snort, and bellow like he was being beaten to death. Which he was not. 
Other than having me on his back, nothing else was happening to him. As the bull came around again, I was able to swing my other hand onto the rope and hold tightly once more, pulling myself back up onto the bull's back. I wasn't going to get any points now, since I'd used both hands. But the people in the stands cheered me on anyway. They cheered so loud I could barely hear anything else. I waved to them as we went by, and tried to smile, but it felt like my face would break with how hard I had been clenching my jaw. Focused on trying to get my hand free from the rope, I looked at the knot that had gotten screwed up somehow. Come on! I shouted as the knot refused to loosen. The rodeo clowns moved around the bull, trying to get him to follow them out of the arena so that they could help me get off the beast. One of them whistled. Over here, yeller. His bright red suspenders held up old blue jean shorts that were three sizes too big for him. He took his oversized cowboy hat off and began waving it in the bull's face to get his attention. The bull was not impressed, and instead of following the clowns, he turned and ran directly toward the stands. Oh, damn. I yelled as we headed right for them. I leaned forward and wrapped my arms tightly around the beast's neck just in time to avoid getting head-butted by him when he jumped up into the air once again. There was nothing I could do. Old Yeller was headed for the tall fence that surrounded the arena. He meant to get the hell out of there and fast. And I was stuck to him, going along for the ride whether I wanted to or not. I began fishing for a handhold as best I could with only one arm to work with. In the meantime, Old Yeller kept scrambling along as fast as he could go, and it must have been pretty darn fast, because the sounds of those clowns out there screaming at me had begun to fade away behind us. But before we could make it to the fence, Old Yeller skidded to a stop, somehow wrenching my hand free of the rope. He turned me loose with one mighty buck that left me lying in the dirt. All I could see was his belly and my ribs felt like they'd just been stepped on by an elephant. The next thing I knew, he'd picked me up with his horns and tossed me like a rag doll. I flew through the air, heading for a future starring nothing but sky and birds who didn't give two hoots about the predicament I was currently in. This is it. I'm a goner for sure this time. Before the last bit of air left my lungs, I came down hard on my ass, the rest of the breath knocked right out of me. For a moment, I just sat there, looking at the stands, but not seeing anything but a blurry scene. I heard nothing at all, the fans had gone silent. Then one voice penetrated the silence as a little girl shrieked, Help him! The bull's coming for him again. Turning my head, I saw the bull I'd raised from a tiny calf charging toward me. Suddenly someone grabbed me by the shoulders and began pulling me backward at a fast speed. But it wasn't fast enough. The bull got to me and managed to get one last stomp in, breaking my leg, before a couple of cowboys caught him with their ropes, stopping him from doing any more damage to my body. Unable to breathe, I heard the siren as the ambulance came into the arena now that the bull had been cleared out of it. The light faded a little at a time until there was no light left, and I heard no more. The sound of something beeping woke me up. I tried to open my eyes, but it was extremely difficult. Finally, I managed the simple task, only to find a small figure moving about the room. I noticed that my left leg was lifted into the air by some sort of contraption. There was a tightness in my chest. I also felt something underneath me, keeping my ass off the bed. With all the lines hooked up to me, it took me no time at all to realize where I was, and then I remembered why I was there in the first place. That damn bull. The figure turned around and moved toward me. The closer it got, the better I could make out that it was a pretty girl. You're awake. Good. She leaned over me, the scent of flowers filling my nose. You've been asleep for a few hours. Are you in any pain? Her name tag said Bryn. And her eyes were green. A blonde ponytail hung down her back. She was the prettiest girl I'd ever seen. Hi. I smiled at her and it hurt to do that, but I did it anyway. Hi, she said as she smiled back at me before putting something against my mouth. You shouldn't try to smile. Your lower lip is split a little. Not enough to require stitches, but enough to bleed if you try to smile. Here, drink some water. It'll help. She looked around, and I saw her pick up a cup off a table and then come back to me. 
Thank you, I said as I sipped on the straw, not worrying about anything with her looking after me. No problem, cowboy, she said, and I noticed that her voice had a thin twang to it. Do you need anything for pain? You were given some by the paramedics, but it might have begun to wear off by now. I don't want you in any pain. That's nice of you. It's my job. She put her fingers on the inside of my wrist, lifting it up a little. Even though I was mostly numb, I felt a bit of electricity coming from her touch. Your pulse is good. She eased my hand back to lie on the bed. You are one tough dude, Mr. Etheridge. Roman, I said. Mr. Etheridge is my dad. Roman. She ran her finger over her name tag. I'm Bryn. I'll be your day nurse while you're staying with us at Carthage Hospital. How long am I going to be here? I was fine right where I was, but it wasn't easy finding conversation topics, and I wanted her to keep talking to me. I'm not sure. Dr. Green will be in to see you shortly. She pulled out her cell phone and tapped on the screen. I'm letting him know that you're awake now. He'll be in soon to explain your injuries. Why can't you tell me what they are? I didn't know who Dr. Green was, but I knew I would much rather hear her sweet voice delivering the news to me than anyone else's. I'm not really supposed to do that, she said and put her phone away. Dr. Green will do that. So the pain, are you in any? I don't feel a thing, I lied, not wanting her to think I was some wimpy guy who cried over a little or a lot of pain. Shaking her head, she said, that's not good. If you feel nothing, then you might have spinal cord injuries, which would mean surgery for you. I can feel. I'm just not feeling any pain. I'm tough, like you said. Don't let that bravado get in the way of me treating your pain, Roman. I don't care who you are or how well your body is built. Everyone feels pain. She softly ran her hand over my left leg that was strung up. I want to know if this is too high. Are you uncomfortable? Does your hip feel like it's in a bind? Nah. There was no real pain in my leg. Is my leg broken? Dr. Green will tell you about that. So it is broken? I didn't say that. You can just tell me. I won't tattle on you. She looked at the door which was closed, then back at me as she bit her lower lip. No. I can't. It seemed to me that she was a little afraid of this doctor she'd told me was coming to see me. Is this guy mean? Or is it a woman? The doctor is a man, she told me, straightening the blanket that covered me. And he's not mean, just tricked. He's a great doctor and you can trust him. Now, I really need you to tell me if you need anything for pain and where it hurts. I had the feeling she would get into trouble with the strict doctor if I didn't tell her the truth. My ass hurts. My chest is tight and it's uncomfortable. Thank you. Her smile lit me up inside. I'll put you on a morphine drip. It will allow you to give yourself a boost of painkillers every half hour. But only use it if you need it. I don't want you using it only to feel high. It's so easy to get addicted to pain medication. Thanks for caring. I could sense that she was a kind person. I'll use it responsibly. The door opened, and in stepped the strict doctor. His salt and pepper hair told me he was middle-aged, and his lips formed one thin line. He looked strict too. I'm Dr. Green, Mr. Etheridge. Call me Roman. He looked at the chart in his hands, instead of looking at me. Have you been given anything for pain? He looked at Bryn with a burning expression as if daring her to have done something wrong. I just told the nurse that I am experiencing some pain and she's about to hook me up, I said, trying to draw his attention off her. Good, he huffed as he finally looked at me. Well, you've really done a number on yourself. You have bruised ribs on both sides of your chest. I thought so. It actually felt like they were broken, but I took his word for them just being bruised. You have a severely bruised coccyx, which is also quite swollen. That's why we have that donut underneath you, to alleviate the pressure on it. The lower vertebra suffered trauma as well. Your left tibia has a hairline fracture, 
which is lucky for you because there's a hoof print right in the middle of your shin that's black and blue. As a matter of fact, you have hoof prints on your chest too. I'm not sure how you managed not to break more bones in your body. I drink milk every single morning, and I take vitamin D supplements. When you ride bulls, it pays to keep your bones strong. Bryn came up beside me, holding a bag of something clear, then hooking it onto the contraption that held some other bags of fluid. It's very smart of you to think about keeping your bones and your body in great shape if you're going to be doing dangerous activities. Nurse Davis, please refrain from commenting on a patient's physique, the doctor said. It's unprofessional. Sorry, sir. Her eyes came to mine. I apologize for what I said. No need. I looked at the stern doctor. It's cool, man. She didn't offend me at all. I'm dying for a Dr. Pepper. Y'all got any around here? No. You can't have any soda right now. And I'm sure she didn't offend you with her remark. It's not you I'm worried about. He put the clipboard into the little box at the end of the hospital bed. You'll be staying here for about a week or so. A week? I didn't want to be laid up that long. And what about my leg being up like this? How am I supposed to go to the bathroom or take a shower? You won't be able to get up to do those things. A nurse will help you when you need to use the toilet. And you'll be given sponge baths. The sponge bath was more than okay with me. Especially if Bryn would be the one doing them. But the help with the bathroom was not. I want to be able to go to the bathroom by myself. Then you shouldn't have gotten onto the back of a thousand pound animal, the doc said without an ounce of emotion in his expression or his voice. It was fifteen hundred pounds, for your information. And I didn't know I would end up not being able to go to the bathroom without help. Well, now you know. He looked at Bryn. Monitor him for 15 minutes to make sure he doesn't have a bad reaction to the morphine, then get to the other patients. Yes, Dr. Green, she said with reverence in her voice. I'll check on you each morning when I make my rounds, Mr. Etheridge. If you need anything, just press the nurse's button on your bed. And then he left without even saying goodbye. He's a real treat. I rolled my eyes at Bryn with the sarcastic remark. I saw the little grin that she tried to fight off, and for a moment all the pain left my chest. If I could coax some of those sweet smiles from her each day, I'd be healed in no time. Bryn He's adorable, I said with a sigh as I sipped hot coffee from a styrofoam cup in the nurse's lounge. He's beaten up pretty good too. But you wouldn't know it from the way he's talking. He's as tough as they come. Don't go falling in love, Bryn, Bethany, a fellow nurse, teased me. Dr. Green would kill me if I did anything remotely romantic with any patient. I knew better than to do anything that was against the doctor's rules. I bet he's a real cowboy, Tammy, another nurse said with a sigh. Hardworking, and doesn't complain about anything. You're right about that. The only thing he asked for was a Dr. Pepper, which the doctor refused him for some odd reason. I didn't see why Roman couldn't have a soda if he wanted one, but I wasn't about to question Dr. Green. You should totally take one to him, Bryn. Some doctors can be jerks, Bethany said, Dr. Green being one of the biggest ones who works here. I didn't like to talk about people behind their backs. And I sure as hell wasn't going to say bad things about the man who'd taken me under his wing since I'd first shown up to intern for his office. He's strict but fair an utter professional at all times too. I shouldn't even have questioned why he didn't want the patient to have a soda. Um, you are human, right? Tammy asked, then laughed. Sometimes you can be such a Stepford. A what? I asked. You know, Tammy said, like the movie Stepford Wives. The women were all very pretty and totally subservient to their husbands. That's you, but you're that way with Dr. Green instead of a husband. I am not. There was no way I would have ever considered myself to be subservient. He's my boss, Tammy. I'm supposed to follow his orders. Bethany added her two cents, saying, But do you have to enjoy doing it so thoroughly? 
It's not like I enjoy following orders, Bethany. I couldn't believe these two ganging up on me. You both follow orders too. At least we gripe about it though, Tammy said as her hands moved to rest on her ample hips. That's all we're really saying to you, Bryn. Stop thinking that Dr. Green is always right. He's not. And he's not even as fair as you say he is, either. Personally, I see him as a control freak. And since you're the only one who actually allows him to control you, he's turned you into his favorite puppet. I would show them. They would see that I wasn't some puppet for the doctor. Going to the fridge, I found a couple of cans of Dr. Pepper inside and grabbed one. You two are wrong about me. I stomped away, on a mission now to get the carbonated beverage to the poor cowboy who was in need of something fizzy and sweet. I am not anyone's puppet. Grumbling to myself as I went into the hallway, I missed seeing the man who had obviously spotted me. Nurse Davis, where do you think you're going with that thing? It was Dr. Green, and the frown he wore told me he had already figured me out. So I had to come up with something quick. I'm nowhere, sir. You looked like you were definitely heading somewhere. He looked up the hallway, his eyes on the door to Roman's room. You wouldn't be going against my order that he not have any soda right now, would you? No, sir. But I did want to know why he would deprive the poor broken man of anything. May I ask you why you told him that he couldn't have any soda? I mean, for my own medical knowledge. Not that I'm trying to challenge your decision. His dark brows drew together as anger became clear in his expression. Do you have any idea how sugar-laden that soda is? Yes. I nodded. But how can a little sugar hurt him? You've seen the bruises on his body. He's got a lot of healing to do, and sugary substances won't help him do that. Plus, there's caffeine in that soda, and that will interact with the morphine and make it less effective than he needs it to be right now. Even though he may be acting tough, that boy is in a lot of pain right now. He was just putting up a front to impress you. He put a hand on my shoulder. I saw the way he looked at you, Bryn. And I noticed the way you looked at him, too. I froze at that comment. I didn't look at him any differently than I look at any other patient doctor, I lied. I hadn't realized I'd been such an open book while in Roman's company. Don't try to fool me. He removed his hand. I'm too old and wise to ever believe that lie you just told me. If I looked at him in any way that was unbecoming of a nurse, then I am sorry. And I will be sure to watch myself whenever I have to check up on him. I lifted the can of soda. As for this, it's mine. I had no intentions of giving it to anyone but myself. Bryn, if you continue lying to me, there will be consequences. He looked at the door across the hall from us. That storeroom looks like the perfect place for a timeout. A timeout? Does he think I'm some spoiled child? You know what I mean. Put that thing in the trash and get on with your duties, he ordered. Of course, Dr. Green. I did not like the way he treated me, as if I were some child who needed to be punished. Just as I turned to go back to the nurse's lounge to put the soda back into the fridge, I felt his fingers graze up my arm. Then he rested his hand on my shoulder, turning me back to face him. Hey. You know that I care about you, right? I nodded, though I wasn't sure what he was getting at. I know you do. Good. I just don't want you to get hurt. Cowboys are nothing but trouble. You don't need any trouble in your life. You're going places, Bryn. Someone like that self-destructive kid would only slow you down. He could even bring you down to his level, if you let him. He placed his hand on my cheek, looking at me as if I were the only person around, which I was not, as Tammy and Bethany had just come out of the lounge and into the hallway. I cut my eyes at them as they moved past us, giggling. Insanely embarrassed, I felt my cheeks heating with a fierce blush. I'm not about to let anyone bring me down. Good. Because you deserve to be happy. But you need to be careful of who you're happy with. When you're as gifted as you are, you have to be on the lookout for those individuals who are looking to take advantage of you. 
that boy in there is definitely looking to take advantage of your generous nature. But he'll give you nothing in return. You do understand what I'm saying, right? I understand. The words felt thick in my throat, as I knew exactly what he was saying. I honestly doubted whether he had the right to tell me such things. But I had no idea how to say that to him without sounding rude. Thank you for your concern, Dr. Green. That's all I have to say about that. Just know what I said is only for your own good. He removed his hand from my shoulder. Now go ahead and get rid of that thing. I'm going to put it back where I found it. So, you were going to give it to him, he said with a smile. I wasn't going to admit a thing. No, sir. I was not going to give this to him. When he brought up the drink, it made me crave it myself. But after talking to you, and this thing stirring up so much, I've decided that I no longer want it. Hum. He didn't seem to know whether to believe me or not. Don't you see that the boy has already manipulated your mind? I could not believe him. I can't see how he's managed to do that in the few minutes I was in that room with him. He said he wants something, and you end up wanting the same thing. Don't be a sheep, Bryn. You're much too smart for that. I almost wanted to tell him the truth so that he wouldn't think I was some dumb sheep. But I couldn't bring myself to do that. I'll watch myself when I'm around him, like I said before. See that you do. You know, his looks will diminish as he ages. You might think he's attractive right now, but the life he's living will ensure he looks 90 by the time he's only 40. Mark my words. I've never seen a cowboy who hasn't aged remarkably badly. It almost seemed as if the doctor was jealous of Roman. What makes you think that I think he's attractive? With a chuckle, he put his hand back on my shoulder. This time his thumb grazed my chin. I can read you like a book, girl. How long have we known each other? I was 18 when I walked into your office for the internship. I'm 22 now. So about four years. Plenty long enough for me to know who you really are. You know that I think the world of you, and I know you're going places. Like when you join me to take on jobs for Doctors Without Borders. I can count on you. I can trust you. I've always got your back. Just know that. He'd begun to make me feel a bit uncomfortable with all the touching, so I took a step back to put some space between us and make it so he couldn't touch me anymore. I know that, Dr. Green. I understand you perfectly, too. I'll keep myself in check. I've got patience to see to now. Yes, you do, he went back to stoic mode and strode away from me. So what was that all about? Tammy asked as I turned around and found her walking up to me. Well, he thinks I've got a crush on the broken cowboy. I held up the can of soda. And he was sure I was taking this to him, too. Man, he's good, isn't he? Like he can read your mind or something. I guess he does have a point, though. I mean, we did just meet. And how do I know that cowboy isn't trying to take advantage of me? It's impossible to take advantage of someone when you share a mutual attraction, Bryn, she shrugged. Maybe you should at least give him the soda before you make any final judgments about him. You're right. I looked over my shoulder to check that the doctor was nowhere to be seen. What the doc doesn't know won't hurt him. I don't think a little Dr. Pepper will take the edge off the morphine. And now that I can see that he's sort of jealous of Roman, I know he did it out of spite. Tammy smiled. So you're okay then? I mean, he really worked you over. It was that noticeable? I winced with embarrassment. With a nod, she said, I think you should try to distance yourself from that man. Not the cowboy, the doctor. He gives off a weird vibe when he's with you. I don't like it at all. It's not quite fatherly either. It's more like he has this idea that you're his in some way. You know what I mean? Not at all. I didn't see Dr. Green that way. He's my mentor, that's all he is to me. He's trying to train me so that I can be the professional that I'm seeking to be. I trust him. Tammy looked dubious. I don't know, Bryn. I'm not sure it's a good idea to trust him 
with anything. You don't even know the man well enough to be talking bad about him. I arched an eyebrow at her accusingly. She was just trying to drive a wedge between me and the doctor. The bad part was that the doctor had warned me that people might try to do this. So they could shove me out of the way to make room for them to be mentored by him. Maybe you're into him, she said with a snarky sound to her voice. Sorry I didn't realize that sooner. I am not into him in that way. Well, he's into you. You can't really be that blind, Bryn. Whatever, Tammy. I'm done with this conversation. I've got work to do, and so do you. We need to get back to it, and stop talking about dumb things that don't matter at all. Every direction I turned toward seemed to lead to me feeling awkward, and sort of attacked, and I was done feeling that way. Shoving the can of soda into my pocket, I headed toward Roman's room. I wasn't sure if I would give it to him, or not. But I would be the one making that decision and I promised myself that I wouldn't let what anyone else said influence my decision in the least. No matter what, I was going to try and be a professional in this situation. It didn't matter how good-looking the cowboy was, he was just a patient. I had to think of him in that way, and in that way only. Dr. Green was right. I had been looking at Roman with stars in my eyes. I had to stop doing that. Even if Roman had looked at me that way first. That didn't matter at all. If I were going to be the professional that I wanted to be, I had to not think about how a person looked. I couldn't care if they had amazing eyes or lush, thick dark waves of hair. I had to deal with their symptoms. I had to help them alleviate their pain. I had to help them get back on the road to good health again, and nothing more than that. In my career, there were sure to be handsome men who would come and go. I couldn't go falling for any of them. And I had to maintain professionalism, so that they wouldn't fall for me. Since Roman was the first patient that I had immediately been attracted to, he would be the one I would learn from. I would learn to separate my personal and professional sides. I had to learn how to do that anyway. Letting myself be around him more would help me find ways to make that separation. Inundating myself in the attraction and learning how to make it not matter was my mission. I would be the epitome of professionalism. No matter how hard it would be to learn, I would learn to do it. Roman The morphine took me under very quickly. While my eyes were closed, I could still hear things. I heard the sound of the door opening and cowboy boots clicking over the tile floor. When I opened my eyes, I saw my friend and boss coming to my bedside. Holy cow, Roman. What did you do to yourself now? Tyrell asked. I was thrown off a mean bull, I said, groaning at the pain in my leg. Well, your mother would be proud of you for getting yourself all banged up. Can you believe I was going to be the next great bucking bull rider? I joked. He laughed at me. You can't ride bulls forever, son he said in a serious tone. You're right about that. 30 is getting up there where bull riding is concerned. I knew my riding days were getting behind me. Pointing to my leg that was strung up in a sling, I said, the doc said he only managed to give me a hairline fracture. And my ribs are merely bruised, not broken. Old Yeller tossed me around pretty good too. I landed on my ass, and it messed up my tailbone and lower vertebra but nothing's broken back there. No head trauma so that's good, Tyrell pointed out. Did they tell you how long they're gonna keep you here? I think they said something about it, but to tell you the truth, the cute nurse had me distracted, I wasn't able to listen to much that was said. I tried my best not to smile, and bust my lip back open as I thought about her. She's gonna make my stay here very pleasant. I can already tell. Bubba, the head rodeo clown, called to tell me what happened to you. He said the bull was overly brutal. He took a seat in the chair next to my bed, crossing his legs as he leaned back. We don't want our bulls killing people, Roman. I know. And I've got to agree with Bubba. The bull was out for vengeance just because I sat on his back. Even once I was off and he was free of me, he kept coming back, trying to do me in. 
I knew that wasn't something we wanted in our bucking bulls. I've been using Spanish fighting bulls to sire the heck cows. Both are highly aggressive breeds, and I think I've made their calves too mean. Old Yeller is the first of that breed lined to be taken to the rodeo. I've only bred four more like him. All the other calves turned out to be females. Instead of using those bulls and cows for the rodeo, what do you think about using them for breeding purposes only? He asked. You could always breed them to a less aggressive cow, and the cows to less aggressive bulls like a Brahmin breed. The offspring will look ominous, but they shouldn't be prone to attacking the riders once they've bucked them off. That's a good idea. I'll get on that once I get back on top of my game. No rush. It's not like you're hurting for money or anything like that, Mr. Millionaire. I never get tired of hearing that, Tyrell. Thanks to you for giving me that job on Whisper Ranch, I've been able to make more out of myself than I ever thought a dumb old cowboy could. Tyrell Gentry and his brothers gave everyone who worked for them a percentage of the company's stock, and most of us had made millions off it. His expression turned serious, and he leaned forward. Listen, I know you don't like being told what to do, but I'm gonna say this anyway. It's time to hang up that bull rope for good. You need to hire some professional riders to try out the bulls at the ranch, before we ever take them to any other rodeo arena again. We cannot have a reputation for breeding bulls that send riders to the hospital. I completely agree. It hurt as I sighed, so I gave myself a quick pump of morphine. Broken ribs are the worst, but bruised ribs ain't much better. The painkilling medication kicked in quickly. Ah, that's much better. Tyrell knew me well. I didn't like being told what to do, like he'd said. But I knew he was just looking out for me. I'll hire some young cowboys to take over the riding, and I'll stick to the breeding. Good. I'm glad you agree with me on that. I don't want to see you hurt again. Don't worry. I know better than to try riding the meanest bulls in the world when they're out for blood. I just wish I had known the young bull had that mean streak in him before I climbed onto his back. Me too. He took another good look at me and shook his head and sighed. After looking down at the floor for a brief moment, he looked back up at me with a twinkle in his eye. So how's your love life? He asked with a grin. Any new girls at church? I gave him a wry grin. Nope, no one has caught my eye at church. They're all nice as can be, but I need a little more than merely nice. Well, I'm sure the right one is out there somewhere. You just gotta keep on praying. I groaned as I rubbed my side. You're preaching to the choir. After three years with that crazy stalker girl making my life miserable, I'm only looking in the best places for female companionship. Well, how were you to know that Lola had escaped from the psych ward in Dallas when you met her at that bar? He shook his head. She came off as sane for the better part of a year. And then she went insane and tried to take me with her. It's been a year since the authorities tracked her down and took her back to the asylum. I've been pretty gun-shy this last year. But I think I'm ready to try to get back on the old romantic relationship horse. My day nurse made some sparks fly, if you know what I'm saying. A nurse sounds safe, he said with a smile. I mean, they don't let crazy people take care of sick and injured people, right? I sure hope not. And this girl seems sane. I like the sound of her voice. I can't say that about many women I've met. She's got this smooth tone with a slight southern twang that hits my ears just right. Like if she whispered sweet nothings to me, it might just do me in. But in a good way. Don't forget that you're under the influence of some powerful painkillers. I'm just saying that you shouldn't ask her out until you've been free of pain meds for at least 24 hours. Hell, that could be a while. I pulled at my hospital gown so he could see my chest. Old Yeller left me black, blue, and purple too. Ouch. His hoof prints are all over you, dude. The doc said there's one underneath the cast on my leg too. Milk and vitamin D are what kept me as intact as I am. If I hadn't been preparing my body for something like this, then I would hate to think of the shape I would be in right now. Keep that in mind when you hire the new cowboys to ride the bulls for you. Hopefully, they'll take a page from your book and follow your sage advice. 
The sound of the door opening had us both looking that way. The cute nurse came inside. Oh, you've got company. I'll come back later. She turned to leave. Tyrell winked at me. I was just leaving. You can see to your patient, nurse, he said as he got up and headed to the door. I'll check up on you in a day or so to see how you're coming along, Roman. You rest and let this fine nurse fix you up. I'll do that. See you later, Tyrell. My eyes were on Nurse Bryn. You here to check my vitals? She pulled something from the pocket of her scrubs, revealing the Dr. Pepper I'd asked for. I thought I would sneak this in for you. The fact that she'd defied the doctor turned me on. Wow. You're a renegade, aren't you? Not at all. I'm only trying to get on your good side. I smiled and held out my hand to take the drink she'd smuggled in for me. Well, you're doing exactly that with that soda. She placed the cold can in my hand. Her fingers touched mine, and even with the morphine in my system, I felt little zaps of electrical current whizzing through me. The doctor doesn't need to know about this. He won't hear a word about it from me. I popped the top and took a swig. Thanks. This hits the spot. I don't suppose you have a little Jack Daniels that you could spike it with. Now that I will not do for you. She wagged her finger at me, smiling all the while. I'm supposed to make you feel better, not get you drunk. Anyway, illicit substances and alcohol do not mix well. I suppose you're right. Is the morphine working for you? She asked as she looked at all the charts and checked the machines that were stacked on either side of me. It's doing the job quite well, thank you very much. The way she lingered around had me thinking that she was as intrigued by me as I was by her. You know, I just can't wrap my head around why anyone would want to ride a bull in the first place. Like, what are you thinking when you do something that dangerous? You want to know why I ride bulls? I asked her. She nodded, standing beside my bed with her hands in the pockets of her shirt. I would love to know why you ride bulls. I looked away from her and out of the window. It was dusk outside. I knew it would be dark soon. She'd said she was my day nurse, so night coming on meant she would soon leave. I didn't like that too much at all. Everyone thinks that there's a story behind why people ride bulls. Some people think that there's a religious reason. Others think that there's a sympathy reason. There is no story though. I just do it. That's it. It's like asking why people climb mountains. Maybe it's only because there are mountains, and they make people want to climb them. There are bulls. These massive muscular creatures. And some people, people like me, see the tremendous animal and think, hey, I'd like to take a ride on that thing's back and see what happens. With a short laugh, she shook her head. You're messing with me. I am not. It's true. I ride because I want the experience of doing it. Haven't you ever done something just for the experience? She looked down at her feet. No, I haven't. I sat up a little straighter. What do you mean, you haven't? Everyone has done something just for the experience. Not me, she said. She lifted her head and smiled at me. I didn't believe that at all. You mean to tell me that you haven't ever ridden a bike? Sure, I've ridden a bike. She laughed again, and I loved the sound she made. So, you have done something just for the experience? No. I rode the bike so that I didn't have to walk to school. She opened the little tray that was on wheels, and I saw there was a mirror inside of the lid. Let me run a comb through your hair. My shift is almost over, and I'd like to leave you looking nice for the night nurse. Ah, you have to leave? I didn't want her to go. I'll be back early in the morning. She ran the comb through my hair. I wanted to keep her talking to me, so I said, So you learn to ride a bike for some purpose. What about swimming? Haven't you gone swimming just for the hell of it? Maybe. She looked sort of dreamy as she kept combing my hair. Still, I cannot fathom why anyone would climb onto a bull. Well, if it makes any difference, my bull riding days are behind me. I watched as a smile lit up her face. That's good to know. It was like she actually cared about me. 
So you think I've been crazy to ride bulls at all? Crazy, she shook her head. I would say reckless. You don't seem crazy to me. Something made a vibrating noise in one of her pockets, and she stopped combing my hair to take out a cell phone. It's your night nurse. She swiped the screen. Hi, Joe. I heard some mumbling as the Joe person spoke on the other end, and then Bryn sighed and ended the call. Curiosity had me asking, so, what did Joe have to say? He's running late. Something about his sister being sick, and him having to take his nephew to their mother's place. He'll be an hour or so late. So, you're stuck with me for a little while longer. Don't say it like that. I don't feel stuck with you. I moved a little, and pain shot up my back. Ow. Her hand on my shoulder made me freeze in place. Here, I'll massage your back for you. Moving me very gently, she gained access to my back and untied the top strings of the hospital gown, revealing my back. Wow, you've got some amazing bruising going on back here. Check out the scar on my left shoulder, I told her. Got hooked by a mean old bull right there. Five stitches and no hospital stay. That was a good day. I nearly won too. Only the guy right after me did a smidgen better. Is there a lot of money when you win? She walked away from me, going to open a drawer on a small cabinet. No, not a lot. I watched as she came back with a tube of something. What's that? This is a eucalyptus and Epsom salt ointment. I like the way it smells. I think that pleasant scents help people mend in many ways. She put some on her hands and rubbed them together. I'm a firm believer in aromatherapy. I'm a firm believer in powerful pain medications. I laughed a little, and it hurt my ribs when I did. Ouch. Probably best not to laugh. She put her hands on my bare back, and what occurred in my nether regions was beyond my expectations. Oh yeah, I groaned as she moved her hands over my skin, kneading the muscles. That feels so good. See, not everything that helps you has to be pharmaceutical. A little TLC can go a long way. TLC. I wasn't sure what she meant. Tender loving care, Roman. She laughed lightly. Hasn't anyone ever given you tender loving care before? Nope. I hadn't been treated tenderly in my entire life. Dad didn't raise no sissies, and he made sure mom didn't either. When we got hurt, we rubbed some dirt on it and sucked it up. That was dad's prescription for everything. Got a fever? Eat some dirt and suck it up. You've got to be joking, she said with a fair amount of shock in her voice. Wish I was. Bryn. It was impossible to believe that Roman's parents actually made him eat dirt when he had fever. Come on, Roman. You don't really expect me to believe that. He looked at me out of the corner of his eye. Well, maybe not dirt. But we were given the nastiest tasting aspirin, and that was about it. I snorted. And you still turned out all right, I would guess. I mean, you live to become an adult anyway. Yeah, my parents didn't kill me. My brothers and I made it through somehow, he said. I rubbed his shoulder and he groaned, right there. That's the spot. You're very good at this. It's part of my job. I took some classes on massage therapy a few years ago. I thought it would help me with my nursing career. I dug in a little deeper. You be sure to let me know if I hurt you at all. Girl, you can't hurt me, he said with bravado. Roman, you really don't have to act tough with me. I know you're in pain. Anyone with these kinds of injuries would be in pain. I don't care if you're a tough cowboy or not. Everyone feels pain when they've been hurt this badly. Well, nothing you're doing hurts. Not at the moment, anyway. He caught me by the wrist as I went to put some more lotion on my hands and looked right into my eyes. But you should be careful with me. A woman like you could break my heart. For a brief moment, I actually believed him. But then I just laughed, certain he was joking around. I'll try to be careful then. I would hate to break your heart, cowboy. See that you don't. That's just about the only thing that's breakable on me. He let me go, then smiled, 
and the small cut on his lip began to bleed. Grabbing a tissue from the box beside the bed, I held it to his lip. You've got to stop smiling. Maybe by tomorrow, this will be healed enough for you to smile again. I keep forgetting about that. He took over, putting his hand on the tissue to hold it against his bleeding lip. You get back to the back rub. I'll take care of this. You may leave this hospital spoiled. I went back to rubbing his muscular back and tried not to be turned on by all the ridges and valleys I came across while giving him the massage. Mom's gonna be pissed at you, he let me know. My plan to inundate myself with the man, so that I could learn to focus on my professionalism, wasn't really working out as I'd hoped. He was just too charismatic. I'll take my chances. So, how many brothers do you have? Two. Both younger. Both not nearly as handsome as myself. I had to laugh. Wow, modesty must not run in your family. Maybe not so much. He groaned again, yeah, that's the spot. Any sisters? I asked, trying to keep my mind on things other than his amazing body. A couple. You. I'm an only child. I didn't want to talk about myself though. So your parents had three boys. And they didn't want to raise sissies. Are they still around? Yeah. He snorted a little. I'm only 30. They had me when they were in their early 20s so they're in their fifties now. And they keep bugging all five of us to start giving them grandkids. Are your brothers married? One of them is. Heath got married last year, but Lori doesn't want to have kids yet. I can't blame her though. They're both the same age, 22. I'm 22. He leaned back and looked at me. You ready to have a baby yet? I felt the blush heat my cheeks, as it felt an awful lot like he was asking me to have his baby. Are you? With a shrug he said, if the right woman came along I wouldn't be opposed to having a baby. So the right woman hasn't come along for you yet? With a shake of his head he said, not yet. How about you? Mr. Wright came knocking at your door yet? Not yet. You didn't answer my first question, he said as his big brown eyes gazed into mine. You ready to have a baby yet? I think the morphine has gotten to you. I tried to lighten the mood. You might be right. Here I am, asking a girl I don't even know if she wants to have a baby. Maybe after a good night's sleep, I'll be back to myself. This isn't even me. I haven't even dated anyone in the last year or so. Is that right? I massaged his shoulders trying to get him to relax and maybe even fall asleep. Why is that? He huffed. I had a three-year relationship with a psycho before that. I'm sure she wasn't a psycho. No, she was a real psycho. I had no idea that she'd escaped from the loony bin in Dallas when I met her. You're messing with me. I knew he had to be kidding. I am not, he insisted. She was okay for the first year and then she started acting really weird. She didn't trust me at all and was being super paranoid. Every time I saw her, she took my phone and went through it to make sure I wasn't talking to anyone else. That's not very cool. Not at all. And then it got worse from there. Even though there was no evidence to support her theory, she kept saying that she knew I was being abducted by aliens. Now I know you're messing with me, I said as I laughed. No one would think something like that. She did. I'm not kidding, he said, sounding honest. It went downhill from there on out, until the authorities found her and took her back to Dallas where she belongs. If that's true, then I really feel bad that you had to go through something like that. It is true, he insisted. I might be a lot of things, but a liar I am not. So, why did she think aliens were abducting you? I asked as the whole thing sounded crazy to me. It was probably because I was ghosting her, and she couldn't find me. And when I said that I'd been around and didn't know why she wasn't able to contact me, she came up with the alien abduction theory. It was sort of my fault, because I joked around with her that maybe it was why she couldn't get in touch with me. But I was trying to break things off with her without having any drama, 
thus the ghosting. That kind of bit you in the butt then, didn't it? I laughed again. In hindsight yeah. It bit me in the butt, pretty badly. He laughed too, but it ended with a groan. Ouch. Laughing hurts. Smiling and laughing aren't really your best friends right now. I felt for the poor man, and reached over him to push the morphine pump once for him. You won't feel anything very. Done. He sighed and leaned back. That stuff is a miracle. Don't get too used to it. You'll have it through tomorrow, then it is out of here. After that, you'll be on prescription strength ibuprofen. Bummer. I know. But that stuff is too addicting to let anyone have too much of it. I've seen too many people become addicted to painkillers after suffering from bad injuries, especially injuries to the back. And if they can't get the prescription painkillers that they're addicted to, they turn to illicit substances which are even worse. I don't want to see you end up like that. His eyes looked dreamy as the morphine took over. Because you're an angel. Because I'm a nurse. I fought the urge to run my hand through his thick dark hair as he gazed at me. The way he made me feel was unlike anything I had ever felt before. And I wasn't sure why that was. It had always been easy for me to get along well with people I'd just met, but this was ridiculous. Promise not to laugh at me if I tell you something, Bryn, he asked. I won't laugh. You can tell me anything. I stepped back and moved things around on the tray, so there would be room for the evening meal that would soon be served to him. I've been dateless for the past year. Like, no female company at all. So, the psycho made you wary of women? I asked as I tossed some trash into the wastebasket. Yeah, she really did. I've been going to church these last few months. He hesitated before going on, promise not to think bad of me. I promise. I've been going to church to find a good woman. But I haven't found one that suits me yet. Church sounds like the right place to look for a good woman. But you should know that there aren't many women out there who've escaped from the loony bin. I don't think you have much to worry about, Roman. Lightning rarely strikes in the same place twice. Or at least, that's how I think it goes. My friend who was in here when you came in, Tyrell, told me that I shouldn't tell you things until I've been off the pain medication for at least 24 hours. But I don't know if I can stop myself. My skin prickled, as I had the idea that he wanted to tell me that he liked me. And I thought I liked him too. And even though it wasn't professional of me at all, I asked, stop yourself from saying what, Roman? I stepped closer to the side of the bed, filled with expectation. So the church may have been the wrong place for me to look for a good woman. Maybe the hospital is where she is. He reached out and ran his fingers over my cheek. Maybe a young nurse with the prettiest smile I've ever seen and the sweetest voice I've ever heard is the good girl I've been looking for. I'll keep an eye out for someone who fits that description, I said, pretending not to understand that it was me he was talking about. I'm looking at the person who fits that description, Bryn. I wanted to kiss him so bad that it physically hurt. I have to go. I couldn't kiss a patient. I couldn't even think about telling him that I liked him too, since he was on strong pain medication. All of it was wrong in so many ways. Moving fast, I had to get out of there before I said or did something that might end my career. Say something before you walk out of here, please. Feeling his anguish and not wanting to hurt him, I stopped and turned to look at him as he reached out to me. Please don't leave me hanging like this, Bryn. My insides felt as if they were burning. And now that I knew he liked me, I was in the worst position I'd ever been in. You know, Roman, this isn't the time for something like this. You're a patient in the hospital where I work. If I were to reciprocate your feelings, I could not only lose my job but my entire career would be in jeopardy. He looked a bit relieved. Oh. I hadn't thought about that. Just pretend I didn't say all that then. I don't want to interfere with your job. It's not your fault. I blame the illicit substances. I smiled at him, hoping he could read through the lines and see that I felt the same way he did. I just couldn't be open about it. 
I'm not going to run off and leave you. That was hasty of me. Good. He sighed. What I said was hasty. Yeah, well that's okay. I picked up the remote control and turned the television on. What kind of shows do you like? We've got tons of channels here. Think there's a rodeo on? He laughed then held his sides. Not supposed to laugh. Must remember that. I think they televised the rodeo you were in. Want to check that out? I grinned at him. And watch myself get pummeled by a bull I raised? He shook his head. No thank you. A reality show then? I asked, surfing through the channels. I don't watch reality television, mostly because the reality stars are completely fake. I hate fake people. It seemed like it wouldn't be easy to find something he would want to watch. Cartoons? The look he gave me told me that he was not into cartoons. I'm a man. Yeah, I can see that. I laughed as I kept moving through the channels. Sports talk shows cooking. Hum. There's nothing on any of those channels that I want to watch. He batted his eyes at me. I'd rather watch you. Oh yeah. My heart raced which was bad. Remember that I don't want to lose my job, Roman. Be a good patient for me, please. I will, I swear. I'll be as quiet as a mouse. He stroked his chin with his thumb and forefinger as he eyed me. You're so vain, I laughed, trying to keep a light atmosphere between us. I know what you need. I know what I need too. But you won't give it to me. His eyes danced playfully. Although he was being so bad, I loved it, a lot. And that bothered me. Maybe I didn't have what it took to be a medical professional after all. I would love to stick around and have you flirt with me all night long. But I really should go check on the other patients before Joe comes in to relieve me. Ah, don't go, he begged as he reached out to me. I really have to check on everyone and make sure their trays are cleared. Dinner will be coming very soon, and I have to make sure everyone is prepared. It thrilled me that he didn't want me to leave. But I did have a job to do. Promise me that you won't leave without coming to say goodbye. And you should give me your cell number, just in case I want to call you later. You cannot have my cell number. I wagged my finger at him. You are such a naughty patient. Fine. But seriously, don't leave without coming to see me first. I wouldn't think of leaving without telling my most favorite patient goodbye. I hope you don't say that to all your patients. Nope. Just you. And that's the truth too. Roman True to her word, the very pretty nurse Bryn walked back into my hospital room, just as I had finished eating my dinner. You came back to say goodbye. I pushed the tray away, making it roll a foot away from my bed, and held out my arms for a hug I knew I wasn't going to get, as she was dead set on being a professional. I told you that I wouldn't leave without coming back. Anyway, I'm here for another half hour. Joe's running even later than he thought he'd be. Everyone's eating their dinner, so I'm free to hang out with you for a bit. She took a seat in the chair next to my bed. My feet are killing me. Twelve-hour shifts are long enough. But when you start to add extra time onto that, it's a real pain in the you-know-what. She pulled the rubber band out of her hair, releasing it. Silka blonde locks fell in waves over her shoulders. And the tight pony has got to go. Bryn was by far the prettiest nurse I had ever laid eyes on. Please excuse me if I start to drool. Stop it, she chastised me. I was getting a headache from the tightness of the ponytail. I had to get rid of it. She moved her head, trying to fluff her hair a bit. How did you like the roast beef? Is that what that was? I really had no idea what I'd been eating. I thought it was part of a leather boot the cook had smothered in brown gravy. The mashed potatoes weren't that bad, she said with a smile. They also weren't that good. And those tiny green peas were hard to get with the fork because they were still hard. The jello was all right. Red is my favorite flavor. The morphine had worn off enough for my mind to be clear, but the pain was still being held at bay. 
I wanted to tone down all the flirting I'd been doing so I could really get to know the woman sitting here with me. So, I told you some pretty personal information about myself. Now it's your turn to tell me something about yourself. Shaking her head she let me know, oh I don't like to talk about myself. I knew I was going to have to pull some information out of her if I was ever going to get to really know her. And I really did want to know her. What nursing school did you go to? I went to a very prestigious one in Beeville, Texas. People come from around the entire world to earn their degree from the only college in the little town, she proudly said. I graduated with honors. I'm sort of a prodigy. That's impressive. Beautiful and smart. A great combination. Tell me more about your prodigy status. I graduated from high school when I was only 14. Now I was really impressed. Holy crap. I was still watching Scooby-Doo when I was 14. How did you manage to accomplish that? When I went to kindergarten, the teacher told my mother that I was so far ahead of the other students that regular public school would only slow me down. Mom had taught me how to read when I was around three. I'd already been reading at a third grade level when I went into kindergarten, she said, ending with a shrug like it wasn't that impressive at all. You're amazing. So what did you do when they said that? Mom found a school called the Montessori School. Through that school, I was able to move quickly through the curriculum. I got to move at my own pace, which was fast. You sound like you really love learning. I do. I never want to stop either. She sounded passionate about her love for anything academic. That's quite an admirable trait. What do you like to read? Everything from silly romance novels to extensive reports on various subjects. At one point, I was going to become a doctor. But medical school takes forever to get through. Thus, I opted for nursing instead, so that I could get started with my career. I went from a registered nurse to a nurse practitioner, and this is where I plan to stay. But I'll continue to get certified in as many things as I want. I teach a lot of classes too. You know, CPR classes and even classes for new parents so that they can learn how to care for their babies. So, you already know how to care for babies? Sure. Working for Dr. Green who's a family practice doctor, I had to learn how to deal with everything from newborns to geriatrics. That's why he's taking me with him whenever he gets called to volunteer with Doctors Without Borders. I didn't like the idea of her having to go away to some foreign country with that guy. What do you know about this Dr. Green? He's a great doctor. She shrugged. And that's all that matters to me. What about his personal life? Do you know anything about that? Not really. He doesn't talk about his personal life much at all. I mean, I know he's not married, and I don't think he's ever been married. But I'm not 100% sure about that. He doesn't have any kids, and he doesn't want any. I do know that, because he told me so. He said he's got a lot of good work to do, and children have no place in his life. Weird. I didn't know anyone who thought that way. Well, I suppose it doesn't seem weird to him. He thinks differently than most people. He's very clinical. It's a good thing to have in a doctor. But it also means that he doesn't have much of a social life. He sounds like a loner who just does his job and then goes home to his cat every night. She laughed at my description. I honestly have no idea what he does when he's not working. I liked that she only had a work relationship with the doctor. I'd gotten bad vibes from him. It's good to separate work from your personal life. I mean, you guys already spend half the day together. No reason to spend more time than that. Yeah, I agree. She took a chunk of her hair between her fingers and began twirling it. He's very disciplined, and he expects the same from me. I can't see how we could ever be like real friends. Plus he's old enough to be my father, so there's that. I doubt we would have anything in common other than medicine. It seemed that I had no competition where the doctor was concerned, and it was a relief. Yeah, he's way too old for you. I agree 100%.
she leaned forward then whispered, he's into punishing people too, which I don't care for. Red flags went off like gangbusters inside my brain. He is? She looked over her shoulder as if making sure no one would hear her, then she looked at me, still whispering, this one time, I accidentally called him by his first name, Raven, while we were with a patient. It was only because he'd told me to call him that, when we weren't around other people. I couldn't believe that man. He got mad at you for doing something that simple, and meaningless. Mad? she asked as she shook her head. He didn't seem angry in the least. But when we left the patient, he took my hand and pulled me into the empty examination room, right next to the one we'd just left. Chills ran down my back as I envisioned the tall, muscular doctor taking Bryn off by herself. What did he do then? Fire already burned as fury bubbled inside of me. He asked me with a very calm voice if I knew what I'd done wrong. And I told him that I knew that I'd been wrong in calling him by his first name and that it was an accident, which would never happen again. I even said that I was sorry. That was responsible of you. I liked a person who didn't try to hide their mistakes. I thought so too. She looked over her shoulder again, then leaned in even closer to whisper, but he thought he had to punish me so that I would really remember not to make that mistake again. The fury began to bubble even more as I asked, what did he do to you? He told me that he could see that I was sorry, but he thought I needed something to remind me not to make the mistake again. Like what? She looked at the floor, shame taking over her face. He told me he was going to lock me in that room for an hour, as a punishment for breaking one of his rules. And he did that. He left me there without saying another word to me. Then I heard the door locking from the outside. It was humiliating. I bet it was. I could not understand why the man thought he should, or even could do such a thing to a co-worker, or anyone for that matter. What did you when he let you out? I didn't see him. I heard the door unlock and went to open it. I saw no one there. When I walked to the front, I saw that they were about to close, and the office manager asked me where the hell I'd been. I didn't want to tell her that the doctor had locked me away for an hour, so I said I'd been in the bathroom with stomach issues. You lied. I thought that was strange. He made you feel that humiliated. Yes he did. I didn't want anyone to know what he'd done to me. And I know that sounds stupid, but I couldn't help the way I felt about it. You should have told him off, is what you should have done. You should have told him, that he wasn't going to be locking you up anywhere. The whole time I was sitting there with nothing to do, I thought about doing just that once he let me out. And I was sure I would go through with it too. But when the door was unlocked and he was gone, I began to think that standing up for myself might get me fired. And I honestly couldn't afford to get fired. You can't afford not to stand up for yourself either. You were made to feel like crap by someone you had to work with. More specifically by your boss at that, that's definitely not cool. I agree. But I never dealt with him over it. And after a while, it seemed like I'd let too much time pass to say anything to him about it and how I never wanted him to do anything like that again. I really didn't like the guy now that she'd told me that. You should distance yourself from him. And going off to other countries with him is a terrible idea. He did that in the very beginning of me working for him. He hasn't done anything like that since then. But somehow it still lurks in my mind. Sounds to me like you've just learned to follow his rules. Well, I have done that. So, maybe the punishment did what he'd wanted it to. You did not need to be punished, Bryn. It was a very slight mistake. If he didn't want you calling him by his first name, he shouldn't have ever told you to do it in the first place. I had gotten the impression the old doctor had had eyes for Bryn, from the very beginning. Has he ever hit you up? You know, asked you out or made a play for you or even tried to kiss you? Gosh no. She laughed and stood up. Never. He's not after me like that. He is my mentor, and he's a very good one too. Sometimes he puts off a jerk vibe, but I know the real man, and he's an extremely smart and caring person. And as far as going out of the country with him, 
I will be doing that whenever he asks me to. The experience would be too valuable to miss out on it. And no other doctor has ever offered me anything like it. So, you have worked for other doctors? Well, not for them, but with them. Here at the hospital, I've worked with many doctors. So, it's reasonable to say that you could go and work for another doctor if you wanted to. I thought she should think about doing that. If Dr. Green locked her away once, he could do it again. I could work directly for the hospital if I wanted to. But I don't want that. I like working under Dr. Green. I've learned so much from him. It wouldn't make any sense to stop working for him for something he did ages ago. You know, Bryn, I've got this little gift where I can read people pretty well right off the bat. I can do it with animals, too. And I read bad things about that doctor. She laughed, moving her hand through the air as if brushing my words out of it. If you're so good at reading people and animals, why did you get tossed off that bull then beaten up by him? She did have a point. Bryn. Leaving Roman for the night, I stopped just before walking out of the door. You should get some sleep tonight. The more sleep you get, the faster your body will heal. Then I will get plenty of sleep, because I want to get better very fast. I've got some plans that include a certain gorgeous nurse, but I need to be back on my feet to do them. Sounds interesting. I hope she appreciates the work you're putting into this endeavor. I laughed, then opened the door. Good night, cowboy. See you in the morning. Good night, nurse. I'll see you in the morning, too. You have yourself some sweet dreams. It wouldn't hurt my feelings if you had a dream or two about me while you're sleeping. I'm pretty sure you'll have the starring role in my dreams tonight. A nurse has no business dreaming about her patients. I winked at him. Night. I forgot that you're the ultimate professional. Night, Bryn. The look on his handsome face made it hard not to run back to him and plant a kiss on his chiseled lips. But he was right, I wanted to be professional where he was concerned. Just as I left his room, I saw Joe walking down the hallway. Breathing a sigh of relief as my shift was finally over, I met him as he walked to the nurse's station. Glad to see you, Joe. I'm bushed. Well, you can sleep in tomorrow if you'll switch schedules with me, he said. For how long? A week. My sister's sick, and her doctor told her she'd be out for a week. Our mother isn't in the best of health either, but she's going to watch my three-year-old nephew tonight and take him to his daycare in the morning. Then I'll be picking him up and keeping him each night. But that will only work if you switch up with me so that I can work days and you can work nights. I'll have to clear it with the doc. Clear what? Came the doctor's voice. I turned to find him standing right behind me. Oh, I didn't hear you coming up behind me, Dr. Green. Joe needs me to switch shifts with him for a week. I'm good with it if you are. I don't know. He looked at Joe with scrutiny. Can you live up to my high expectations, Joe? Nodding Joe smiled. I know what you expect. I think it will be okay then. For a week. Only for a week. Great. I'll let my family know that things are settled. As Joe turned away to make his phone calls, the doctor took my hand, leading me away. I want to talk to you first. He led me toward the exit that led to the parking garage, where our cars were parked. About what, Dr. Green? When no one's around, you know that you can call me Raven, Bryn. We're off the clock now, so no longer doctor and nurse. Okay. It was hard to know when to call him by his first name and when not to. Especially considering the consequences last time I messed that up. I stopped by Mr. Etheridge's room and spotted an empty can of Dr. Pepper in the trash. He stopped, moving me backward so that my back was against the wall. His dark eyes bore into mine. Did you deliberately go against my orders? I knew I could not show any fear, or he would surely punish me. No, I did not go against your orders. He had a visitor with him when I went to check on him earlier. I didn't see the soda, but maybe his visitor brought it. For a long moment, he stared into my eyes. 
Okay then. Blinking, I felt like he was too close to me, so I eased sideways to put some space between us. It's been a long day, and I'm very tired. I'm going to get on my way home. Wait. His hand landed on my shoulder, stopping me from leaving. I want to tell you what I expect from you since you'll be working nights, and we won't get to see each other much. Turning to face him, I was able to make him move his hand off me. What do you expect from me? Professionalism, as always. That cowboy is a worry to me. There is no need to worry about him or any of the patients here. Shaking his head, he went on, it's not you that I don't trust. It's him. I just need you to maintain a professional status when you're around him. And don't spend more time than absolutely necessary in his room. Do you understand me? I understand you. I wasn't going to spend less time with Roman, though. The great thing about the night shift was that it was super easy most of the time. The patients slept most of the time. If any of them needed help, they were usually moved to the ICU, where they could be constantly monitored by the nursing staff. There were fewer nurses on the night shift as well. And most of them slept in empty patient rooms, leaving the door open so they could hear the beeping sound when patients pushed their nurse call button. I know I've already given you this lecture, but now that you'll be here at night, I feel that I must reiterate certain things. That's really not necessary. I know what you expect, and you know that I always do what you expect of me. You have no reason to worry about anything. He also needed reminding of things. Have I ever let you down before? I just don't want you to fall for that boy's charm. I can assure you that he's been with more girls than he can count. You don't want to end up just another notch on that kid's bedpost. He's 30. You know that, right? You keep calling him a kid, but 30 is no kid. See that right there, he said. Why are you standing up for him? I don't think I'm standing up for him. I am merely pointing out that you keep calling one of your patients a kid when he is not one. It seemed to me as if he was acting jealous, and that didn't make much sense to me. Squaring his shoulders, it looked as if he was preparing himself for battle. Okay, let me call him a man then, if that will make you happy. That man is a disaster. He's self-sabotaging. And he looks at you with lust in his eyes. I do not like that. I feel very strongly that he's a threat to your career. You have no faith in me. I ask with surprise. Because I have never given you any reason to lack faith in my moral or professional character. Until now, he pointed out. I've never seen you light up the way you did when you were near him. If there is ever going to be anything between me and him, it will not occur while he's a patient here. And not while he's on pain medication, which can have the same effect as alcohol clouding his judgment. I wasn't going to lie and say nothing would ever happen, since we did seem to have amazing chemistry. But I was a professional who would never take advantage of a person under the influence of anything. The way his jaw dropped frightened me a bit. So, you're admitting that you are attracted to him? I threw my hands in the air, not admitting anything. No. All I am saying is, that you don't have to worry about me doing anything unbecoming of a nurse. I love my career and would never do anything to jeopardize it. But once he's no longer a patient, what happens between us is no one's concern. If anything happens between us at all, I'm not saying that it will, and you're not saying that it won't. Shaking his head, he looked at me with wide eyes. He's not good for you. Maybe you're right. Who knows? Maybe you're wrong. Maybe things will never happen between us, or maybe they will. The thing is that you can trust me to do the right thing while he's my patient. I don't like what you're saying. It sounds to me like you want to see that guy. I have no idea if I do or not. I just know that you are overstepping yourself, so I need to draw a line. My professional life is your concern. My private life is not. An incredulous expression took over his entire face as he put his hand to his chest. I am overstepping? Yes. You most certainly are overstepping. 
Because I care about you, Bryn. I don't want to see you get hurt. I don't want to see some dumb, self-deprecating cowboy pull you down to his level. You're better than that. You're better than him in every way imaginable. That is not for you to say. I put my hands on my hips, determined to make him understand that I wasn't going to let him push me around. The things I told Roman about how Raven had punished me had reminded me that I needed to stand up for myself. And now was the time to let him know that I wasn't going to be pushed around by him or anyone. I make my own choices. Mistakes, he said. You are making a mistake if you think that guy is worthy of you. Who is worthy of me? I had the idea that he wouldn't think anyone was. Not him. That is your opinion, and you are welcome to it. But that does not mean I have to go along with it. You've trained me to think for myself. You've told me not to merely follow other doctors' orders if I don't understand or agree with them. You've told me to watch myself at all times and never do anything just because they tell me to. So I am following your words right now. I will make my own decisions. What has happened to you? He shook his head as if in disbelief. Within only a matter of hours of being around that cowboy, you're speaking disrespectfully to me and questioning the things I say to you. I have not been disrespectful. I am merely letting you know that you can have your opinion, and I can have mine. It wasn't in me to be disrespectful toward anyone. If you took anything I've said as disrespect, I apologize. I did not mean any disrespect at all. I highly respect you. I am extremely appreciative of the time you have given me as my mentor. I value your input as well. But there must be boundaries. So I am putting one in place for us. I have always stayed out of your personal life, and I expect you to do the same with mine. Even if I have a strong feeling that you might be about to make some serious mistakes. Yes, I wasn't going to back down now. I have listened to you. Don't think that I haven't. So you might do the smart thing and look the other way wherever that cowboy is looking at you? Shrugging, I didn't want to give in to him in any way. Who knows? But it's my choice to make. I don't like that you're doing this, Bryn. He puffed out a long breath and then stepped closer to me. You're going to get hurt if you date him. I know what he's up to, and it's not good for you. So you say, I replied. Crossing his arms over his chest, he nodded. It seems there is nothing I can say that you will agree with. Not if it concerns my private life. Well, let's talk about your professional life. If you do anything with that man while he's a patient at this hospital, I will be forced to punish you severely. Yes, you can fire me if I do anything with him while he's a patient. Of that I am well aware. To my sheer amazement, he smiled as he looked into my eyes. You are growing up on me, Bryn. Maybe I am. I had known him since I was 18. Perhaps I've been looking at you like the young girl you were when you first came to work for me. Perhaps that's been a mistake. Perhaps you're right. If he treated me more like a co-worker, and less like a child who needed reprimanding and punishment, we would get along better and the other medical staff wouldn't think I was his puppet. Well, I am going to trust you, Nurse Davis. I am going to give you a shot to prove to me that you are growing up and can take responsibility for yourself, both professionally and personally. Thank you. I do appreciate that. Standing up for myself seemed to have worked. I will expect you to call me at midnight each night that you're working nights to let me know how our patients are doing. I'd worked at night before, and he'd never asked me to do that. May I ask why you want me to do that? I just do. Can you do that for me? Is it too much to ask for a short phone call from you each night? I suppose not. It's just that you've never asked me to do that before when I've traded shifts with the night nurse. This is for an entire week. It's different. You may have questions for me that come up during the night. You can jot them down and ask when you call me. Or I might have some for you. Who knows? I just want to set up the nightly calls beforehand. 
I can call you at midnight if that's what you want. I suppose there was no harm in doing that. He began walking to the exit, and I walked beside him. It is what I want. I think our conversation was a productive one. Don't you? I agree. I have the feeling this will move our working relationship to a new level. I can clearly see that you're growing as a person, and it's time to move forward with things. I'm glad you can see that. Standing up for myself had really worked. And I had Roman to thank for talking to me about doing it. If I had done that before Raven had locked me in that examination room, the last few years might have been different, and I might not have become the man's puppet in the first place. But those days were behind me. Looks like I'm finally going to be on equal footing with the doctor. Roman I woke to find the night nurse, Joe, coming to check my vitals. I thought Bryn was coming in this morning. Good morning to you too, handsome, the male nurse said jokingly. Sorry. I hadn't meant to sound so rude. Good morning, Joe. He put the blood pressure cuff around my upper arm, and it began to give my bicep a tight squeeze. No talking while I take your blood pressure. It gives a bad reading if you talk, and then I'll have to do it all over again. Keeping my mouth closed, I didn't relish the idea of being squeezed by an anaconda-like grip all over again. Joe ran a little rolling thermometer across my forehead. No fever. That's good. The cuff released the pressure, and Joe seemed happy with the results as he smiled and jotted down the information. All is well? I asked. All is excellent. He looked at the bedpan he'd given me during the night and asked, do you feel like having a bowel movement this morning? I honestly don't think I can poop in a pan under my butt. The idea seemed insane to me. I honestly know that you can do it. All of my incapacitated patients have done it, and I know that you can too. Should I set you up? I knew I should give it a go before Bryn showed up to take over. I knew I couldn't do it if she was helping me. I guess so. When's Bryn coming in? Why? You want her to help you instead of me? He looked a little hurt. No. I don't want her to see me like that. Oh, I see. Does someone have a little crush on his nurse? He laughed as he pulled a stainless steel bedpan from a nearby drawer. Recalling how Bryn had told me that she could lose her job if she had anything romantic to do with any patient, I lied. No. I just don't want any females seeing me perched on a damn pan is all. Oh macho. I get it. He helped me to move my butt up, slid the donut thingy out, then slid the cold metal pan under me. Damn. It's cold. Yep. He threw the sheet over my body to cover me. Take your time. I'll give you some privacy. Thanks. I wasn't sure that having privacy was going to help me do my business in a pan, under my butt while I lay in bed. Making myself pee in the little urinal had been a chore, but when my bladder was full, it figured things out. A half hour later, I had finished my business, surprised that I had been able to make myself do that. I pushed the nurse's call button on my bed to let Joe know I was done. Moments later, he came through the door. Did we do our duty? Please man, I shook my head. No poop jokes. Pulling the pan out from under me, I was horrified when he took some baby wipes out of his pocket and wiped my butt for me. Let's just clean you up before we put the donut back under your tushy. The humiliation didn't seem to end. But finally he was finished, and I settled back into place. Even with everything I'd had to endure, Bryn was still on my mind. So, is she off today or what? Who? He acted like he hadn't a clue who I was talking about. Bryn. Oh, she and I traded schedules for the week. I've got my nephew to take care of. He's going to daycare during the day, but needs someone to care for him at night. So she's going to be my night nurse? She is. The idea of having Bryn coming to see me during the night sounded a little sensual to me. Joe had given me a quick sponge bath during the night, telling me that was the night nurse's duty. So now Bryn would be giving me my baths. 
being bathed even quickly, by Joe had been the most uncomfortable thing I'd ever experienced. Until the poop incident that bypassed the bath by far. But just the idea of Bryn running her soapy sponge all over my body, had me yearning for the night to hurry up and come. You still have a good amount of morphine left, he pointed out. So you had a pretty good night, I'm guessing. It was pretty good. I didn't need but a little pump of it, before falling asleep. And I slept pretty soundly throughout the night. I'm a little stiff this morning though. That's to be expected. He looked at my chart that he'd taken from the pocket on the end of the bed. You can have the morphine pump today, but it'll be taken away in the morning. If you don't want to use it anymore, we can give you ibuprofen. I really recommend using that instead of the morphine. Ibuprofen reduces swelling, and that's your main issue with all the bruising. I think you'll feel even better if you go that route. But that's all up to you. I'd like to go ahead and do what you recommended. Bryn's words about people becoming addicted to pain medication rang in my ears, telling me not to take too much of the powerful drug. Okay. I'll leave the pump hooked up to your IV for now. That way, you'll still have it if you need it. But in the morning, it will have to go. Yeah, I know. What was really bothering me was my leg being strung up. Do you know how long I'll have to have my leg up like this? Shaking his head, he frowned. That's up to the doctor. Great. I didn't care for that man. I hadn't liked him even before Bryn had told me about him. But now that I knew he was using some type of mind tricks on her, I pretty much hated him. Bryn could make fun of me all she wanted, but I did have a sixth sense when it came to seeing through certain people and animals. It did bother me that I hadn't sensed Old Yeller's temperament before riding him. But his breeding had to be blamed for that. Dr. Green usually makes his rounds between 10 and 12. It's just a hairline fracture, so I'm really not sure why he has you strapped up like this. Maybe it has to do with keeping weight off your lower back and coccyx. You can ask him about that when he comes in. Maybe he just did it to punish me for what he calls being stupid for riding a bull in the first place. His blonde brows rose and he looked a little surprised that I'd said something like that. He told you that you were stupid. He didn't use the word, but the words he did use implied that I was stupid. Oh. Well that's just the way he is. He's not the most endearing individual, but he is very good at what he does. You can trust his judgment, is what I'm saying. And I'm no butt-kisser, so you can take me at my word. Bryn said the same thing about him. What makes him so good at his job? He intakes symptoms like a machine and spits out accurate diagnoses like nobody's business. He inherently knows which medications work best for many ailments. His bedside manner might not be polished, but his knowledge bank seems to be nearly endless when it comes to medicine and how to treat the problems patients come in with. So he's like some kind of a robot, I mused. A heartless piece of machinery. Well, I wouldn't go that far. I'm sure he has a heart. He just doesn't wear it on his sleeve, is all. Most doctors don't. When you deal with sick and injured people a lot, you can develop a certain immunity to their feelings. You know those people who scream and cry over the least little thing, like a tiny shot? Yeah. I've met a few whiners in my day. Well, we see them each and every day, more than once. Some medical professionals build up sort of callousness with our feelings that allows us to continue helping people without going insane. I can see what you're saying. Not that it made me like the doctor anymore. I guess I'll have to let him take care of my body so I can get better, and I'll have to try to ignore his cold demeanor. You should totally do that. He really can heal you in record time if you let him. That's why I never judge or ask questions about what he does with his patients. He knows far more than I do or will ever know, for that matter. The guy had a lot of faith in the doctor. I guess that I should have faith in his abilities to heal my battered body. But I still didn't like the way he was with Bryn. Just before lunch, Dr. Green and Nurse Joe came into my room with the doctor's cold demeanor in tow. Your vitals are good. I expect that with continued use of ibuprofen, 
the swelling in your body will gradually decrease throughout the day and into the night. I expect to see much less swelling tomorrow. He looked up at me, placing the report he'd brought in with him into the file at the end of my bed. Let's take a look at you. Without so much as a how do you do, he swept the sheet off me while Joe moved behind me to untie the two sets of strings that held the hospital gown on me. Unceremoniously, the doctor pulled the gown all the way off me and dropped it on the floor. Nurse Joe hurried to gather it up and placed it into a white bag, then pulled out a clean one from one of the drawers. I'd been watching Joe when I felt something cold down there and looked to find the doctor cupping them. You won't be able to have any intimate activities until the swelling in your coccyx is completely gone. He looked right into my eyes. None. He put his stethoscope over my heart and listened. Take a deep breath and hold it. I couldn't breathe in too deeply because it hurt, so I took a rather shallow breath and held it. Okay, release your breath. He then looked at Joe. Today, we'll start the breathing exercises with the spirometer. I want him to do those three times a day for ten minutes each time. Joe took out a little notepad that he had in the pocket of his scrubs, pulled the pen he had attached to a little pulley thing that hung at the top of his shirt, then jotted that down. Yes, doctor. Also, adjust the length on the trapeze bar at least one inch up or down, he told Joe. Why do you want him to do that? I asked. He barely glanced at me as he said, to move your femoral head inside your acetabulum. I looked at Joe. Can you say that in English, please? To move your hip joint around a bit, Joe informed me. Ah. Okay. I had one more question for the doctor. Why does my leg have to be up like this anyway? It's just a hairline fracture. I could merely let you prop your leg up on some pillows, but that would allow you to move around. You don't want to move around. I don't? No. You do not want to be moving around. And you want your leg up above your heart. This alleviates swelling. Your other injuries, the bruising on the lungs, coccyx, and lower vertebra, would worsen if you were allowed to move around. This is only temporary, and your leg can come down in a few days when I see a drastic decrease in your swelling. So for now, it's best for you to be stabilized. Okay. At least he was good at explaining things. Are there any exercises that I can do while I'm stuck in this position? Why do you want to do exercises? He looked directly at my chiseled abs. Afraid you'll get out of shape. Yeah. His lips pulled up to one side in a smirk. Maybe you should have thought about that before you climbed onto the back of a beast that wanted to kill you. I could see that he didn't feel sorry for me in the least. And I didn't need him to feel sorry for me anyway. I only needed him to help me heal as fast as I could so I could get out of the hospital and back home. Anything I can do to speed up my recovery? Do as I say, and you'll be out of here in a week's time. Don't do as I say, and you'll be here longer than that. I will do as you say then, because I would really love to be lying in my own bed rather than this one. He looked at Joe again. I've prescribed him an anti-inflammatory diet while he's here. I want you to tell him the list of things he can eat. Have him tell you what he likes and what he won't eat. There's no use in serving him foods that he won't eat. Then get that list to the kitchen so they can implement it right away. He walked to the door and squirted his hands with the sanitizer next to it. I'll see you tomorrow. And remember what I said, nothing physical of any kind. I understand. After the doctor left, Joe put the clean hospital gown on me and then covered me back up before taking a seat. Okay, let's see what foods you're going to get to eat for the next week. What do you think about leafy greens? I think that I'm not a rabbit. I like meat and potatoes. Nope. Not on this diet. Think fruits and veggies. Gosh, why did I get on that damn bull? Bryn. Coming in for the night shift, I saw Joe and noticed the bags underneath his eyes. A long 24 hours, wasn't it? I got a few hours of sleep during the night, but, of course, today there wasn't time for even a 10-minute catnap. 
He patted me on the shoulder. See you at six in the morning. I'm going to pick up my nephew, and we're going to crash out very early tonight. Good luck. I had serious doubts that he would be able to get a three-year-old to go to sleep early. But I wasn't going to burst his bubble. How'd it go sleeping all day? I heard Dr. Green ask. Turning to face him, I answered, it wasn't as easy as I had hoped it would be. But I did manage to get a few hours of shut eye. How are the patients doing today? Room 6 needs help getting to the shower and make sure her bed linens are changed while she's bathing. Room 3 needs a sponge bath as I still have his movement restricted. Make sure to adjust the height of his leg each night. I want to keep the hip limber. He was talking about Roman, and I wondered if he was going to bring up anything about me being professional and starting that whole thing again. I'll make sure to do those things. Other than that, there's dinner to see to. Make sure everyone eats. I have ordered a special anti-inflammatory diet for room three. Please see that he doesn't eat or drink anything other than what's on the list of foods and drinks he can have. Now it made sense that Roman wasn't allowed any sodas. Yes, doctor. Oh, and please go check up on Mrs. Cole in the maternity ward. She's been a patient of mine for the last few years, and she had her baby this afternoon. I wanted to check on her, but she was sleeping each time I went to her room. What did she have? He looked at me without blinking. A baby. I mean, is it a boy or a girl? I want to grab something from the gift shop to take to her. You know, from the whole office. That's nice of you. I think I heard that it was a girl. But I'm not sure. Check with the nurse up there before you buy anything. Will do. I had to get moving to make sure all the patients had clear trays for the dinner that was on its way. I'll call you at midnight. I'll be expecting your call. He walked away, and I headed to the furthest room to begin the night routine. I tried to push the thought that I was going to give Roman a sponge bath out of my mind. And not only one that night, but a week's worth of them. The chills that ran through me each time the thought sprang into my mind drove me crazy. Somehow, I had to stop being so crazy over the man. I'd finally managed to get on what seemed like equal footing with the doctor. I didn't want to mess things up by doing something as unprofessional as fooling around with a patient. I'd saved Roman for last. Now I stood at the door, inhaling deeply, then exhaling to try and calm myself down. He's just another patient, Bryn. Chill out. Pushing the door open, I found him lying in bed with his eyes on me and a huge smile on his face. You're back. I am back. I walked slowly, deliberately, watching every move I made so as not to act flirty with him. I began clearing away the trash from his tray. How was your day? I haven't taken any morphine since I had a little last night around nine. So I'm a little achy. But the ibuprofen is helping me some. I listened to what you said yesterday and don't want to get dependent on anything. Good. I kept my eyes moving because they wanted to stay trained on him. The doctor told me that you're on a strict diet now. So, you can't expect me to smuggle in any soda for you. I know. He made a face that had me laughing. Fruits and vegetables. Yuck. I actually like fruits and vegetables. Try not to think about them in a negative manner, and you might find out that you like them. Once all the swelling is gone, I'm going back to meat and potatoes. Well, at least your body will get some nutrients before you go back to starches and red meat. Who knows, after eating good for a week, your body may talk you into keeping this diet. Nah. One can hope. I needed to take his vitals, and I wanted to check the bruising on his ribs too. Mind if I take a peek at your chest to see how gorgeous those bruises have gotten? Holding his arms open, he said, Come on in, baby. Cocking my head to the side, I tapped my chin as I thought about how to approach the subject. Then I just went for it. You and I have got to stop flirting. He winked at me. But it's fun. Yes, I know it is. But I finally had a talk with Dr. Green and stood up for myself the way you told me to. 
Thanks for that, by the way. I needed to hear those words. That's great. Did you really let him have it? In a way, yes. I mean, I spoke my mind and didn't let him talk down on me. And now, we're on a much better level with our work relationship. It's like he respects me for standing up for myself. He should respect you. You're a very respectable person. I'm glad you did that, Bryn. I really am. His smile so bright and beaming made my heart twitch. And that wasn't good. So, you can understand why I really need to up my game to maintain this level he and I are on now. If he gets the slightest idea that I've got a thing for you, then I'll lose my footing and be right back at square one. So you have a thing for me, he asked with a grin in his face. I didn't say that. I said if he gets the idea that I do. Putting my hands on my hips, I huffed. Are you going to get on board with me on this or not? Well, he's not here. Right? He leaves at night. Doesn't he? He has left. But still, Roman, this isn't the best thing for me to be doing. Surely you understand that this is neither the time nor the place for flirting. I'm almost 24 hours from my last dose of morphine. My mind is sharp as a tack. And I still think you're the cutest thing I've ever seen. The man knew how to get right to the point, and right to my heart. Okay, I'm going to try to be professional. I guess you can just be you. A huge grin moved over his face. Bet you can't keep that professional crap up long at all. Bet I can. I took the empty pitcher, and left his room to go and fill it with ice and water. When I came back, he had his hospital gown undone and it hung at his waist. With a sly grin, he said, I thought I would help you out and undo the gown so you could check out my bruises. That is what you wanted, right? Even though there were multiple hoof marks on his chest, in various colors, from yellow to maroon, the remarkable structure of his pecs and abs stood out more than the injuries did. Gorgeous. Yeah you are, he whispered. Blinking. I pulled myself out of the momentary trance I'd been under. I mean the coloring of the bruises, I quickly made up. The colors were amazing, but the structure of his physique was even more so. I meant you. He wasn't going to make things easy for me. Putting my stethoscope into my ears, I leaned over him and checked his heart. It was strong and steady. Sounds better than it did yesterday. I felt his hand running through my hair. You left your hair down. I like it this way. As I moved back, the back of his hand grazed over my cheek, leaving trails of electrical magic behind. My heart sped up and my breathing became shallow. Clearing my throat, I shook my head to clear it too. Okay so, let me take your temperature. Am I throwing you off track, Bryn? His smile was surely throwing me off my game. Not at all. I took his temperature. Normal. The bag of fluids was just about empty. I'm going to get rid of the IV for you too. Good. I hate all these tubes in me. Most people do hate them. I began undoing everything and had him disconnected from everything in no time at all. There you go. You should feel a little more comfortable now. He pointed to his leg that was held up by the trapeze bar. When do you think he'll let me take this down? I don't know. I want to check the swelling in your back. Can you lean forward for me? He leaned up. Anything for you. The colors of the bruises on his lower back match those on his chest. My gosh, these bruises look painful. Are you sure you don't need anything stronger than ibuprofen? I can give you something oral if you need it. I don't want you in pain. I eased him to lie back on the pillows I'd fluffed up. I'm tough, remember? And it doesn't hurt. It's more like a dull ache. I can live with it. If I had even one place on my body that looked like the bruises you have, I would be begging to be put into a drug-induced coma until they got better. So you're not tough then, he asked. I suppose that I am not. The door opened, and the lady from the cafeteria was taken aback by Roman's bare chest. Oh, I'm sorry. You're in the middle of an exam. I pulled up the gown, tying the strings back together. We're done. 
You can bring his dinner in. She quickly put his plate and drink down on the tray. You must be the cowboy from yesterday's rodeo that my brother told me about. Those are hoof prints on your chest, aren't they? I am that cowboy, Roman said with a nod. Believe it or not, I'm the one who bred and raised that bull. He sure got me good. My brother said the bull just kept coming back for more. Like he was out to get you. That's the way it felt. That sounds horrifying, I said. I was in a daze for most of it, he told me. Too loopy to be scared. Get better, cowboy, the lady said, then left. I'll let you eat. I pulled the tray up for him. And then I'll be back later to give you a bath. You might want to read the doctor's notes that he made today. I took out the file from the end of his bed and saw that the doctor had written some notes about the things he'd said to Roman during his visit that day. I had to laugh. He told you no masturbation. I looked at him. Why would he have to tell you not to do that? He said that if anything on me gets engorged, you know, like I get a stiffy, then I might make myself sterile. Putting away the file, I sucked in my breath. Well, I will be super careful that nothing like that occurs. It ain't gonna be easy. You can say that again. Leaving his room, I thought about what I could do to make sure Roman got no pleasure out of the sponge bath I had to give him. Recalling that one of the doctors liked to dress up like a clown when he checked on his patients who were children, I went to the room with the scrubs in it, where I found his rainbow wig and red nose. I found a large white doctor's coat too, and put it on to hide my curvy figure. All dressed up, I looked at myself in the mirror and knew that no one would want me when I looked like Bozo the Clown. When I went back to his room, he burst out laughing. No way. I pinched my nose and it made a honking sound. Bozo is here to give you your bath. Holding his chest, he fell quiet. I forgot that it hurts to laugh. Not as bad as yesterday, but still painful. Filling the small tub with soapy water, I opened a new sponge then set to work cleaning him up. After I wash you, I'll put some liniment ointment on your back and chest. They use it on racehorses to relax their muscles after they run. He sighed as I ran the sponge over his chest and looked into my eyes. How can you be even the prettiest clown I've ever seen? Roman, try not to think that way. I don't want you hurting yourself. I honked my nose again. Almost done. Working quickly, I had him cleaned up then rubbed some of the ointment on his bruises. He caught my hand just before I turned to empty the bathwater. Hey. Thanks. You really are a great nurse. You go to the extremes to take care of your patients. Gently pulling my hand out of his, I took a bow. Thank you. I do try my best. Do you see any improvements in the swelling on my back? It's about half as swollen as it was yesterday. I expect to see even more improvement by tomorrow. Who knows? You might not have to spend a whole week here. Going home to my own bed would be nice. I bet it would be. I honked my nose one more time. Get some rest, cowboy. I've got to go help an elderly lady get into the shower, then change her bed linens. More fun, here I come. Don't wear that costume with her. Save that one just for me. It would make me feel special. Pulling the red nose off, I took the wig off too, then off came the large doctor's coat. Only for you, cowboy. His smile lit me up in ways I had no idea I could be lit up. Only for you. Roman The young nurse just kept on getting to me. I couldn't wipe the smile off my face as I thought about her wearing that silly clown outfit. Bryn was too wonderful for words. And it amazed me how fast she was getting into my heart. She'd actually taken some of what I had told her to heart and that meant a lot to me. That meant she had really listened to me. So, I needed to really listen to her. I couldn't get her in trouble for messing around with a patient. I had to try and tone down the flirting. But it wasn't going to be easy. I wasn't used to waiting for what I wanted. Patience wasn't a thing I'd ever had much of. I assumed that, that I never would. Being quick to get into a relationship, 
is what had gotten me in trouble in the first place with the nut job I'd fallen for. Patience would have been a great thing for me to have grown in the years since I'd met Lola. It hadn't been patience that had kept me from women since, but the fear that I couldn't spot a crazy person when they were right in front of my face. But Bryn was different. She can't be crazy. Not only because she was so beautiful, but because she was caring and giving and sweet. Someone like that couldn't be nuts. I felt no fear at all where Bryn was concerned. Except for the fear that my bad boy side would take over, and the part of me that knew right from wrong would get gagged and restrained. I needed to hold back with Bryn until I was no longer a patient in the hospital. But I didn't know if I could make myself do that. A light knock came on the door then she stuck her head in. You're still awake? A smile curved my lips. I am. Want to come in and lay down with me? We could cuddle the night away. Rolling her eyes Bryn came inside, closing the door behind her. I was just checking to see if you needed anything. I noticed your cell lying on the tray, but I haven't seen a charger for it. She pulled one from her pocket. Therefore I brought one with a charging block so that you can entertain yourself. She plugged it in, and it started charging as I gazed at her. You're like a real angel. Because I thought about charging your phone? She shook her head and smiled. I don't think that makes me eligible for angel status. Do you do this much for all your patients, or is it just me? I wanted to reach out, grab her and pull her to me so badly. And had I not been injured, I would have done it without a second thought. She looked at me for a second before answering. I try to do this much for every one of my patients. Frowning I asked, so I'm not special to you. You really are bad, Roman. Do you even know how bad you are? She smiled, making me think however bad I was, she liked it. Oh, I don't know. Is it bad to know what you want and to just go for it? Her eyes went wide, and she snatched her vibrating cell phone from one of her many pockets. Damn. I've gotta take this. She ran from the room like her tail was on fire. Wait, I called out but she was already gone. I honestly didn't know what the hell was wrong with me. I'd just been telling myself how I needed to stop with the flirting, but as soon as she walked in, I was right back at it. My ribs and back still ached, and my leg was strung up in a way that left me immobile. Yet, I still had the courage to ask her to come and cuddle with me in bed. As if I could even cuddle with anyone at all, strung up the way I was. It took Bryn a while to come back to see. She had some papers in her hand and gave them to me. The call was from Dr. Green. He told me to print out this information on injury to the coccyx and the problems that can go along with the injury and your organs. He has already told me about this stuff. I knew he'd done that on purpose. He wanted to emasculate me in front of her by having her give me the reading material about how I had to be celibate. He's a jerk. I don't care how good he is at what he does. He's still a real piece of crap. Why do you say that, Roman? She seemed utterly clueless. I told him that I understood why he'd said what he said to me. I don't need to read about it. I don't need you to think about my inability to function physically right now. Her cheeks went to a deep shade of red as she looked down. Oh. Now I see what you're saying. And I think you're right. The doctor was onto me about my attraction to Bryn, and it seemed like he was trying to do everything he could to get in my way. I'm glad you see what he's doing. And I hope you won't let him come between what we might have going on here. Her brows raised as she pulled her head up and looked at me. Roman, we don't have anything going on here. You know that we do, I said quietly, seriously. I wasn't going to let her deny the attraction she had for me. I don't expect you to act on it, since you think it could get you fired. But you should admit it. Crossing her arms over her chest, she shook her head. I'm not about to admit to anything that might cost me my career. I don't exactly blame you for thinking that way, but you should know that only I could complain or tell on you, since no one else is around to know about anything we do here. Her arms unfolded and dropped to her sides. That may be true, 
But how am I to know that you wouldn't end up telling people if we did do anything here? If anyone ever found out, it could cost me my career. You don't trust me not to tell anyone about anything you and I share behind closed doors. Why should I? Did someone play and tell on you, Bryn? Is that why you're so gun shy with me? Are you afraid that I'll take what I want from you, then throw dirt on your name? Not really. And no one has ever done anything like that to me. All my time has been spent in school or work, not dating. What she said made no sense. Surely you've dated someone. I mean, you're way too pretty not to have had boyfriends. Not even one. She looked around, as if looking for something to do. Not even one. I found that unbelievable. And then another thought ran through my mind. Bryn, have you been with a man? Her face flushed slightly, and she nodded and inhaled at the same time. I've been a very busy person for years now. No time for things like boys. It was hard for me to imagine being 22, and still a maiden. But the idea that she was one was rather mind-blowing. I had never been with a maiden before. But I had the idea that it would be out of this world amazing. Your mouth is hanging open, Roman, she let me know. Snapping it shut, I tried not to drool as I thought about how good it would be if I was her first. Sorry. Anyway, it's obvious that you've got lots of experience and I'm sure I would only bore you. So you see, we really don't have anything going on between us. There is nothing about you that's boring. You are such a good girl. I'd never had a good girl in my entire life, preferring the other type of girl, the kind who would be down to do anything at any time. But that type of girl had ended up being very bad for me. I guess that I am one. And I intend to stay that way. She reached up to move the strap around my leg, elongating her body. It was as if she had no idea how sensual that movement was. I forgot to move this. The doctor would have eaten me alive had I failed to do this. My mind was on nothing other than the woman I'd been so attracted to, being untouched. Have you ever kissed a guy? No, she huffed. I've never held a guy's hand either. No hugs. Nothing. I've been busy and preoccupied with school. I'm a weirdo, I know that about myself. You're so not a weirdo. You're extremely cool is what you are. Like you've always been this sort of a grown-up. But where birds and bees stuff is concerned, you just seem to have shoved it off to the side. After adjusting the strap my hip moved a little, and I groaned at how good it felt. Did I hurt you? Not at all. It actually feels better. It's not super comfy having my leg immobile and up like this. I'm sure it's not. Tomorrow will be your third day here, so ask the doctor when he thinks your leg can come down. Be sure to tell him that your hip feels as if it's in a bind. I will do that. Even using crutches will make me feel better, because at least then I'd be able to get out of this bed. And I really wanted out of that bed and out of that hospital. I had a hardcore agenda to get back to. So this paperwork that you brought to me, does it give a time frame for when I can get back on the horse? Oh, you can't ride a horse with a broken leg, silly. I didn't mean that kind of horse, Bryn. Her cheeks turned red once more. Oh, that. She picked up the papers and looked them over. Oh, right here. It says that once the swelling is down, then you can resume intimate activities with care. That means you have to be careful and pay attention to any pain, stopping at the first bit of discomfort that you experience. I really wanted the swelling to go away. So as soon as that happens, I'll be good to go. Yes? She looked at my leg. But I would assume having your leg in a cast might make that sort of thing hard for you. Nope. I can work around that. No problem at all. It's not like it's up to my groin or anything. Just to my knee. So, you'll be back to chasing girls in no time at all then. The swelling is decreasing at a good rate. I would think you'll be back to normal by morning. Reaching around to touch my back, I didn't feel any puffiness. Mind checking my back again. I don't feel any swelling going on back there. Sure. She untied my gown as I sat up, then ran her hand over my lower back. You're right. 
I don't feel any swelling. The bruising still looks bad though. But that's going to take a while to go away completely. Before she could back up too far, I took her hand. Bryn, I don't want to chase girls. She looked into my eyes. Sure you don't. I mean it. I just want to chase you. No one else. Her lips pulled into a frown. Roman, you know that I can't entertain that thought right now. No one's around. Kiss me. Her eyes went wide. No. You know you want to. Kiss me, Bryn. I can show you things that will make your mind explode. Her lips trembled as she blinked rapidly. I know you'll tell someone. Kissing you would ruin me. Not the way you think it will. It won't ruin your career. I do hope it ruins you for other men, though. Her chest heaved as she took a couple deep breaths. Roman, do you swear to God that you will never tell a soul that you kissed me while in this hospital? She's going to do it. Pull that Bible out of the drawer. She got the Bible out and held it toward me. What do you want this for? I put my hand on top of it. I swear on this Bible that I will never tell a soul about kissing you in this hospital. Her cheeks turned pink and I knew she was getting excited. Are you a praying man? I am. She spun around and went to the door, taking the Bible with her. After peeking out she closed it, then locked it and put the Bible down on the counter. Moving slowly she came toward me, her body visibly shaking. She ran her arms around herself. Why am I so cold all of a sudden? You're excited for what's about to happen. I licked my lips, then remembered that I hadn't brushed my teeth since that morning. Hey. Wait a minute. Can you get me some mouthwash before we do this? Good idea. She went to the bathroom, and I heard her rinse her mouth out. Then she returned with it, and a little bowl one could use to spit it back out in. Here use this. After spitting the mouthwash out she wiped my mouth with a small towel. Thanks. You're welcome. She put the things down, then took a seat on the side of my bed. I have no idea what to do. I'll do all the work. Stroking her cheek, I looked into her pretty blue eyes. You can trust me. I feel like I can trust you. She licked her lips. Don't laugh if I suck at this. I would never laugh at you. Easing forward I moved in tiny increments, taking my time with her, the way I now knew I needed to. Our lips touched, and what happened inside of me was beyond explanation. I felt her hands move up my arms then around my neck as her lips parted. The world could have collapsed around me and I wouldn't have noticed, too lost in the magic that was kissing beautiful nurse Bryn. Bryn The alarm on my cell began vibrating inside my pocket. It broke the spell that my first kiss had put me under. Wrenching my mouth away from Roman's hungry kiss, I found myself nearly breathless, panting and flushed. I've got to go. Wait, he groaned. Don't go. Climbing off the bed, I dashed to the door. I have to go, Roman. I had set the alarm for midnight. Dr. Green would be waiting for my call, and I was not going to disappoint him by calling late. Swiping the screen, I made the call as I walked briskly down the hallway, trying to find an empty room from where I could talk to him. He answered the call, How's it going, nurse? Everyone is doing fine. Resting peacefully, I whispered. Why do you sound out of breath? I'm whispering, not out of breath. That was a lie. I was completely out of breath from the insanely gratifying kiss I had just shared with Roman. Excitement still trickled throughout my entire body. Passion swept through my veins, and I had never felt more like I was flying instead of walking than I did at that moment. I don't want you to leave when your relief gets there in the morning. Wait for me, in the cafeteria. I'll be there around seven. There is something I want to discuss with you. That meant I would have to wait a whole hour before leaving the hospital, after doing a 12-hour shift, which I wasn't very happy about. But Raven Green wasn't a man to be put off. Okay. I'll be waiting for you in the cafeteria. With six hours left in my shift, I still had a lot to get done. So, 
I set out to do my actual work instead of making out with Roman. That was so not like me. I had heard of crimes of passion and had never actually believed that passion could take someone over so completely that they would commit a crime or other acts that they deemed themselves to be not in control over. But now, I knew that passion could make you do things that you never thought you would do. Things like kissing a patient. My stomach, full of butterflies, told me that I was more nervous about being found out than I had let myself believe. I thought I could trust Roman not to tell anyone what he had done. And I knew I could trust myself to keep the secret to myself. But there was just this nagging feeling that someday, what I had done would be found out. And I was terrified about what that would mean to my career. A nurse who messes with her patients could face serious criminal charges. Even if the patient was old enough to consent. There were so many stipulations in place to guard patients against crimes. If one word about what I had done got out, I could not only lose my job but also my freedom. What scared me the most was that I could not stop thinking about Roman and that kiss we had shared. Every second I was this close to him, knowing that I could just go into his room and he would welcome me with open arms, that I could climb into that bed with him, and he could make everything in my mind simply disappear with his kiss alone, solidified in my mind that I had become possessed by passion. Since I had never kissed anyone before, I had no idea if we had something special or if that was the way every kiss felt, regardless of the person it was with. But something told me that the kiss did mean something special. Or at least, my mind wanted me to think that way. I wanted to go to Roman and ask him if he had ever experienced that with anyone else. But I felt like he would just tell me what I wanted to hear. He was a man after all. A man who wanted more than just to kiss me. A man who looked at me in a way no other man had ever looked at me. Roman wanted so much more. And now I did too. There had never been anyone who had stimulated my hormones to this degree. If my cell hadn't gone off, I was sure that I would have gone as far as he could have gone. A part of me knew that it was so wrong for me to be thinking about things like that. I was his nurse. Had we had a prior relationship before he came to the hospital? Being with him wouldn't have exactly been a crime, it would have just been frowned upon. I had to gain some self-discipline. I had to come back to who I was before that kiss had taken me so far away. No more kissing while he was a patient. Moving like a cat from one patient's room to the next to check whether they were sleeping soundly, I examined all the rooms save his. Standing at his door, I yearned to go inside, but not simply to see if he was sleeping. Gritting my teeth, I squared my jaw and told myself that I had to stop being this airhead who was letting emotion cloud her usually clear judgment. Easing the door open, I saw his eyes closed. His chest rose and fell in a steady pattern, and I knew he was asleep. My body chilled as I stared at his face. He was so handsome, even with his mouth hanging slightly open and a soft snore escaping from his lips. Is this what love feels like? I had loved my mother. I knew what that sort of love felt like. But since that kind of love was something that had always been there, it wasn't a thing I had felt later in life. This emotion, this feeling, it was brand new and I liked the way it felt. The oddest thing came along with that new feeling, though. There was an edge of fear that hung out too. More than just the fear of someone finding out that I had done a forbidden act with him inside the hospital. There was fear that this wouldn't last. Fear that he was playing me for a fool. Fear that only I felt this way and he didn't. Who knew that love would be this difficult? If it even was love. It could have been something very different. Lust, perhaps. How was I to know? Knowing that I had to get my mind off Roman and everything else, I got down to work. Going to the linen closet, I took inventory before going to my computer to order 12 fresh sets of bed linens and bath towels from the laundry department. I updated the files of each patient, and before I knew it, Joe was coming in. Morning, Bryn. How were the patients last night? Not a peep out of them. How was your night babysitting? Well, that was a fiasco. Did you know that giving three-year-olds candy can make them certifiably insane? 
he tossed his bag under the counter. You know, I have heard once or twice that sugar can make a kid hyper, I said sarcastically. I pulled my bag out from under the counter, since I would no longer be working. Well, I obviously haven't been paying attention to what people say. I gave Henry a small thing of chocolate candy. We were sitting on the couch, watching some stupid cartoon that he had to watch. All of a sudden, he got up to stand on the couch and began jumping like it was a trampoline. And when I told him that he wasn't supposed to do that, he laughed in my face then threw the remainder of the candy at me, all while laughing hysterically. What a nightmare. I worried that he would be like that the whole night. But there was this meltdown after the laughter, and after that, he fell face first on the couch dead asleep. At first, I thought he'd had some kind of an attack and called his mother, fearing for the kid's life. But she laughed and explained to me what had happened. He had a sugar crash? I asked. Yep. And she said that he was most likely going to sleep like a rock for the rest of the night. I carried him to the little bed I set up in my bedroom, and he never woke up the entire night. I had to wake him up to get him ready for daycare, and he was still groggy when I dropped him off. Wow sounds like you had quite the night. I did. It's good to know that your night wasn't nearly as eventful as mine. It was eventful all right. Only, I can never tell anyone about the events that took place. Yeah, just a nice peaceful night for me. I put the strap of my bag over my shoulder. I'm going to the cafeteria. Dr. Green asked me to meet him there this morning, to talk about something. Mysterious, Joe said as he wiggled his brows. I know. See you tonight at six. I will be here, waiting with bells on. The cafeteria had barely opened when I walked in, the smell of baked pastries filling the air. Jen stood behind the counter, a smile on her face. Morning Bryn. What can I get you this morning? The freshest thing you have back there, and a cup so that I can make myself some coffee. She grabbed a bagel with cream cheese and smoked salmon on each half, and a small coffee cup. Here you go. Enjoy. Thanks Jen, I said as I slipped her a five, I like to tip the workers since the staff could eat for free. You are very welcome. I went to find a table, then put my bagel down before taking my cup to the coffee machine. After filling it with piping hot coffee, adding some chocolate creamer and caramel drizzle, I went to sit down and enjoy my breakfast. Not long after finishing off the bagel, I saw Dr. Green walking into the cafeteria. He spotted me right away, since only two more people had come in. Bryn. Thanks for staying to meet with me. Sure, Dr. Green. Raven, he corrected me. This meeting is between Raven and Bryn, not our counterparts. I really didn't like the way he had two personalities, but what could I do to change it? Okay. So, what are we meeting about this morning? I've been working on a side project for the last couple of months. Some very prestigious men in our community came to me with a certain problem. I'm not at liberty to tell you their names, so don't ask. Of course, I would never ask you to divulge anything like that to me. That is exactly why I think that you'd be the perfect assistant for me on this project. You're discreet. You don't have a bunch of friends that you confide in either. Everything we do on this project would be top secret. Okay. I wasn't sure what the heck kind of project he was doing, but it was a little worrisome. So, what type of work would I be doing? Assisting me to come up with relaxation techniques that would help men with ED. Erectile dysfunction. I asked to be clear. Yes. I had no desire to work on anything like that. No thank you. He looked a little surprised that I had said no to him. Maybe that was because I rarely, more like never, said that word to him. And why would you so quickly turn this down? First of all, I am uncomfortable with it. And second of all, I will have nothing to add to your knowledge of this subject. I would be of no use to you, is what I am saying. You would be of use to me. See, I need to work on these techniques in order to share them with my patients. The standard techniques are not working for them. The little blue pills won't work? I asked. 
they prefer not to take medications. You have read the side effects of those medications, haven't you? One of them is that the patient could end up seeing everything in shades of blue. None of my patients want to take any chances. And their ed has affected not only their intimate relationships, but also their overall attitudes. Anger seems to be a common issue between all of them. They get angry over little things that never bothered them before. I am under the impression that the reason behind that is their frustration. And how am I supposed to help you figure out these new treatment techniques? He blinked a couple of times before asking, How do you think you can help me come up with suitable techniques for arousal, Bryn? By practicing them with you. My mind knew what he meant, but the words would not come out of my mouth. As a matter of fact, nothing was coming out of my mouth as I stared at him. And he took that wrong. Yes, stare into my eyes, Bryn. Make a connection with the eyes first. I can see what you're getting at. No, I said quickly. You should know something about me, Raven. I didn't love the thought of divulging such an intimate thing to my boss, but it seemed like the quickest way to make this conversation go away. I've never been intimate with a man. Not at all. Like none. Like I am a maiden, in every single way there is to be one. Well, save kissing. I have recently done that. Not that I can tell you that. The way his face lit up frightened me. Really? Yes. Really? How fascinating. I mean, scientifically speaking. You would absolutely be the best assistant for me. You have no set, tried and true methods that might hold you back from trying things that normally wouldn't be tried by people who have already found their limits. My limits are that I'm not intimate. And I certainly wasn't going to be with him. I'm still unsure if this is the best thing for me to be doing. The compensation you will get will be phenomenal. My heart pounded. Really? He nodded. Really? The men who are my secret patients pay me extremely well to keep everything hush-hush. And I will pay you well to do the same. Roman After the amazing kiss we'd had last night, my disappointment that Bryn hadn't come by to see me before she left the hospital wasn't surprising at all. I woke to the sounds of another lady bringing in my breakfast, and I asked, Is Nurse Bryn still around? No. Her shift ended at 6 this morning. Nurse Joe is here. Do you need me to get him for you? She put the bowl of fresh fruits on my tray. Then she pulled a small bag of mixed nuts out of her pocket and placed them on the tray too. Heading back into the hallway, she dug through her little stainless steel cart and came back with a glass of something green. Your juice. I grimaced. What's in it? Spinach, pineapple, green apple, lemon and cucumber. From the way you're looking, this anti-inflammatory diet has been working wonders on you. Be sure to thank your doctor for ordering it for you. I am literally starving to death in here. Can I have some eggs and bacon please? We must follow the doctor's orders. Sorry. She pulled a small bag out of another pocket. You can have some granola too if you would like. It might help you feel fuller. No thanks. The bag was clear so I could see the contents, it looked like some sticks and raw oats to me. I'll be out of here soon. I hope. I'll get some real food then. I should say that you look great. I think this food is very good for your body. Thanks. I popped a strawberry into my mouth. It has worked on the swelling. I just don't understand why I can't have real food too. Ask your doctor. We will bring anything he allows us to. See you at noon. Have a nice morning. You too. I had to remember that it was not that poor woman's fault that my doctor was as evil as they come. Looking at my cell as I ate my skimpy breakfast, I wished I could call Bryn to ask her what she thought about last night. But I knew that she wouldn't be giving me her number until I was released from the hospital, which I thought should be soon. The swelling was gone. I knew that, even if I couldn't see my back. The door opened, and in came Nurse Joe. Well, good morning, handsome. How was your night? Great. 
it had been the best night ever, thanks to one special nurse. How was yours? It turned out okay. For a while, I was worried about my little nephew being there. But we made it through, and I have learned an important lesson where kids are concerned. What's that? No candy at night. Maybe no candy, ever. I am opting for the no candy when he's with his Uncle Joe for sure. I laughed and found that my chest didn't hurt very much at all with the action. Hey. No real pain this time. He held up his hand and I high-fived him. I must tell you that you're doing remarkably well, Roman. He adjusted the strap holding up my leg. And I will personally ask the doctor about getting you out of this contraption, as you love to call it. Thank you. When the doctor came in later that morning, he performed a thorough examination of me. Dr. Green, as you can clearly see, his swelling is almost non-existent. His hip has been bothering him too. So, do you think his leg can come down now? I'll keep it elevated with pillows. And the rehab nurse can come and work him out some starting today. Nodding the doctor agreed, yes the leg can come down. You will still have to be very careful where physical activities are concerned. If I were you, I would wait at least a month after sustaining these kinds of injuries. Unless you don't care about ever having any offspring. I wasn't waiting a month for intimacy. I knew his game. He was after Bryn, and he knew I was too. He just wanted to scare me off. But I wasn't easy to scare. I got you, Doc. See that you do. He nodded in a gesture to my leg. Once that leg comes down and the rehab nurse starts on you, the swelling will return. I'm ordering the same diet for the remainder of your time here. About the diet. Can I have regular food on top of that anti-inflammatory stuff? No, you may not. I was sure he was trying to keep me weak with the diet so that I wouldn't have the energy to give Bryn what I wanted to give her. But he was wrong about that too. Okay. Getting my leg out of the air was a win in my book. So, I was happy with that. How many more days do you think you're going to keep me here? A day, two, maybe three. We'll just have to see how rehab makes you feel. Some people feel great in no time at all. Others are set back a few days. One never knows how it will go. So I cannot tell you when you'll be discharged yet. Why does this rehab thing sound so bad? It had me worried that it would set me back, and I didn't want that at all. The doctor shrugged. It's not bad. It's only that some find it difficult, while others don't. See you tomorrow. I looked at Joe as he followed the doctor out. I can have pain meds if I need them, right? You betcha. I'll be back soon to set your leg free. At least with my leg free, I could move around a little. That was better than nothing. Not much time passed before Joe came back. Let's get that leg down for you. Once you can use the crutches to move around without being a fall risk, you can use the toilet like a big boy. Won't that be nice? I was eager to make this step of the healing process. But as he moved my leg slowly down to the two pillows he'd piled up underneath it, I realized that my hip was not the same as it had been before the bull tried to kill me. Oh wow. I know buddy. Once he'd stabilized my leg, he grabbed something from one of the many drawers in the room and shoved a heating pad under my butt. This will help with the stiffness. Pain meds now, I said through gritted teeth. And that was when Nurse Ratchet walked into my room. No pain meds before we do physical therapy. I have to know when I'm hurting you, and you won't even know that if you have any. The older woman was built like a linebacker, and she had the eyes of Adolf Hitler, no hint of mercy in them. I'd already broken into a sweat with the pain in my hip. I had no idea if I could take any more at that point. Not ready for this. I couldn't even speak in sentences, the pain was so all-consuming. No one ever is, honey, she said with a gravelly voice that sounded like she'd smoked a pack of cigarettes a day for her entire life. But we have to do it anyway. My stiff hip was given no time at all to warm up from the heating pad Joe had stuck under it, as she lifted my broken leg with one hefty lunge and held it straight up. No. 
You'll be up and using crutches in no time, she said, her face so close to mine that I could smell the morning coffee on her breath. This has got to be as close to hell as I can come while still alive. Thirty minutes later, I finally understood what the doctor had been talking about when he said that some patients did well with physical therapy, and others got set back a bit. I was the kind that got set back. Everything hurts now, I whimpered as Joe came into the room. He'd left when my groans of pain had gotten too loud. I bet it does. He handed me a tiny cup with two pills in it. These will take you to La La Land. The pain will still be there when you wake up, but at least you can sleep through most of it. I could barely lift my arm to take the medication from him. Then he had to hold a straw to my lips so I could drink them down with some water. Thank you kind sir. Pleasant dreams handsome. Even my eyelids ached as I closed them, thinking to myself that the bull old yeller hadn't been as brutal as the physical therapist aka Satan. Hey sleepyhead, I heard a soft female voice whisper in my ear. A smile instantly formed on my lips as I knew right away who was drawing me from my dreams which had been all about her. You're here. I am here. She ran her hand over my cheek. I see that your leg is down. And I saw that you had a visit with Nurse Brackett, the physical therapist, this morning. You didn't even wake up to eat your lunch. It's still on your tray. The purple grapes look more like raisins now. Her hand ran through my hair, and I sighed with the wonderful sensation. Can you get rid of that evil woman for me, baby? Her lips pulled up to one side. You know that you shouldn't be calling me that while you're still a patient here. But no one has ever called me that before. I like hearing you say that to me. I like waking up to your smiling face. I pulled her to me and kissed her lips softly. Sorry if my breath stinks. I just had to get one kiss in before you get all professional on me. She laughed quietly. Your breath isn't a problem. Standing up straight she looked at me with soulful eyes. I know that rehab is probably worse than the initial injuries. That's due to the adrenaline you were getting so much of during the initial trauma. There was no adrenaline helping to keep your body in a state of shock when the therapist began twisting your body around. And no pain meds either. I don't understand why I couldn't have pain meds before Nurse Ratchet started beating me up. She said it was so that I could tell her when I was experiencing pain. But I screamed at her when that happened, and she just went even further. It takes a certain type of person to be able to be a physical therapist. They have to determine when someone is being wimpy or really hurting. She probably saw your fantastic physique and knew you could handle more than you were letting on. Easing myself into a sitting position, I used the automatic bed to help lift my body up. The sounds of the metal cranking hurt my ears. Ow. Why are noises bothering me? The pain meds have left you with sensitivity to sound and light. That's why I've left the lights on dim, so that they don't hurt your eyes. You know what? I was a tough cowboy when I came in here. And it's you guys who keep taking the tough out of me. I want my tough back, Bryn. Can you just give it back to me already? She laughed as if I were joking around, which I was not. Seeing this side of you is insightful. You're so cute when you're helpless and hurting. Now that's not a weird thing to say at all, I said with sarcasm. I'm sorry. But it's true. I like that you have a side to you that's not all tough and macho. I don't like this side of me at all. As a matter of fact, I have never even met this side of myself before. I don't like this wimpy, whiny guy at all. Help me get rid of him, will ya? Only time can do that. Time and your body healing. But I can give you one of my massages if you like. Can this one have a happy ending? I said it like I was joking, only I wasn't joking at all. The bad boy part of you lives on in this side of you too, I see. Putting the blood pressure cuff on me, she pumped it up. Let me get your vitals. You can have them. You can have anything of mine or on my body that you want. She had me wrapped around her finger and didn't even know it. Is that so? She jotted down my blood pressure. Normal. Next is the temperature. 
You make me warm so if it's high, that's why. She ran the thermometer across my forehead. Normal. You still make me warm. Maybe not up there but down here, I pointed at my sweet spot, totally hot for you. Putting her hands on her hips, she looked a little agitated. Is that all men ever think about? Intimacy. Why do you look angry? Well, it might be because Raven asked me to be his assistant in a dysfunction study. He wants me to assist him with finding some relaxation techniques for some prestigious patients of his. I didn't like anything she'd just said. First thing, why are you calling the doctor by his first name? Oh, he asked me to call him that for this project. So, I guess I've already associated using that name with this project. Still didn't like a thing she'd said. Second, what types of relaxation techniques is he talking about for men with Ed? Like I know Roman, she said, a loud huff following her words. My guess is something intimate. The hell with that noise, Bryn. You are not doing anything remotely intimate with that man. He's a creep. You may not have seen that about him yet, but I have. He's a total and complete creep who wants to get you into his sick and twisted bed. The smile she wore didn't make any sense to me at all. But then she said, you really do like me. You have to like me, or you wouldn't be this jealous over him. Why would you think that I didn't really like you? That kiss last night should have told you all you need to know about my feelings for you. No one has ever made fireworks actually go off inside my entire body. Only you, baby. And I'm not about to let any man take you away from me. Bryn. The insecurities I had felt about Roman's true feelings for me vanished when he admitted that he'd felt fireworks when we'd kissed the night before. I knew he couldn't have been lying about that. Especially when he got jealous over Raven. So I made my own admission to him, you are the only man I've ever kissed. So, I wasn't sure whether all the fireworks and electricity were normal or not. You felt all that too, he asked with a grin. Nodding I asked, so it's not the usual thing to feel all that when kissing then. I've kissed a lot of girls in my time. But I have never, not ever, felt anything like the way your kiss made me feel. It was something else altogether. And I certainly think that neither of us should take our chemistry for granted. Things like that come once in a lifetime. Do you really think so? I had absolutely no idea about romantic things like that. I know so, he winked at me, baby. Chills ran through me once again. It's crazy how you saying that makes me feel. Then I tried it out on him. Babe? Putting his hand to his heart, his eyes went wide. Wow. That's a first for me too. My heart actually skipped a beat. You're joking. I had to laugh at his over-the-top antics. No. He took my hand and put it against his chest. Say it again. Batting my eyelashes at him, I said, babe. And I felt his heart skip a beat. Oh wow. Kismet. Serendipity. I could not wipe the smile off my face. Maybe that mean bull was meant to mess you up so that you could come and meet me here in this hospital where I practically live. We wouldn't have met any other way. I never go out. I order my groceries curbside, and pick them up on Sunday afternoons. I'm either here or at home. Sorry you had to get so beaten up just for us to meet. His smile told me he didn't mind at all. Anything to have met you. I'll never hold old Yeller accountable for the beating he gave me. Not when it meant that I would be able to meet you. My soulmate. Soulmate? I asked. Do you honestly think that? I do. I was thinking that it might be true too. Why not? I've heard stranger things. This elderly woman came in with heart failure and was here for three days. Her husband stayed right by her side the entire time. He held her hand as she died on the third day. And I was in the room when he kissed her on the forehead and told her that he would be no more than three days behind her. Really? He asked. This is God's honest truth. I was right there when she took her last breath, and then he told her those words. 
He looked me right in the eye before he left the room and said that his wife had been his soulmate. He added that I would see him again within three days and asked me to take him to see who he needed to see about getting a DNR in place. What's a DNR? A do not resuscitate order. Oh. He didn't want to be brought back once he died? He did not want to be brought back. So I took him to get that done, and the order was in place. I didn't honestly believe that he would be back within the three-day period to die. There was nothing wrong with him at all. So what happened? On the third day, at 15 minutes until 3 in the afternoon, he arrived in the emergency room with breathing trouble. Although he had no history of asthma at all, he was having an active asthma attack, which took his life at exactly 3 p.m. that afternoon. I was there, and his eyes were trained on the same spot in the ceiling the entire time. I swear that I saw a bright light up there, and once he took his last breath, it disappeared as if his soul had been pulled through the portal so that it could close back up. You must see some serious stuff working here. I have seen some of the most serious things, things that can never be unseen. Things that defy the imagination. This job has given me faith in the afterlife that no church ever has. We all leave behind our broken, exhausted and no longer working bodies, but we all go on to a better place. You have no idea how many smiles I have witnessed on dying patients' faces. You're being serious, aren't you? He asked with wonder in his eyes. I am being serious. I've heard dying patients talking to people who I can't see, but they seem to be able to clearly see and hear. Once I heard two people talking, but when I went into the patient's room, the man was still in a coma and no one else was in that room. It's like other souls come to take us home. I hugged myself as chills had formed on my skin. This is an amazing job. That's why I'm so passionate about it. I want to learn everything that I can about helping people to get better or to help them pass in peace. You really are an angel. His fingers gently caress my cheek. I can't believe that I belong with an angel. I've been looking for Miss Wright in all the wrong places, it seems. The bars. The rodeo groupies. Even looking at church didn't lead me to my angel. I couldn't help but smile as he called me another sweet name. The things you say make my heart sing. I'm glad I can make your heart sing because you make mine sing too. I have never been in love before. But I think you and I might find that place I've always thought was imaginary. With you, I think I could find my happily ever after. We could find our happily ever after. Running my hand through his thick, unruly hair, I knew I had to do a little caretaking of my broken cowboy. Time for a warm sponge bath, followed by a lengthy muscle rub on all the places the mean old physical therapist aggravated. His eyes closed as I leaned over to leave a kiss on his forehead, before going to gather the things I would need to get the job done. You really are an angel. My angel. His eyes opened, and he placed his hands on my arms. Tell me that you're mine. Looking into his eyes, I had a strong impression that he and I belonged together. I am yours. Are you mine? I am yours too, baby. And nothing has ever felt so right. It felt as if I were floating around the room as I got his warm bath together, then went back to him, pulling the blanket back to expose the leg he hadn't broken. Running the sponge over it, I moved it up along his inner thigh, then handed him the sponge. You can go further up. Shaking his head, he said, You do it. Heat spread like wildfire through me. No. I can't. I'm not supposed to do that on patients who are awake and can do that part on their own. He put his hands behind his head and closed his eyes. Pretend I'm sleeping then. I'd seen plenty of men and women in my line of work. But this didn't seem as clinical as it had been with other people. He sighed as his eyes got all dreamy looking. Think you can come to my place once I get out of here to help me in the bathtub? The idea stimulated me in ways that shocked me. You would want me to do that? I am begging you to do that. Biting my lower lip, I noticed that my heart raced, and so did my mind, imagining what it would be like to take a bath with the handsome cowboy. Roman, you are so bad. 
I would love to show you how bad I can really be. Once this cast comes off, you're really gonna find out some things about me. Goosebumps peppered my flesh. Like what? Like how I like to ride for hours at a time. I didn't see how that would affect me. I don't get it. He laughed, shaking his head. You really are without any type of intimate experience, aren't you? I really am. Taking my time with his bath, and then the massage, I spent more than an hour with him before I had to leave to check on the other patients. It was getting harder and harder to leave his room. But I knew I couldn't spend the entire 12-hour shift with only him. So I got on with my work, and before I knew it, my alarm went off, telling me it was time to find a quiet place so that I could call the doctor. The nurse's lounge was empty, so I went inside and took a seat, about to make the call. But when I pulled my cell from my pocket, I found a video call coming in from the doctor and swiped the screen to answer it. He was in bed, bare-chested, and the sheet only up to his waist. How are things going there? Everyone is doing just fine, doctor. Raven, he said. This isn't the doctor calling you tonight. This is Raven. The scientist, hoping that you will accept his generous assistant researcher offer. I'm growing impatient, waiting for your answer. I'm not sure that I can be a good assistant to you. And why is that? Something caught my eye. I noticed that the sheet was moving a bit. But he held the phone with one hand, and the other was behind his head. Is someone there with him? I tried to ignore the slightly moving sheet to answer his question. I'm just not comfortable with any intimacy. Did I not educate you to be more scientific? Did I not expose you to various forms of anatomy and reproductive organs? I was with you when you did pelvic exams on female patients. I was there with you when you did physical exams on teenage boys who needed them so that they could play sports. You have held the male scrotum in the palm of your hand without blinking an eye. The way I taught you to. The way he made it sound, it would be more scientific than I had realized. Can you explain some of the things you would have me do? It looked as if a hand was moving up his thigh under the thin sheet, and I was certain that I saw movement in his groin area. And will we be alone when this research is being done? This is creepy. No, we won't be alone. Is that what you've been worried about? That we'll be alone? There's no reason to be afraid of being alone with me. You should know that by now. You know that I am a trustworthy man, Bryn. He had been so far. Sorry, Raven. Apology accepted. And as for your duties as my assistant, they would be things like taking measurements. Like reproductive a organ measurement? Yes. In different states. Roman would be against me doing things like that. But I couldn't let my burgeoning relationship with Roman dictate what I would do in my career. Okay. I suppose that is reasonable and I can deal with that, as long as it's completely clinical. Are you thinking about opening some kind of reproductive clinic? No. What I am doing is not for the public. This work is purely for people who pay me to be more than just discreet. They want none of their personal intimate problems to be out there for public scrutiny. I can understand that. And I can be more than discreet. You must be able to keep everything we do to yourself. No one can know of anything that goes on here at my home. I shivered as a chill went through me. So, all of this will happen at your home instead of at a medical facility somewhere? I wasn't sure that I liked that. Where else would you have me do such private research, Bryn? That is precisely why we are using our first names only. No last names. No doctor, no nurse. We are Raven and Bryn, researchers and nothing more than that, for this project. It's not going to be something terrifying, Bryn. As a maiden, I know that you must have some wild ideas about intimate performances. When you look at them with a the researcher's eye, you can break down things. Think about the things you were shown in pictures before you ever had to see them with your own eyes. Things like lacerations. Things like bacterial infections. Those can be quite nasty. 
but you were shown picture after picture of those things to desensitize you. When a patient has a grotesque injury or infection, the last thing they need is the medical staff gagging or saying how gross it is. I was finally beginning to understand him. So I should somehow desensitize myself to the male organ and the things it does? Precisely. And I will help you. I didn't know what he meant by that. And I didn't feel like asking him at that time. My mind hadn't been made up yet. I see. Bryn, you should know that the money you can make from being my assistant can help you in many ways. I'm sure that, like everyone in the medical field, you've racked up a mountain of debt with college expenses. To the tune of 80,000, with interest that had been building on them all. It would be nice to be able to keep more of my paycheck than I currently can after the student loans take their share, which is over half of my check each week. You will make six figures if you take this job, Bryn. Not in a year. You will make that in the amount of time it takes us to come up with some working techniques. I foresee us accomplishing that within a few months if we work together most nights. My mind blown, I couldn't even breathe as I thought about being able to pay off my student debt and then put the rest away in a nest egg. I had no idea the pay would be that much. How can I turn that down? Roman Hearing rustling sounds in my room, I opened my eyes to find Joe clearing off my tray. Bryn had done it again, taking off without saying anything to me. And I couldn't ask Joe anything about her, or he was going to get super suspicious of me. Morning, I said with a crackly voice as I used the button to move the top of my bed to a sitting position. There he is, Joe said with a smile. Your delicious breakfast is on the way. And guess what? What? You're getting your crutches today. Does that mean I can get out of here today too? I had high hopes of getting to go home. When he grimaced, I knew what the answer was going to be. Well no. I don't think so anyway. You have the physical therapy to do today, and it's scheduled for tomorrow too. Can I just come in for that? Why would I have to stay here just to do 30 minutes of physical therapy a day? Not that I would come back to let that tormentor torture me anymore if they were to discard me. But I would lie if I had to. I would say just about anything to get out of that hospital. You could talk to Dr. Green about doing that. I honestly have no idea what he would say to it. I didn't like talking to the creepy doctor who was clearly after the girl I was destined to spend my life with. But since he was my only hope of getting out of the place, I had no choice. And he'll be in around the usual time. I think so. He checked my temperature by running the little rolling thing across my forehead. Let's get these pesky vital signs out of the way. I know that I'm all good. Last night when Bryn took them, I was fine. His mouth pulled into a curve. Oh, were they now? Was that because the adorable nurse has your heart in her hands? As if. She's oblivious to me, I lied to cover her. If she wasn't the pro she is though, well, watch out. You won't always be her patient, you know. What then? I felt like he was digging a little, and decided to stick to my story. She's so far out of my league that it's not even funny. Nodding, he seemed to be agreeing with me. When she's in nurse mode, sure. But I'm sure she's not always in that mode. She's just a young woman, like all the other young women. I'm not sure about her life outside of work though. Since we've always worked opposite shifts, I've never seen her out and about. Nah, she really is way out of my league. I had to make it sound convincing. I ain't nothing but a rodeo cowboy. She deserves better than an old cuss like me. He looked at me with a sly expression. Methinks thou dost protest too much. I might have been overdoing it a bit. I mean she's attractive. Don't get me wrong. And smart too. Too smart for a simple man like myself. What would we have in common? What would we talk about? I would be lost in any conversation she would care to have. And she would be bored by what I had to say. There's only so much to say about cows and horses. Aha. Uh -huh. 
it was obvious that I wasn't fooling him at all. He wasn't the one I had to fool, though. It was the evil Dr. Green who could never learn of our forbidden love, which I was sure was what we had going on between us, real love. Of course, I wasn't going to go around saying that to her. Yet. But I had the feeling that once we'd be able to spend time together, that the L word would be coming along soon after. Anyway, enough about that, I said, changing the subject. I know my reaction to the physical therapy was less than spectacular. So, do you have any hints on what I can do to make it way less painful? Relax. Take even breaths as she moves your body around like she's trying to make a human pretzel. Think yoga positions and use those sorts of techniques. You've made progress with your deep breathing exercises. Use those to help you deal with the manipulations she does to your body. All great ideas. I should have asked him about that yesterday. Have you ever been on crutches before? He asked me. Thankfully, I have not. I know being a 30 year old cowboy who's just suffered his first broken bone says something. Well, hairline fractured bone. Am I correct in assuming that the cast won't have to stay on the usual six week period since it's not fully broken? He nodded, making my day. Around week three, you'll need to visit your regular doctor to get your leg x rayed to see if the cast can come off. That's not long at all. It looks like I'm spending week one right here. Only two more weeks of hobbling around, and then I'll be good as new. The only thing I've been missing with this diet he's put me on is the milk and vitamin D that I used to take daily. Any chance you can hook me up? No one around this hospital breaks Dr. Green's rules. He's a real. The door opened, and in sauntered the earlier than usual doctor. A real what nurse? The shade of red Joe's face turned was not of this world as he stammered, a real great doctor who knows his stuff. And no one should ever second guess him. Precisely what I thought you were about to say. The doctor's chest rose and fell as he looked at my file. So, pain medication immediately following your first physical therapy session. He shook his head. I'd expected more from a man like you. Pity. I felt as if I were being sized up by the man. Well, in my defense, that woman is a demon from hell. A smirk formed on his face. I have a standing appointment with her once a week. You don't see me whimpering about the way she handles my body. It's not like you have any injuries. Obviously, if I had to deal with weekly sessions with the Hun, I would be able to take her particular kind of pain. I was a bull rider, so I wasn't some wimp the way he was suggesting. You slept through lunch, the night nurse wrote on your chart. Seems you are one of those who end up being set back by the physical therapy. So, we will be seeing each other tomorrow for sure. And maybe even the day after that. Unless you can learn to work with the good therapist. I've just told him how to make the next session more comfortable, doctor, Joe jumped in to defend me. And he's asked about taking vitamin D as a supplement. He looked at me then winked and milk. He'd like that added to his diet. He looked at my file again, flipping through it. Each morning's lab work says that his vitamin and nutrient levels are within the range for his age and weight. So I see no reason to add those things. He closed the file, putting it away at the end of my bed. Also, consumption of dairy can lead to issues with the gut. With your limited mobility, I would think you wouldn't want to deal with gut issues at this time. I'm about to get crutches, which means I'll be able to go to the bathroom on my own. And I am overjoyed about that. So I'll take my chances with the milk. Tell you what, he said with an air of authority that really irritated me. You let me make the decisions about what is best for you, and you just lay in that bed and get better. No milk. Do what you want once you get out of my hospital. While you're here, no milk. You will stay on the strict diet I have you on. Nothing more. There is a sign on the other side of your door that lets everyone know that no outside food or drinks are to be brought into this room. He looked at Joe. Make sure you watch what people bring in and out of this room. Yes, doctor. So far, he's only had the one visitor when he first came in. With one brow cocked, the doctor said, 
I would have expected a line of women coming in to see you during visiting hours. Well, you were wrong. I'm not exactly chasing the dames, Doc. And I don't tease them into chasing me either. He gave me a slight nod, then turned his attention to Joe. Nurse, may I ask if your current need for the switch in shifts with Nurse Bryn Davis will go past the agreed upon week? No. My nephew will be going back to his mother's house in a few days. We can change back to our normal shifts soon. Great. She's going to have her evenings full for a few months, as soon as she can change shifts with you. I was dying to know why that was. But I knew that I couldn't ask. My plans were for Bryn to spend her free time with me after I got out. So, I wasn't happy at all hearing that she apparently had plans with him. Oh yeah? Joe asked. Doing what? I got the impression that he was asking the question on my behalf. And I was going to make sure the man got a very special gift after I was released. She's accepted a job as my assistant for a side project. That will keep her very busy for the next few months. The grin the doctor wore made me want to rip his face off. She accepted the job. The doctor looked at me, then back at Joe. His face is turning red. Check his blood pressure. My face was red because I was about to blow my top. I'm fine. Joe hurried to put the blood pressure cuff on. I'll just check this out right quick. The doctor never took his eyes off me. You seem upset. Nope. I tried hard to calm down. I couldn't let him know that what he'd said had set me off. Joe looked at me with a grim expression. Your blood pressure is a little high. It seems to have overlapped with what I said, the doctor said with a smirk. Why would you be upset by what I said? I'm not. I tried very hard to hold back my anger. Maybe it was anxiety about the upcoming physical therapy. Is it really that terrible? he asked. It really is. So strange that a man who will climb onto the back of a bull thinks physical therapy is terrible. I find that fascinating. Afraid of something meant to help. And unafraid of something meant to be frightening. Odd. I hated that I had to take his digs at my manhood. But I couldn't spout off anything that might make him think that Bryn and I had something special going on between us. I would get my answers from the woman myself. So, if I make it through today's session without needing pain meds, can I leave tomorrow? The way his forehead burst into tiny lines as he raised both brows told me that he thought my question was stupid. You've just had an incident, a spike in blood pressure for no apparent reason. Surely, you don't expect me to release you after that happened. What if it doesn't happen again? Then can I leave tomorrow? I wanted out of there. But at the same time, it was the only thing keeping me close to Bryn. I don't like what-if questions. They're too hard to determine. I make my decisions based on facts. Not what might occur. So for now you will be our guest for another night, maybe two and possibly three. Joe put the blood pressure cuff away, then asked the doctor, Do you happen to need an assistant for any other project, Dr. Green? I would love to be able to add working with you on any of your projects to my resume. Shaking his head, he answered, I'm putting my full attention on this particular project. It's a very important one. If it weren't such a specialized thing, I would of course ask you to join the team. But unfortunately, only females are required for this. Isn't that biased? Joe asked. No men at all will be required. Well some will. But they have already been chosen. And I will be the only male participant on our side of things. It's best that way. The clients not only prefer it that way, but they demand it be that way. Sounds fascinating, Joe said. Hate that I'm getting left out of it. Bryn. Coming in for my shift, I felt like I was riding on a cloud, thrilled that I would have the money to set myself free from all the debt I'd racked up from school. I'd be able to get that all sorted with only a few months of work. It felt as if the tremendous weight I'd been carrying on my shoulders for years was growing less with each passing day. I made decent money with my nursing job. Once my student loans were paid off, 
I could actually find a better apartment in a better location. The one I currently lived in wasn't much more than a shack. An efficiency with no kitchen, and a tiny bathroom with a stand-up shower that smelled of mold and mildew, no matter how hard I scrubbed it or how much bleach I poured down the drain. I might even be able to get a new car and make payments. I drove a beat-up old Volkswagen Bug from the 80s. Driving something new, or at least new to me, would be nice. There were so many things going through my mind about what I would be able to do with my current paycheck once I'd paid off my bills, that I lost track of what I was supposed to be doing in the first place. Instead of going to the nurse's station to relieve Joe, I was heading right for Roman's room to tell him the great news. Spinning around, I went to find Joe to inform him that I was there so he could leave. His eyes caught mine as I strolled up the corridor. So, the good doctor told me about the project you two are about to begin. He did. I was a little surprised, since Raven had told me to keep things to myself. And there he was, telling Joe about the project he deemed top secret. He did. And he said that if my particular set of skills is required, he'll let me in on the project too. Did he explain the project to you? He was vague about the actual project. But my sexual preference was brought up for some reason. I thought I should warn him why that might be. But then I decided to tone it down a bit, so that Raven wouldn't get upset with me for talking about the secret project. Just be sure he explains everything he will expect from you before you take the job. The money is great, but don't do anything against your moral code. His brows rose slowly. What is this project about anyway? I'm not at liberty to say. Just ask lots of questions and make him pin down what he would want you to do, I warned him. What kind of money is he paying you, Bryn? Again, I cannot say a word about that either. If you really want to get to work on this project, you will have to keep everything to yourself. You can't tell another soul about anything you see or do on this project. You've got me as curious as a cat now. He laughed. Man, I hope he ends up needing me. I hope you get a piece of the action too. I had to get to work. See you in the morning. I went to the furthest room first and worked my way back to see Roman last. That way, I could spend more time with him. By the time I got to him, his dinner was already being served. Finding roasted beets on his plate, I knew he was less than enthusiastic about his dinner. But I didn't say anything, not with the lady from the cafeteria still in the room. She was trying to pep him up about the meatless meal. They're actually really good. He looked at the mounds of bright red on the plate. I just can't believe that. I spotted a set of crutches leaning up against the wall behind his bed. A smile found its way to my lips. He's up and walking. With all his swelling diminished, and now that he was able to move around and get to the bathroom by himself, I would sneak him something good to eat. I've got to check his vitals. I'll make sure he eats. The woman nodded at me. Thank you, nurse. You're welcome. She left, closing the door behind her, and I went to Roman who was glaring at me. You're not going to get me to eat this. Why do you look and sound so angry? I moved the tray. I'll go grab you something else to eat. I'm not even hungry. Something was wrong with him. You need to eat. I'm fine. Roman, what's the matter? His eyes got even narrower than they already were. You took that job with the creep. That's what's wrong with me. I was shocked. He told you that? He talked to Joe about it in front of me. His eyes suddenly softened. Tell me that he was lying to try and upset me. Tell me that you didn't take that job. Roman, I did take it. Why would you do something like that, he shouted at me. Please be quiet. Remember where you are. We can't be arguing like this. Not here. Well, I can't leave this place yet so here is where we're going to have to argue. Because I cannot keep my mouth shut about the enormous mistake you're making. He laid out in black and white what my job will entail, and I can work within those guidelines. There isn't anything for you to be so mad about. He was jealous for no reason at all. Roman, 
you don't need to be worried about me. I'm not going to be doing anything that would make you jealous. Just normal medical work and tests. Sure, the things I would do would deal with the male anatomy. But all the work I had to do at the hospital dealt with human anatomy anyway, so what was the big deal? If that's true, then why did he ask Joe about his sexual preference? He said that his answer might be important later. I wasn't sure what emotion I was experiencing at that moment. I couldn't believe Roman thought he could tell me what to do. Disgust showed on his face as he asked, Bryn? Washing something for someone who can't is one thing because it is your job. You don't seem to be looking at the big picture here. He wants to sleep with you, so he's laying out this trail of breadcrumbs that will lead you right to his bed. I wasn't sure what to say to that. I couldn't lie to Roman about that. I'm sorry that you see things in that light. That's not how I look at them. I look at them in a clinical manner. The way I've been trained to. Do you honestly think that this creep is on the up and up, Bryn? Because let me tell you that he is not. He purposely talked to Joe about it in front of me. He was baiting me. He's under the impression that you and I have something going on, and it's making him crazy. So crazy that he would dream up this insane idea about some project only to get you to do things you normally wouldn't. He doesn't want me, Roman. Last night, when I had to call him at midnight, he called me first. On a video call. And he was actually with another person in his bed. Weirdo, he shouted. Once again, I reminded him, you're in the hospital. Please stop shouting. I'm pissed off. I shout when I'm angry. If you listen to me, you will find that you have nothing to be angry about. You just told me that the man called you on a video call while there was someone in bed with him. Do you not get the motive behind that? I mean, what were he and this other person doing when you were on the call with him? I wasn't sure whether I should tell Roman the truth about that. I knew he wouldn't like it. But then, I said it anyway. There was movement under the sheet, which was covering him from the waist down. Movement? And was his chest bare? I nodded. Yes. And I am pretty sure there was someone under the sheet. While you and he were talking, there was someone with him? He closed his eyes as his face turned red. Please do not scream. His words came out in a low growl, that son of a gun. No, Roman. Can't you see that there's no reason for you to think whatever what you're thinking? He doesn't want anything like that. He's got someone to do that with already. Rolling his eyes, he looked at me like I was some kind of idiot. Bryn, don't be so naive. Some men. No, many men like to be with more than one person. And sometimes more than one person at the same time. Just because he had someone else giving him that, doesn't mean he doesn't want you to. And I can't stand the thought of that. I really can't. I could kill that man right now. I honestly could. Would you not talk like that? I had no idea his temper could be so bad. Roman, you don't know Raven. I know he puts off a strange vibe because others have told me that. But he's not a bad person. You are wrong. You don't know him the way I do. I told you that I stood up for myself the other night, and he and I are on more level footing now. He thinks of me as a great colleague who can help him with research. And he manages to get clients or patients who have tons of money. So, you're doing this for money? I haven't told you much about my personal life. So, how can I expect you to understand when you don't know about any of it? I sighed, knowing I'd need to tell him for him to understand. See, my mother died in a car accident when I was 18. I'd just begun my internship with Dr. Green's medical office. She was killed in the car we'd shared, so I no longer had a car. I walked to work. It was a mile or so from where I lived. I didn't make much money then, so I lost the apartment she and I had been living in soon after. I'm sorry about your mom. That must have been tough. It was tough. Not having her around is still tough. But I have managed. I had to move from the two-bedroom apartment and into an efficient apartment closer to work. 
Being closer meant that I had to find something in the not-so-great part of town though. Eventually, I found a car that I was able to buy for $500. It runs enough to get me to work and back and to the grocery store and back on Sundays. But the majority of my money goes to student loans. I'm barely making ends meet, even now that I make decent money. So, this is a chance for me to get out from under that mountain of debt. And by God, I'm going to do whatever I have to do to make that happen. Now I understand why he picked you to groom. You were an easy target. No family. Broke. A ton of debt. He's been building you into what he wants. He's feeding you a bunch of lies to get you into his disgusting bed, Bryn. The things he will do to you will be unimaginable. I can't let that happen to you. I won't let that happen to you. You really are an angel and he sees that too. But he wants nothing more than to corrupt you. He wants to bring you down to his level. And he will lie and manipulate you until he's gotten what he wants. But only if you let him. You have got to quit working with him. You have to get him out of your life. You are crazy. I had no idea anyone could get this insane in such a short amount of time. Roman, you've made all this up in your head. I see the man for who he is. And you don't. But now I know why that is. He took that innocent girl and molded her into what he wanted. When I came along and he witnessed our mutual attraction, he knew he had to speed things up with you or he might lose you to me. I stared at him, not believing a word he was saying. There was no way Dr. Green would do that to anyone. And Roman clearly didn't trust my word on that, and he wanted me to change my life around based on his wild accusations. My heart paused in my chest, the blood draining from my face when I realized what this meant. I'm not sure this is going to work, Roman. Your jealousy is one thing. But this anti-Raven campaign you're throwing is really over the top. I can't take all this conspiracy theory stuff right now. I was happy until I came to see you. If this is what comes along with you, I want none of it. Bryn wait. I'm not being crazy. You're just seeing the money and not the man behind it. If you have debt, let me take care of it. You need to get away from him. Let me take care of your bills until you find another job. However long that takes. I've got your back. Please, don't think that this is just me being jealous or trying to come up with conspiracies. That's not what this is. This is me, a man who actually cares about you, seeing through the thin veil that is covering the doctor's motives. Let me help you. Roman was a broke cowboy. His help would be so little that it would become a hindrance. I'm not quitting my job. I'm taking the project. And you, I'm no longer interested in you. I can help you. How can a broke cowboy help me with $80,000 of student debt? I didn't wait for his answer. Instead, I left the room, closing the door behind me. Roman I went about that completely wrong. Perhaps stewing in anger for hours on end had taken a toll on my temper. I really had never been madder in my entire life. For a man like Raven Green to take advantage of an angel like Bryn Davis, well, I saw it like it was, a travesty of justice. Finding out that she was all alone in the world, allowed me to get some insight into how the evil man had gotten to her in the first place. He'd been there when her mother died. He'd taken her under his proverbial wing, showing her how to be the best nurse she could be. At least in her eyes, that's what she saw. In his eyes, he saw a young girl who he could take advantage of, emotionally manipulate, and turn into anything he desired. With no family and friends to tell her that he was up to no good, he had no one in his way. Until I came along. The man's plans had been years in the making, and he'd sped them up because of what he saw happening between Bryn and I when we first met. Our relationship may have gotten in the way of his evil plans, but now that Bryn was mad at me, and had told me that she was no longer interested, I felt desperate. With me out of the picture, Raven Green could do whatever he wanted to my angel. And that was a thing I could not live with. I had to make things right. But how? 
Staring at the red lumps of crap I'd been served for dinner, I knew that not only had I lost Bryn, but I'd also lost the chance of her bringing me something good to eat. I wasn't going to eat the goop in front of me. And I wasn't going to let Bryn go either. Somehow, I had to backpedal. I had to explain to her that I'd gone overboard with the things I'd said. I had to make her understand that I simply cared about her and worried about the doctor's motives where she was concerned. Time was needed to let her temper chill though. How much time, I wasn't sure. Being that this was our first fight, I had no idea how long it usually took her to cool off. So, I waited an hour. I knew she had to help other patients take their baths. She usually left me for last so that she could spend more time with me than she did with any other patient. Another hour passed without her coming to see me. Since I now had crutches, she might not have been given orders to help me bathe. So she might not be coming to check up on me at all. Unless I hit the nurse's call button. Checking the time on my phone, I saw that it was a little after nine. Two hours had gone by since our argument, and I thought that should have been enough time for her to have calmed down. I had completely calmed down. So, I pressed the button and waited. A few minutes went by, and then my door opened. She only put her head in. Yes? Bryn, if you're not busy, I would like to apologize to you for the things I said. Her eyes stayed on mine for a moment. She eased into the room, closed the door, then leaned back on it. I'm listening. You were right. I was sort of acting crazy. I'm glad you can see that now. I had to fight myself not to say that everything I had told her was right. The man had groomed her for years and he was after more than she realized. I can admit when I'm wrong. I said too many things to you about the way I felt. And that wasn't the right way to handle things. I told you to do things instead of rationally talking to you about your options. Can I stop you there, Roman? Nodding I said, of course. I just don't think that this conversation topic is good for us. You and I see Raven very differently. That's okay. But it's not okay for him to be a point of contention between us. I don't want that, and I don't think you want that either. I don't want him to be a thing between us. I don't want anything to come between us, Bryn. Nothing at all. I heard the sound of the lock turning as she locked the door so that we wouldn't be disturbed. She came toward me. I'm sorry about what I said, too. So you don't want this to end between us? I had my fingers crossed under the blanket, praying that she wanted to keep moving forward with me. I do not want us to end. She sighed. After our argument, I went to the bathroom and cried. I didn't know what to do. I don't want to lose you. If we're going to last, you have to accept that my career is important to me. There are many things that I want to achieve in my career. And you will have to accept the fact that Dr. Raven Green is the best chance I have at getting to the places I want to get to in this career. I didn't like that one bit. But I kept that to myself. I am beginning to understand that. Do I like it? No. But I respect you. So I will accept it. Just know that you can come to me if he does anything that makes you feel uncomfortable. And I will always be here for you if you feel like you should change jobs. Nodding slowly, she moved toward me. It's been so long since I had anyone in my corner that I forget what it feels like. It's good to have you, Roman. It's good to have you too, Bryn. I mean that. I go to sleep thinking about you, and I wake up with you still on my mind. I like feeling this way. Me too. She looked at the crutches. Have you figured those out yet? Pretty much. There's not much to it. I ran my hand over my shoulder. Nurse Ratchet gave me a real workover. It hurt like hell, but I didn't take anything for the pain. I want to get out of here, and if I don't show the doctor that I'm dealing with the physical therapy well, he'll never set me free. Would you like one of my special massages? I sure could use one. Easing closer to me, I could see that her eyes were red-rimmed. She'd cried over breaking up with me. While it hurt to see that she'd been hurt, it also showed me that she genuinely cared for me. 
Now that I was free from the brace that had held up my leg, I moved to sit on the side of the bed. She stood between my legs. I could use a kiss. Me too. I pulled her to sit on my lap, then our lips met, and our kiss grew deeper and deeper. I had never seen anyone so beautiful in my life. I knew I had to learn how to deal with the things she loved, like her career. I wanted her in my life for a very long time, like forever. That would mean accepting the fact that this woman was going to make her own decisions, and that any time I would try to tell her what to do, it would end with a fight. I so did not want to fight with her at all. I didn't want to give her any reason to walk away from me again. So, I would curtail my jealousy and learn to give her the benefit of the doubt. She'd been able to take care of herself for this long, there was no reason she couldn't continue to do it. The macho side of me had to be tamped down a bit if I was going to make this thing last between us. And it had to last, or my life wouldn't be worth a thing. It was funny how I had thought that I was happy and complete until meeting her. Now I knew that she was what completed me and made me the happiest that I could be. I kissed her on the forehead. I can't believe that you can make me feel that way. It's not of this planet. Her hand moved over my cheek. And you're not even 100% yet. I can't wait for you to be all the way healed, so that I can find out what other magical tricks you have up your sleeve. I will show you the moon, the stars, and the entire universe if you let me. I took her sweet lips with a soft kiss, not able to get enough of her. It was obvious that we would have a hard time getting out of bed to deal with our real jobs. I had the idea that the headstrong young nurse would find a way to get back to work though. Later we lay in each other's arms when her cell phone went off. Oh no. It's midnight. You about to turn into a pumpkin? I asked with a chuckle. She hopped out of bed, pulling her clothes back on, then gathering her hair up and putting it into a ponytail. It's Raven. The midnight call. And I cannot answer it in your room. Even though I was jealous that he couldn't know about us yet, I didn't say a thing about that. Go answer his call. You know where I'll be. Thank you. She smiled sweetly at me. For everything. Thank you for everything too. And there's plenty more where that came from. Taking her still ringing phone with her, she ran out of the room, leaving me wearing nothing but a smile, and knowing that we did have a bright future ahead of us. Bryn. The next afternoon, I woke in my bed feeling stiff and sore and absolutely ecstatic about what I had done with Roman the night before. I can't believe I did that. And at the hospital too. With a patient. Roman's bad boy ways must have rubbed off on me somehow. Never in a million years had I even had an inkling of a thought that I would do something like that. But I had done it. Not only had I done it, but I had also instigated it, which wasn't a thing I had ever seen myself doing. None of it had been planned at all. I hadn't gone into Roman's room with the intention of even kissing him. I hadn't even been sure we were going to get along when I poked my head inside to see why he'd push the nurse's button. But one thing had led to another, and then another, and then I was stripping off my clothes and climbing onto that cowboy like he was my own little pony. Not that he was little, or even reminded me of a pony. But it was something like that. Blushing I felt my cheeks heating, as I couldn't believe the things I'd done. Who am I? Getting out of bed I got into the shower then put on a clean set of scrubs, slipped into my thick-soled, non-slip shoes and headed for the door. Today, I was going to splurge on myself and get some takeout before going to work. I was famished for some reason. Just as I got to the door, I heard a knock. I wasn't used to having visitors, so I looked through the peephole to find Raven standing at my door. Looking back at my tiny place, I clenched my jaw. I wasn't proud of the place I called home. Damn it. Opening the door, I stood in the doorway, stopping him from coming inside. Raven, I didn't know you knew where I lived. It's in your employee file. He pushed the door a bit. Can I come inside? I've got something for you. I stepped back, 
mostly because he was moving in on me so fast that there was nothing else I could do. I guess so. Bryn, this place isn't you at all. He took a seat on the sofa that had previously been the bed I'd slept on. I was glad I'd actually put it back in sofa mode before I had taken my shower. Once I have those student loans paid off, I plan to move. Good. I don't like this neighborhood. And I've seen bigger rat traps than this apartment. He tossed a large white envelope on the small coffee table in front of the sofa. I've brought some pictures for you to look at. Following along with the rest of your studies, I think that seeing pictures of what you will eventually see in person will help you to not react unfavorably to anything you witness. I picked up the envelope, standing in front of the coffee table. Is it going to be that bad? I would prefer that you wait until I'm gone before you look at the pictures. And it's not bad. Just a different. As a maiden, I know that everything is going to be a little shocking for you. Oh, I'm no longer a maiden. I froze. I couldn't believe I'd just told him that. What? He sounded shocked. When did this occur? I couldn't tell him the whole truth about that. Yesterday, before I went to work. So, are you in a relationship now? No. Did you know this man? Um, yeah. We went to school together. I couldn't tell him about Roman, so I had to lie. I thought you were super young when you went to school. I was. There was this other guy like me in high school. Everything I was saying was a lie, and I wasn't very good at lying. Anyway, we ran into each other yesterday. Then one thing led to another, and I'm no longer a maiden. I have to tell you that this is rather disappointing. I could see that disappointment on his face and had to wonder why he would care about me no longer being a maiden. What if Roman was right and Raven wanted to get me into bed? I didn't mean to disappoint you. I just wanted you to know that I'm no longer a maiden. You know, so you don't think that everything will shock me. Well, I suppose it doesn't matter. Joe told me that you told him some things about this secret project. I wanted to know why he'd done that. Any particular reason why you said something to him? His eyes narrowed. Who told you that I said anything to Joe about that? Joe, I said without missing a beat. But I could plainly see that he thought that Roman might be the culprit. Don't worry. Even though he asked me what the project was all about, I didn't tell him a thing. Good. He still hadn't answered my question. So, why did you tell Joe about it when you told me that it was top secret? I was asking him when he would be able to switch shifts with you. Our research will be performed at night. So, I wanted to get an idea of when we can start. I see. What I didn't see was why he decided to bring up all that while in Roman's room. But if I told him that I knew about that, he would get suspicious. I did tell Joe that he should ask you lots of questions before he commits himself to anything you know. And why is that? He eyed me warily. Because this is a delicate subject. It's just a clinical study, Bryn. Don't make more out of it than what it is. Many men have erectile dysfunction. I would like to see if there are natural ways to help them, is all. I can't see how doing techniques on a man who does not have ed will help those who do have it. I had been wondering how performing tests on him would help the men who actually had ed. For a moment, he looked like he'd been caught with his hand in the cookie jar. But that look quickly morphed into one of superiority. Perhaps you could do yourself a favor by researching men's sexuality. I need you to bring a certain amount of expertise to this study that we're going to do. I have no expertise on that subject. That's what I tried to tell you when you first asked me, remember? But you will gain it. And I need you to begin doing the research. The men I'm trying to help have exactly the same anatomy that I do. So if something works with me, it could work with them. Thinking about what he'd said, I asked, I've noticed that women can do something as simple as taking a bite out of a juicy strawberry to turn a man on. Is that true for men with Ed? You will have to ask them. 
so I will have access to these men. Well through me you will. Not with them personally. They have to maintain their anonymity. Of course. So will you ask them that question for me? You can make up a questionnaire that I will have them fill out. If that will help you to understand them and their situation better. From my understandings, it doesn't mean that the man doesn't find things attractive or even arousing. Then this sounds like a neurological problem and not one that sensory stimulation can correct. What if it can be corrected by certain types of sensory stimulation? Trying out different pressure points will be one of my tests. But that will be down the line. I want to test some taboo theories as well. I looked at the envelope that I'd laid back on the coffee table. Are those pictures about the taboo things? They are. He smiled. Unfortunately, society dictates what is okay and what is not. And I have a theory that some of these men simply aren't allowed to do what really arouses them. I want to test that one first. I see. I wasn't sure about his idea at all. Honestly, I don't think you should be the test subject. None of the men who have come to me want to be the test subject. Plus, why would you want to work with someone you don't even know on this type of thing? So, our familiarity with each other is why you chose me to work with you? Precisely. We have a great working relationship. You trust me. And I trust you. And I will only be taking measurements and preparing lab samples? Right? I wanted to be sure about what he wanted me to do. Sure. But if you ever want to do more, then you can. You might want to see what kinds of things your mind can bring to the table. You know, test some things yourself. I was very curious to know what he meant by that. Like what? Well, for instance, you might want to see what small, simple things you can do to arouse men. Like bending over in front of one. You mean you, right? I mean, you said that you will be the male participant of this study. Well, yes. Me. And how would that work? Would you simply tell me that what I'm doing is arousing you? I won't have any clothes on, so you'll see the arousal for yourself. I hadn't realized he would be walking around naked through the whole thing. So, are you going to be naked most of the time that we're doing this research? Yes. I knew Roman would hate that. And who else is going to be around? You said that we wouldn't be alone. I have a female subject who will do the physical touching. To be honest, she's not as attractive to the eye as you are. So there is the chance that I will be looking at you as she tries to arouse me. And that I did not like at all. I'm not an animal. I can control my impulses. Do you honestly think I've never had a thought about you, Bryn? You're a very beautiful woman. You have a bubbly personality that's not only likable but also sensual at times. I am merely a human man after all. Not some emotionless statue made of marble. I was going to want to kick myself if Roman was right. Had Raven really been grooming me to be his partner? Do you believe that you and I can do this research? without one of us developing feelings for the other? Yes. He sounded certain. And I think that you should know that I'm going to use a much older woman to handle me during our research. She's in her 60s. That way, I can create the right environment for a man with Ed. Since I won't be attracted to her. She is what now? I couldn't have heard that properly. In her 60s? Yes. Gray hair. Wrinkles. You know, she's someone's grandma. That should manage to create an ED-like functionality in my brain, right? My opinion is that you still aren't going to have the same type of problem those men do, because as you have just said, you will have an attractive subject around that you can look at to help you become stimulated. So you see what I'm getting at, right? No. I had no clue what he was getting at. Perhaps having someone who is attractive to look at while their older and homelier wives are trying to arouse them will help. And how will you furnish them with this attractive girl to look at? That's something you and I can work on figuring out. 
but there are quite a few ideas that I have. That's merely one of them. He got up. I left work early to come see you and chat about things. I've got to get going now, though. I've got some things to take care of. Okay. I went to open the door for him. He stopped just as he was outside the door. His eyes were on my lips as he asked, about being together. Did you enjoy it? His eyes traveled up to meet mine. That question makes me uncomfortable. Nodding he turned and left, which I was thankful for. I still wasn't sure whether he was after me or not. But I was going to stay alert to his actions. I was naive, I could at least accept that now. I had to change that about myself. After closing the door, I looked at the envelope on the table and went to pick it up. As soon as I opened it, I sucked in my breath, pulling the pictures out. The first one made my stomach sort of do a flop as I saw a woman on her hands and knees, wearing a skin-tight black one-piece bathing suit. Around her neck was a black collar, and a man wearing a business suit held the other end of the leash. Why would he give me pictures like these? I went to the next picture and saw a young man with an old woman, which was pretty gross to see. And what was worse was that these were pictures of real people, not just drawings. These acts had been done in real life. Is this something I really want to do? Shoving the pictures back into the envelope, I closed my eyes. I didn't want to see anything else. I already felt sick to my stomach. I needed the money so badly though. But if I had to look at thousands of pictures of that disgusting stuff to make myself not react to seeing it, then that's what I had to do. I'd never liked the sight of blood before I took all my medical classes. But seeing picture after picture of things like that had hardened me to them. For the money, I can do this for the money. Right? Roman Making the most out of the crutches, I moved about in my hospital room, waiting for breakfast to be served. A light knock at my door told me that my breakfast was here. Come in. Instead of going back to bed to eat, I went to sit in the chair. I'll take it over here today. The woman placed the tray on the small table beside me. Enjoy. Thank you. I looked at the fresh fruit mixture and actually thought it looked good. Have a great day. She smiled. You too. Not bothering with the fork that came along with the meal, I grabbed a strawberry and bit right into it. Yum juicy. It was sort of miraculous, but eating all that fresh fruit had turned me into a fan. Sure, the boys back on the ranch were probably going to make fun of me for eating healthy foods, but they could just get over themselves as far as I was concerned. Nurse Joe came in, smiling as usual. How is the handsome cowboy doing today? I am doing awesome. I feel great. I didn't need any pain medication after yesterday's torture session with Nurse Ratchet. I've gotten excellent with the crutches too. I don't see any reason in the world why I should stay in this hospital any longer. I am more than ready to go home today. Well, that's not going to happen. Not today, Joe informed me. Why the hell not? I saw no reason for me to stay. I am up. I am moving. I am not in any pain. So why do I have to stay? The doctor has ordered an MRI this morning. I'm supposed to get you ready to go do that now. An MRI? I didn't see the use in that. For what? Dr. Green doesn't like to release patients who have had any trauma without having a clean MRI. I know it sounds like overkill, but he was sued once for letting someone leave who seemed to be in good condition after spending a week here in the hospital after a car crash. Two days after being released, the person died of internal bleeding. It was a tiny tear in the lower part of the patient's spleen. It took over a week for the small injury to take the patient's life. This kind of internal bleeding happens more than one can imagine. So he has ordered the MRI and you will have to do one more physical therapy session too. I am moving just fine. I see no reason for that. I'll accept the MRI, but the physical therapy is a no-go. Are you afraid, he asked, taking a poke at my pride. No. 
I popped a blueberry into my mouth. Just don't need it. I'll see what I can do about that. I'm not making you any promises. But I will ask the doctor if it will be okay to remove that order. Thank you. After you eat your breakfast, I'll wheel you down to the imaging room, and they will take care of you there. I'll come back to get you once that's done. And after that? Can I go home then? Not right away. They have to produce the images, and a specialist has to check them out. Then the specialist will contact Dr. Green, who will then make the call if you are to be released or not. He grinned. I'm not supposed to tell you this, but you will be released in the morning. Hallelujah. If my leg wasn't broken, I would have danced a jig right then and there. I cannot wait to get back home. Getting the MRI took the better part of the day, as there was a stack of us that needed to get that done. I sat in a wheelchair for hours before it was my turn to be put into the tube that thoroughly checked my body out. When Joe came back to get me, he informed me that the doctor had left early that day, so I wouldn't have to see him. And he had approved the removal of the physical therapy order. So, I was in hog heaven. When I got back to the room, lunch had already been brought. I was thrilled to see a chicken fried steak and mashed potatoes covered in gravy on the tray. He lifted the special diet too. Joe nodded. Yes he did. I can sneak in some fresh fruit and veggies for you if you like. To be honest, they were growing on me. Except for those nasty looking roasted beets. I will never see the need to put those things into my mouth. Jerking my head to gesture at the table and chair, I asked, Do you think that you can move the tray over there, Joe? I don't want to get back into that bed, until I have to go to sleep. And when can I get dressed? Oh, you haven't realized, I guess. You've got nothing to change into. Your clothes had to be cut off when you came into the hospital. You should make a call and get someone to bring you something. My advice would be gym shorts, since you've got the cast on your leg. Excellent suggestion. I picked up my cell to call Tyrell. Thanks Joe. You've been so much help through all this. You're welcome. I'll be back in a couple of hours. K. Okay. Tyrell answered my call, there he is. How are you doing, Roman? I'm getting out of here in the morning, is how I'm doing. But I don't want to go home in my hospital gown. Do you think you can have someone go over to my place, pick out some shorts, a t-shirt, some underwear, and my flip-flops, and bring them up here to me today? Isn't today the day your maid goes in? Oh yeah. I'll have her gather the stuff. Can you get someone to go pick it up, and bring it to me? I'll do that for you, buddy. What about a ride home tomorrow? I'm going to ask a certain nurse to pick me up and take me home. I want to show her my place anyway. So, you managed to pin down that little nurse you were interested in, huh? Oh yeah. But that's a secret, I said, just recalling that I wasn't supposed to tell anyone about us yet. Until I'm set free tomorrow. After that, we're going to tell the world about us. You sound unusually chipper this afternoon. I am unusually chipper. I'm going to eat this chicken fried steak before it gets cold. I'll see you soon, Tyrell. And thanks for doing this for me. You're welcome. See you soon. The food tasted great, even though the steak wasn't a real steak, more soybean than beef. But the cream gravy was good, and that made it all work. They'd served me some sweet tea too, instead of apple juice. I drank that down and craved more. I called home to see if the maid would answer. On the third ring she did. This is the Etheridge household, and I am Susie. How can I help you? Susie, it's me, Roman. Mr. Roman. It's so good to hear from you. How are you doing? Much better now. I'm getting out of the hospital, in the morning. I need you to put a t-shirt, some shorts with an elastic waistband, a pair of underwear, and my tan flip-flops into a bag for me. Tyrell Gentry will come by to pick them up. He's going to bring them up here to me. I can do that for you, Mr. Roman. Is there anything else I can do for you? There is. Since I'm going to be somewhat limited in what I can do, 
Can you clean the house every other day until I can pick up after myself? Of course I can. She'd always been so helpful. And do you happen to know someone who can cook? I would like to hire someone until I can get around better. It's my right leg that's broken. It's just a hairline fracture, and I'm pretty sure the cast will come off in two or three weeks from now. Until then, I'm not going to be able to drive. So, I'll need a cook and someone to do the grocery shopping for me. My Aunt Jasmine is an excellent cook. I'm sure she could do the shopping for you too since she'll know exactly what she would need to make your meals. Will you be wanting all three meals each day? Yes. That would be great. I'll make a list of my favorite foods, so she'll have an idea of what I like. Ask her if she can come over tomorrow afternoon so I can show her around the kitchen and give her a credit card for the grocery shopping. And tell her I'll pay her a flat rate for each day. Do you think $200 a day is enough? More than enough. She would do it for a hundred a day. She needs money. Her son is in college and he's always needing something. I don't want to take advantage of her needing money. Tell her I'll pay her in cash, 200 each day, and that I need her to do the cooking and shopping for me. If I find it easier to have her cook, I might just keep her on too. If I do that, then I'll put her on the payroll and she'll be given full benefits, just like you. Paid vacation, holidays, you know, like you and the rest of the staff. She's the best cook I know. I've always told her that she should open a restaurant. I bet you will want to hire her full-time, Mr. Roman. I might. Especially if I have Bryn around to spend my time with. Not having to cook would give me more time for her. I'll see you tomorrow then, Susie. Thank you. You are very welcome. See you tomorrow. The day passed by slowly, as I was stuck in the room, watching television, waiting for Bryn to come on her shift. And then the door opened, and she finally walked in. You're back. I am back. She turned and locked the door behind her, before coming to where I sat on the chair. I missed you. She took a seat on my lap and kissed me softly. My heart sped up, and I sighed when our lips parted. I missed you like crazy. Did you hear the news? That you're getting out in the morning. I sure did. Are you happy about that? Why wouldn't I be happy about that? I don't know. I had something to ask her, but the words weren't coming. Bryn, I know it's a lot to ask, but do you think that you could give me a ride home tomorrow when they let me out? Her brows rose. Hum. Are you afraid someone will tell on you? I hadn't thought about it being a problem for her. But now I thought it might be. Once you are signed out, you will no longer be a patient. And Joe will be the one bringing you out to the car. So that's not really a problem. I don't think. But my little VW bug is a problem. I don't think you'll fit comfortably. Holding up my finger, I reached over to the table and picked up my phone. Tyrell hadn't brought my clothes over yet, so I called him to add on something to the favor he was doing for me. Let me make a phone call. Tyrell answered, I know I'm running late but I haven't forgotten you. It's not a problem. I actually need you to do a little more for me. Can you have someone ride with you so that you can bring my truck up here to the hospital? I'm going to need it so my nurse can drive me home. Her car is too small and she's afraid I'll be cramped. Which one do you want? You have more than one? Bryn asked. Nodding, I replied that I wanted the black one. The keys are on the pegboard in the garage with the rest of them. They all have little tags above them that say which go with which. I looked at Bryn. Where should he park it? Anywhere up front in the parking lot outside the hospital will be fine. I'm sure I can use the clicker to find which one it is. Did you hear that, Tyrell? I did. And I will do that. I'll be there in about an hour or so. See you then. Things were coming together nicely. After ending the call, I pulled up the website for the company I worked for. I want to show you where I work, Bryn. I handed the phone to her. It's called Whisper Ranch. The Gentry brothers own it. 
They hired me a few years back, and I became the bucking bull breeder. They are generous employers who give each person who works for them some shares of their stock. Thanks to them, I've made millions already. Millions, she asked with surprise. Like, you're a millionaire? I am. And I want to share everything I have with you, baby. After last night, I know that we are meant to be together. I don't want to see anyone else, and I would love it if you didn't either. I want us to be exclusive. And nothing would make me happier than if you move in with me as soon as you want. I took the phone from her hands and put it down on the table. She looked at me with shimmering eyes. Move in together? Please. I kissed her on the forehead. You will have access to all my cars. You can get rid of the little VW. All you will have to do is pack your clothes and the things you hold dear and bring them with you to make a home with me. You can even quit this job if you want. I'll pay off those loans you were telling me about. It won't be a problem at all. You would do all that for me? She seemed like she just couldn't believe me. If I could give you the moon and the stars, I would do that for you. I will do anything you ever need me to. I want you. I want you forever, baby. And what is mine, you can consider yours as well. She gulped. This is too good to be true. It's not. This is true. So, what do you say? Wanna be my girl? Roman, I'm not going to quit my job just because my boyfriend is rich and generous. My career is my passion. And I know you don't like Raven, but he's the key to my success. I wasn't super happy with her answer, but I had to let her be who she was. I can accept that. But you don't have to take this side job to pay off those student loans. Let me do that. But if you do decide that want you to take that side job, you can make your decision without the weight of that debt on your shoulders. She smiled and nodded. You know what? I will accept your offer to help me pay them off. You're right. Knowing that he was going to give me enough money to get rid of that debt was a major factor in why I agreed to do that anyway. I'm not saying that I'm backing out of the project. But at least I don't need the money now. And I'll take good care of you until you're back to your previous self before that mean old bull stomped all over you. Promise? I leaned my forehead against hers. I promise. Bryn. I hung around the next morning so that I could talk to Raven about the project. I hadn't liked the pictures he'd given to me. Now that money wasn't an issue, I wanted to negotiate my part in the project. I found him in his office, tapping away on his laptop at his desk. Knocking on the door frame as the door was open, I asked, Can I have a moment of your time? Sure. He closed his laptop and turned the chair around to face me. I closed the door behind me, not wanting anyone to overhear us. So the pictures you left me yesterday. You did look at them? I did. Chewing my lower lip, I wanted to choose the best words to describe how I felt about them without sounding like some prude. Raven, the pictures made me feel bad. In some of them, the women were demeaned, and in others, it was the men who were demeaned. I don't care for things like that. Maybe you only think that you don't care for things like that, because you've never experienced anything like it. Can you tell me which ones you felt were demeaning? He pointed at the empty chair. Please take a seat so that we can talk openly to each other. Sitting down, I wanted to be as open with him as I could be. Nodding he said, I can see how someone would take it as such. It is meant to be that way. The women who participate in that sort of thing usually have their reasons for wanting that. Well, I don't agree. I think they do it because of coercion. Regardless of why they really do it, it's not a thing I want to be a part of. So I'll have nothing to do with anything like that. I understand. So that will not be something I have to see or participate in with this study? I want it to be absolutely positive that he understood me. It will not be a thing you need to do or be concerned about. Good. Is there anything else that you would not like to be a part of, Bryn? 
He seemed genuinely concerned. Well, I did think that being with someone older is demeaning. So I would not want to have anything to do with something like that either. Okay then, you won't have to. Anything else? He asked with a smile. Gathering my courage, I wanted to say everything that I had a problem with. But I knew that at some point, it would be obvious that I wasn't going to be of much help with his research. I was on a roll and kept on going. I understand. His stoic expression made it hard for me to judge his thoughts. He might have been getting angry with me. He might have been getting his feelings hurt, that I didn't want any type of intimate connection to happen between us. I feel that you and I have too close of a working relationship for me to do that for you. It seems like you want little to nothing to do with anything that this project concerns, Bryn. May I ask you why you agreed to do it in the first place, if everything about this research doesn't agree with your personal moral code? The money. I wanted to be able to pay off my student loans so that I could have more of my paycheck to use on living a better lifestyle. But I can't let money make me do things that I don't care for or don't believe are the right things to do. Wow. He sat there twiddling his thumbs as his smile grew in size. I am impressed with you. You are? I thought he would be frustrated by me. Maybe even angry. But impressed wasn't a reaction I'd considered. Not at all. Do you mind telling me why? You spoke your mind. And in a good way, too. You didn't shout. You didn't get upset. You simply spoke your mind. And I have to say that I am glad that you did. It didn't take you long at all to come to the conclusion that you couldn't go along with the things I was asking of you. Things weren't exactly making sense to me now. I'm sorry. I can't understand why you seem so happy that I am stepping away from this project. Did you find someone more suitable for it? No. He just looked at me. There was no expression on his face as he went on, it was never true. Excuse me, I gasped. None of it was true. I was testing you. Testing me? I could not believe he would do such a thing to me. Why would you do something like that? Because I wanted to know if you had what it takes, and it seems that you do. Takes to do what? Anger began to bubble inside me. Knowing that he would lie to me about something like that hit me hard. Go with me to Africa. You want me to go to Africa with you? I wasn't going anywhere with him. He was out of his mind if he thought he could lie to me and test me in the most insane way anyone could test a person, and after that, I would still want to leave the country with him. Doctors Without Borders contacted me the day before I told you about the little secret project. You made up that disgusting project to test me. But why? I wanted to see what your moral integrity is, and now I know that it is above reproach. If you were into what I was telling you you'd have to do, then you wouldn't be the type of person I would want to bring with me to something like this. So you passed and can come with me to Africa. Are you being serious right now? I had to ask since he duped me before. I am being completely serious with you. So what do you say? Excitement took over, obliterating the anger that had come up. I say, when do we leave? I jumped up and clapped my hands. I can't believe I'm getting this opportunity. We leave at the end of next week. So soon? I had plans with Roman. Not that I could tell him anything about that. Yet. Is it too soon for you? He asked with a furrowed brow. Things like this don't often give much notice, so not a lot of time to make decisions. I'm afraid I will need your answer today. I've got to let them know if you will be accompanying me or not. It was something I'd always wanted to do. How long will we be gone? They said that it will be for a month. I would miss Roman. Could I be away for a whole month? Would that affect our budding relationship? But ultimately, I had to be true to myself. I'll go with you. Great. He picked up something off his desk. Can you do me a favor and take these to admissions? I'm releasing Roman Etheridge this morning, and they'll need this paper to get that done. 
of course. Thrilled about everything, I took the paper and left his office, skipping down the hallway. An hour later, Roman was free to go and I'd gone to get his truck. I waited in front, where patients were brought out once released. Joe had Roman in a wheelchair, per hospital protocol. Before they got all the way to the truck, Roman said something to Joe, then he got up and Joe handed him the crutches. Roman made it on his own the rest of the way, and then got in on the passenger side. You look good driving this truck, baby. Joe had already gone back into the hospital, so there was no one to tell on me. I leaned over and kissed him. It's good to see you with something besides a hospital gown on. Let's go home. He put on his seatbelt and I took off. I went to quit the research job with Raven this morning. You did? Yeah. And what's weird is that he said it was never true. It was all just a test so that he could see what my moral character was. Looking confused, he said, I don't understand. Yeah, I didn't either. Still don't. Not really. Anyway, he said his reason for doing that to me was that he'd been contacted by doctors without borders. We leave for Africa at the end of next week. His lips were pulled in one thin line as he asked, you're going with him? I knew he wouldn't be super happy about it. It's only for a month. And the experience is a dream come true for me. More like a nightmare if you ask me, he mumbled. Are you sure that you have to go? Can't he take someone else? Or just go by himself? Roman, I want to go. I had to let him know that if he wanted me, this came along with me. I have been very honest with you about my passion for medicine. And you knew that I wanted to go with him to do this kind of work. Yeah, I know. But I didn't think it would happen as soon as we were about to move in together. He reached over and took my hand. You still want to do that, right? If you want me to, I do. I had a little over a week before I had to leave. I can take vacation time, so that we can spend all the time I have left together. You can do that? I can do that. They're going to have to find a temp to work for me anyway. I've got to call Human Resources to let them know about that today. I'll just get them to do the vacation days too. It'll be fun. Just you and me. We can get all settled in before I have to leave. It's just a month. Thirty days. By that time, you'll be out of the cast too. Maybe you can take me dancing when I get back. I know this is what you want to do. But I'm going to miss you like crazy baby. And I'll miss you too. But I need to do this. If I end up hating it, I'll never sign up again. But I have to try. If you have to do it, then you have to do it. And I might as well get used to you loving your career right off the bat anyway. I am proud of you. And I think you're brave and smart too. And I think you are as well. I came to a four-way stop. Roman, I don't know where you live. Let me put the address into the GPS system. He used the screen to do that. I can't wait for you to see your new home. You are going to love it. Maybe you won't want to leave after you see it. You are so bad, Roman. But I loved that about him. I know. I can't help it. I want you to be around. But I get it. I really do. But me understanding why you want to go doesn't make it feel any better to me. If we are going to be together, we have to learn to accept certain things about each other. Do you think I like the idea of you riding bulls? I'm not going to be doing that anymore. So you say right now when you've got a broken leg. But once that cast comes off and you feel like your old self again, then who knows what you'll do. He nodded. You might not be wrong. I've ridden for years. I might not ride in any rodeos. But I'm still head of the bucking bull breeding program, so there might be a time when I try one out. Think you can handle that, baby? I think that if you can handle what comes with me, then I can handle what comes with you. I met a bull rider and fell head over heels for him, knowing he was into dangerous things. And I met a nurse who is so angelic that she wants to go all over the world to help people in need. 
I knew you were an angel. And more people than only me need an angel every now and then. I smiled, glad he still felt that way after our conversation. Roman I'd bought a property near Whisper Ranch a few years earlier. After clearing the brush, I'd had my dream home built. Part log cabin, part mansion, this would be my forever home. And now I had someone to share it all with. Here we are, I said as we came up to the gated entrance. Circle E. Bryn asked. E is the first letter of my last name, Etheridge. It's not quite the size of most ranches in Texas. Only a couple hundred acres. Only a couple hundred, huh? Her smile made my heart melt. Plenty big enough to be called a ranch in my book. The trees are huge out here. This was an undeveloped property when I bought it. Nothing but big trees with underbrush. I had the underbrush removed, but left every single big tree. There are several varieties of oak trees. But my favorite are the pine trees. Pointing at the row of buttons above the rearview mirror, I said, push that middle button to open the gates. This double-gated wrought iron entrance is gorgeous. She gazed around at the site. Wait until you see the house. I had a lot of pride in the home I'd had a heavy hand in creating. She drove through the open gates, marveling at the scenery. One of the many horses I had galloped up over a hill that had a creek running on the other side of it. And who is that beauty coming our way? That black stallion is Lucifer. He's gorgeous and as mean as the devil. She slowed to a stop as he came up to her side of the truck. Rolling the window down, she reached out to pet him. Hey there, Lucy. I clenched my jaw, praying that he wouldn't nip at her the way he did with everyone else. Be careful. When he leaned into the window, letting her pet him, I just about passed out. You are one gorgeous boy, aren't you? She asked with a soothing voice. I bet all the girl horses adore you. He whinnied, as if telling her that he was indeed sought after by many mares on the ranch. I can't believe this. The horse looked at me, narrowed his eyes, then turned and ran away. You scared him off, Bryn said with a frown. He ain't scared of nothing and nobody. He usually won't even come up to anyone. And I've never seen anyone pet him before. He's a biter, a kicker, and just an overall jerk. Um well, he wasn't that way to me. She began driving again. How far back is this house of yours? Around this corner. I watched her, wanting to see her reaction to my home. The home we would share, forever I hoped. Another set of gates, kept the animals away from the yard area. Is there a button for these gates too? Same button. She pushed it, opening them. Any reason why you need two gates? I've got quite a few animals, and I don't want any of them in the yard. Making her way around the corner, the home came into view, and she stopped the truck. Her jaw dropped and her eyes got huge. Shaking her head, she whispered, that's not a house. That's some kind of hotel. It's my home. Well, as soon as you bring your stuff over, then it'll be our home. She looked at me with wonder in her eyes. How many people live here? Only me. And when you come, it will be just the two of us. Roman, this place is gorgeous. It's like a giant Lincoln log house. I've never seen anything like it. Wait until you get inside. There's an enormous chandelier made from antler horns. And that's just in the foyer. I had so many things to show her. Her eyes scanned the whole of the home and yard area. Is that a pond in the back? I nodded. Stocked full with catfish and bass. Occasionally, I swim in there too. But the indoor pool is more to my liking most times. There's an indoor pool too. She drove slowly then asked, where do you want me to park? Pointing at the eight-car garage, I said, door number three from the right. That's where this one gets parked. Is there a car behind every garage door? Well, the last on the left is a motorcycle. I've got four trucks, three cars, and a motorcycle. Once this cast comes off, I'll take you on a ride through the countryside. Riding my bike in the fall and spring is one of my favorite things to do. Stopping in front of the garage door, she looked at me. 
How do I open it? The first button does that. I've rigged all the automobiles in the same way. Middle buttons open the gates, and first buttons open the garage door for that car only. It just makes things easier. On the other side of the house is the service entrance, where there's also a four-car garage for the staff. Staff, she asked. Do they live on the property? No. They all have families of their own, so I don't ask any of them to live here. But I do give them a place to park their cars when they're at work here on the ranch. I've got a ranch hand who takes care of feeding the animals and all the stuff that goes along with them, and the ranch itself. And then there is the gardener. She takes care of the yard and the greenhouse that's on the other side of the house. The maid was coming in once a week. But now that I'm not able to do much, I've asked her to come in every other day. And she is going to be bringing her aunt over today. If we like what she cooks, I'll hire her full time. Wow. She pulled into the garage, and the overhead lights came on as we entered. I feel like this can't be real. I know. It's a lot. If I hadn't been here throughout the entire process, I'm sure I would feel that way too. But I know how much hard work went into building this place. It's as real as it gets. And now that I have you to share it with, it seems like I've gotten everything I have ever dreamed of. Looking at me with shimmering eyes, she said, I'm almost afraid of going inside. She took my hand and put it against her heart. My heart is racing. I hope it's from excitement and nothing else. Excitement. I can't believe that this is going to be my life now. A handsome cowboy and a magnificent country mansion. She looked at the cars that filled the garage. All these gorgeous vehicles too. It's just so hard to believe. Well, let's get out and let me show you around your new home, my lady. I knew she would get used to everything, eventually. I just hated that we only had a little over a week to get her all settled in before she left for an entire month. But I kept that to myself. After showing her how to use the code to unlock the door, I let her go in before me. I followed behind, using the crutches to help me walk. She trailed her hand over the amethyst kitchen countertop. Is this the real thing, Roman? It is real amethyst. Purple is my favorite color. So I had the kitchen done in the same shade of purple as the countertop. And then I used that color to contrast the dark gray of the walls and cabinetry. You designed all this by yourself. Her eyes moved over every inch of the gourmet kitchen. I had a little help from an expert. But he let me have pretty much free reign since he said I had a good eye. That you do. I've never seen anything like this. She turned to look at me. I've never seen anything even close to this. You are a very amazing man, Roman Etheridge. Leaning back against the counter, I put the crutches to the side then pulled her into my arms. I am your man, Bryn Davis. Her cheeks flushed pink. My man, she whispered. I like the sound of that. Me too. Kissing her, the embers that had been glowing inside of me for her began to smoke and then lit up, creating an inferno inside of me. She handed me the crutches that had slipped onto the floor during our little morning love fest. Here you go. She ran her hands through my hair, fixing it up. There. Much better. And here is the kitchen Aunt Jasmine, I heard Susie say as she came our way. They turned the corner and came into the kitchen. She looked at me and then at Bryn with surprise. You're back, Mr. Roman. Yep, I'm home. I nodded at her aunt. And you must be Jasmine. Excuse me for not shaking your hand. I'm using mine to hold myself up at the moment. It's a pleasure to meet you, Mr. Roman, Jasmine said. Jerking my head toward Bryn, I introduced her. This is my girlfriend, Bryn Davis. She's a nurse. Oh, how nice that you found a girlfriend while you were in the hospital, Mr. Roman, Susie said with what sounded like concern. It wasn't like that, Bryn said quickly. It's nice to meet you both. I thought it best if they knew about my new living situation sooner rather than later. Bryn is moving in. I looked at Bryn as I asked, today. Right, baby? Yes. I'm moving in today. Susie's eyes got really big. Oh. 
Okay. Well that was fast. Bryn's cheeks went red as she dropped her head. It must seem that way. Anyway, I said, not wanting anyone to feel uncomfortable. I'm going to show Bryn to our bedroom. You can show Jasmine around the kitchen. I've written down a list of foods that I like. It's in the bag I brought home from the hospital, but it's still in the truck. Bryn turned around and headed for the door. I'll go grab it. Susie was quick to stop her. Let me get it. No, I've got it. Bryn dashed out of the door, leaving Susie looking at me with confusion. I know this must seem odd to you, Susie, I said. It is none of my business. She's going to be here for a little over a week, then she's going to be leaving for Africa, where she'll be spending a month working with Doctors Without Borders. Then she'll be back. Please try to make her feel at home here. I don't want her to feel out of place. She's going to Africa? Jasmine asked. Yes? How exciting for her. Susie agreed, yes that is exciting. She must be a very good nurse if they asked her to do that. She's the best. Bryn came back in with the bag in her hand. Here you go, Roman. Fish out that list. As I dug through the bag to find the piece of paper I'd written the list on, Susie asked Bryn, So, what sort of nurse are you, Miss Bryn? I am a nurse practitioner. I can do almost everything a doctor can do. Jasmine said, Mr. Roman told us that you are going to Africa soon. Are you excited about doing that? I know I would be excited to go to Africa. I am excited. This is my first time going there. And my first assignment for the Doctors Without Borders program. I hope to have many more of them in the future. Susie seemed to be enthralled by Bryn now that she knew she was something special. You must be very good at what you do for them, to ask you to go all the way to Africa. I have many certifications, and I know how to perform many procedures. I also know how to treat many diseases and injuries. So, I guess you could say that I am very good at what I do. I can see why Mr. Roman snapped you up so fast. Someone like you must have many suitors, Susie remarked. She probably had more than she even knew about. But thankfully, I got to her heart before any of the others did. And I won't be letting go of it, either. Bryn I'd been in Africa for 27 days, giving children and even some adults life-saving vaccines we'd brought with us from America. I'd learned so much and helped so many, I was glad that I had taken the assignment. It's time to call it a day, Dr. Green, I told him as I pulled the cord to let the flap down on the medical tent that we'd set up to give the immunizations. I heard the camp host is making boba tie for our supper tonight. He looked hungry as he went out the back of the tent. I followed behind. Um that is my favorite local dish. It's kind of like meatloaf, only way spicier and much tastier. I like it too. But I seem to like most things they've served us during our stay here. I'm going to miss this place and the people we've come to know. Raven hadn't been even the slightest bit creepy during our trip to Africa. I was thankful for that. Roman may have just been jealous of him and saw things about him that simply weren't true. I missed Roman so much. We'd had a wonderful week of getting to know each other in many ways before I'd had to leave. And we'd exchanged the L word the day I left. It had become official. We were a couple in love. I had never been happier. Life had become something out of a romance novel for me. I had the millionaire boyfriend. Lived in a mansion of Texas-sized proportions. And I was going places in my career, too. I had it all and then some. I'll be in my tent for a bit, I told Raven as we walked away from the medical tent. I've got to make a call before I eat. He rolled his eyes as he smiled. Are you missing your cowboy, Nurse Davis? Hey, when work is done I'm just Bryn and you're just Raven, remember? He'd made the rule, so I was surprised he wasn't following it. Bryn, are you missing that cowboy you pretended to have no interest in while he was our patient in the hospital? Who is to say that I didn't develop feelings for him after his release? I wasn't going to admit anything, 
other than falling in love with Roman once he was no longer a patient under my care. And yes, I miss my cowboy. I'm going to go call him, and then I'll go eat. Well, you might want to tell him the news, he said with a grin. What news? I hadn't heard any news. We've been asked to go to Indonesia. There was a storm of massive proportions last week, and with the standing water came a cholera outbreak. So they've asked for our help. How long will they want us there? I really missed Roman, and I was only a few days from going back home to him. I wasn't sure I could take much more time away from him. It was sort of killing us both. They didn't give a definite time frame. I suppose that once the epidemic is under control, they won't need us anymore and we can go home then. Cholera was a terrible disease that was extremely contagious and could cause death. But it was easily treatable with antibiotics and intravenous therapies. Do we have access to tetracycline and IV fluids? I contacted the hospital in Carthage. They can have some flown over. By the time we get there, the supplies should be there. We can take the tents and supplies that we have here and set them up in Indonesia. The people really need as much help as they can get. He'd pluck the right heartstrings by bringing up the sick. Count me in. Roman's going to be so mad at me for doing this. That's my girl. He went off toward his tent, smiling away. I, on the other hand, was about to deliver some news to my man that he was sure to hate. So, no smile curved my lips as I headed into my tent. Pulling out the satellite phone Roman had hooked me up with before leaving, I made the call that I was sure would disappoint the man I loved. Bryn, he answered the call with enthusiasm. Only three more days. Plus, the one day it will take you to get back. But you're almost in my arms. I cannot wait for you to get back home. And don't you even think about going to work at the hospital for at least a week. I've cleared my schedule and want to spend every single moment in bed with you. Or somewhere with you. All that matters is that I'll be with you. You have no idea how much I miss you. He's not making this easy. I miss you too, babe. I know you do. But soon you'll be home, and I'm sure you won't want to go off that far away again for a long, long time. Right? he asked somewhat warily. Once I get back, I swear to you that I won't sign up for anything for at least a couple of years. I could make that promise to him. I thought putting something like that promise out there, before I told him that I wouldn't be coming home as expected, would lessen the upcoming blow. A couple of years before you leave again sounds great. I can deal with that. You know, I've been thinking that we should start thinking about getting married. What do you think about that? Stunned, I wasn't sure what to say. Are you asking me to marry you? Not right now. But I want to put it out there for you to begin mulling over it. One day, not too far away, I think we should make this official and get married. I know you're the one for me. And when you know, you know. How about you? How about me what? I had lost track of what he was saying, as my head spun over what he wanted us to do. Get married. Wow. Do you know if I'm the one for you, Bryn? Oh, that. Yeah. Of course you are. What I feel for you is incredible. Not only can I not see myself loving anyone the way I love you, but I also don't even want to think about it. You're my sweet cowboy who holds my heart. Can't live without you. And you are my angelic nurse, who I also can't live without since you have my heart with you. And I want my baby home with me. I can't wait. Well, you're going to have to. Hey, did you hear about what's going on in Indonesia right now? I thought it best to bring up the tragic situation there, before I told him that I was going there to help. No. Why? I just thought it was like world news or something. They had some really bad storms. Like hurricane types of storms. They've done a ton of damage. And the water systems have been compromised. You know what happens when the water is standing, and the people can't get rid of it or get fresh water. Right? Why would I know anything about that? It's never happened here or to me. 
I feel something really bad is about to happen. Why do I feel that way, Bryn? He could really read me. I guess I should just tell you and get this part over with. No. He huffed. Don't say it. I don't want to hear anything other than that you're going to leave Africa in three days and be on your way home to me. So, you don't want to hear that I am leaving Africa in three days but I'm not heading home then? I knew he was disappointed. I was sort of feeling that way too. The people in Indonesia are suffering from cholera, Roman. That's when they have diarrhea and vomiting and can dehydrate rapidly. We are having the right kinds of medications flown over there, and they need someone to dispense them once we're there. They need our help, honey. Little kids are actually dying over there. I will be saving lives. Like the angel that you truly are. He sighed so loudly that I heard it over the phone. I fell in love with an angel, and this is what life with an angel is like. I suppose I will get used to this feeling. I made you a promise that once I get home, I won't leave for at least two years. I will keep that promise. And who knows, maybe someday, you will want to come with me. There are many ways regular people can help out. Or maybe you could be happy just taking care of the people in Carthage. We need you too, Bryn. The hospital is full of people who need you. He needed to get an idea of what kind of work I was doing. I gave vaccines to a whole class of 10-year-olds who had never had a shot in their lives. 30 children will never get measles, mumps, rubella, or chickenpox. On top of that, I gave some college-age kids the meningitis B vaccine so that they can go abroad to colleges without worrying that they will catch something that could kill them. Sounds amazing. It is amazing. I love helping my fellow Carthaginians. But they have access to all the things these people do not. Not everyone is willing to come to these places, live in tents with no electricity, no running water, sleep on a hard cot, and eat local food. I haven't had a proper bath since I got here. My hair is a real nightmare, and I have to keep it in a tight bun. Not only because it's filthy, but so that bugs won't take up residence in it. The bugs in this place are like something out of a movie. And there are so many of them, too. It boggles my mind at times. But still, I have a smile on my face because I may have saved people today. How long have you known that you were going to go straight to Indonesia? I just found out now. The doctor literally just told me. Raven signed you guys up for this, he sounded aggravated. He did. I wasn't going to lie. But I want to help. Treating cholera is a very simple thing. You give the patient the antibiotic. You set them up with an IV to build their fluids back up, and in no time at all, they're cured. We can handle 15 patients at a time in our medical tent. That's a pretty good amount of people that will be helped by us. I knew I was rambling, but I still felt bad. I thought if he didn't have the chance to dwell on the fact that I'd be gone longer, then he couldn't get angry. You can care for 15 patients at a time, he asked. Patients with vomiting and diarrhea? Between the two of us, we can. He helps you take care of patients? Yes. Of course he does. He and I do the same amount of work while we're out here. It's not like at the hospital where he gives orders and others do as he says. He's hands-on out here. You know, the way you talk about him makes it sound like you think a lot of him. And that is what worries me the most about you being alone with him. It's like you idolize him. Don't let jealousy cloud your judgment. I do not idolize him. He's brilliant at what he does. But you do know that I stand up for myself with him. He's merely a human being who knows a lot about medicine. I do think a lot of him as a doctor and a humanitarian. But I love you. With all my heart, I love you. And I want to marry you. I really do. I won't be away too much longer. I promise. And once I get back, we can begin planning our life together. I'll stick around for a good while. I promise. And he's still not being creepy, he asked. No creepiness at all. I know he's going to try something, Bryn. I just don't know when. 
and if he does, I can deal with that. You don't have to worry about me. I'm a lot tougher than you think I am. I know you're tough, Bryn. I don't know another girl, and not many men, who would go to Africa to live in a tent for a month, then pop on over to some storm-ravaged country to take care of people with life-threatening diseases. You are the toughest woman I have ever known. And I know women who ride bulls. You beat them all out with how tough you are, baby. And that is why I love you. Because you see me for who I really am. If you saw me now, you would probably not want to marry me. And if you smelled me now, I know you wouldn't want to marry me. I'll take you just the way you are. Even if you do stink. I had to laugh. They fed us beetle larvae this morning. They cooked them up, smashed them to make them look sort of like mashed potatoes, and seasoned them with a bunch of spices. I was halfway through the bowl when someone asked what we were eating, and the cook so graciously answered. I was done once I heard that. I bet. Gross baby. And I thought being serving roasted beets was bad. What kinds of foods do they eat in Indonesia? I have no clue. And with the spotty internet, I guess it will have to be a surprise. I could Google it for you. I thought he should think about doing a little more than that. You know, Roman, nothing can stop you from going to Indonesia. Think about what I said. You could make humanitarian efforts too. I would love to travel the world working with you. In case you didn't notice, I have set myself up a pretty sweet place right here in Carthage. Leaving the comforts of my home wasn't ever the plan. I get it. He let me do what I wanted, without griping too much. I had to let him do the same thing. I love you. I'm glad you've been thinking about us getting married. Have you been doing much thinking about us? All the time. I tell everyone who can understand me, that I can't wait to get back home to my handsome cowboy, who kept my heart with him when I left. He chuckled and it made my heart melt. Could I really stay away from him much longer? Roman For two weeks Bryn had been in Indonesia, caring for the people who'd come down with cholera. And still, she had no idea when she would get to come back home. I stood on my own two feet, no crutches anymore, as my leg was completely healed. I had to go to a ranch on the other side of Dallas to check out some bulls. My head wasn't in it though. Tyrell, do you think me and Bryn can really work if she's going to be going off like this all the time? You fell in love with a caregiver, Roman. What did you expect? Nodding, I knew he was right. She was honest with me from day one. I knew that she wasn't your typical nurse, satisfied with helping here at home. Her dream was to go out into the world and help as many people as she could. She's special, Roman. And special people are not meant to stay in one place. Do you love her? I must. I can't stop thinking about her. With her gone, it's like a piece of me is missing. That has to be love. Doesn't it? I wasn't sure anymore. I just wanted to be with her, physically with her. Nodding he agreed, that sounds like love to me. And if I know anything, it's that if you love someone, you don't hold them back. Even if that means you have to spend time apart. We talk every day. I gave her a satellite phone before she left to make sure she could get a hold of me. We've been talking about getting married for the last few weeks. If you've been talking about marriage, then why would you even ask me if I thought you two could work? It's obvious that you haven't given up on her. I don't think I can ever give up on her. She's the best person I've ever known. I'm lucky she feels anything for me. I'm nothing special, yet she still loves me. She did fall for you before she knew you had money. That says a lot about her character, and it tells me that the love she has for you is true and deep. I'm sure you two will figure out what's best for your relationship while adjusting your lives and work accordingly. It's been nearly two months since I've seen her. I suppose in the scheme of things, two months isn't much time. But it feels like it has been an eternity since I last saw her. Talking to her each day is good. But I want to touch her, hold her, kiss her. I sighed, feeling sad and lonely. I just want to be with her. 
One of the ranch hands let out a big gray Brahmin bull to walk around the pen. What do you think about this guy? Tyrell asked me. He looked fierce. He's got the right look. Out of the barn came a blue healer, barking away at the bull who stood there, staring at the dog. The dog isn't even phasing him, Tyrell remarked. The dog ran around the bull's legs, nipping at one of them. With one swift kick, the bull tried to get the annoying dog to leave him alone. The dog dodged the kick before the hoof made contact with him. Fast dog, I said. This bull seems a little too docile to sire anything that would buck. I saw the ranch hand coming toward us. Hey Pete, has anyone ridden this bull before? Yeah, I rode him last week. He's got some moves. Mind riding him for us right now? I had to see the thing in action if I was going to be able to make a decision about him. Sure, I can ride him right now. He jumped up on his horse and rode him out of the stall, then ran the bull back into the pens where he closed him in. A couple more cowboys came to help Pete out, and before I knew it, the gate was opened, and out jumped the lean young bull. Tyrell commented, he's got some pretty good air in his jumps. I thought he looked sort of stiff. I'm not impressed. Waving at Pete, I shouted, show me a different bull. He's not going to work for me. Hopping off the bull, Pete landed on his feet. The bull stopped bucking right away, and calmly walked toward the barn, as if it understood that I wasn't going to be purchasing him. Hey Tanner, get Big Leonard out, will ya? Sure boss. Pete walked over to us, leaning on the gate. I thought you said that you wanted something calm, Roman. Yeah, but not that calm. I need a little oomph, you know? So Big Leonard is a brindle bull with some Angus in him, which is a docile breed. Too docile, I pointed out. Yeah, but he's also got some Charles, and even a kicker of Texas Longhorn. So, he's got a nice set of horns without them being too long. His daddy is the offspring of one of the prize-winning bull, Panhandle Slim's, clones. So he's got the right stuff. Now I was eager to see this bull. Well, you should have led with him having some Panhandle Slim blood in his veins, Pete. Bring him out bucking for me, will ya? Sure thing. He walked away, to get the bull ready. Tyrell asked so who is Panhandle Slim? He was one hell of a bull, who began his career in the late 90s, and lasted until the early 2000s. Ty Murray, Jaron Nunmaker and J.W. Hart all made scores of 94 on him. Justin McBride and Cody Hart made low 90 scores on him. A few others scored on him, but like in the 80s and 70s. But most of the cowboys in the industry were bested by Panhandle Slim. He was cloned four times. And each bull moved just like him. Impressive, Tyrell said. And Pete said this bull's grandfather was one of those clones, which is very impressive, I would think. Me too. But the proof is in the pudding. So let's see how this one bucks. We watched as the cowboys moved the bull into the pen, and found that he was less than cooperative. His mass made it obvious that he weighed close to a ton. And a ton of bull was something to be dealt with cautiously. Pete climbed on top of the bull, securing his hand with the bull rope, then they let it free. It spun out of the pen with such speed, that it made it hard to see both the bull and the rider. Damn. Tyrell shouted. I know. It jumped straight up, and when it came down it was a good two feet over from where it had started. Damn. Tyrell yelled. Ride him cowboy. Yeehaw, I cheered Pete on. You got him Pete. Show that bull who's boss. The bull's horns were massive, and when he jerked his head around, they were nearly long enough to touch the rider. But not quite, which made him look a lot more dangerous than he actually was. And I liked that about him. The bull did a corkscrew turn, and Pete was sent flying off his back. I watched the bull carefully, to see what he would do as the cowboys ran into the corral, protecting Pete. Big Leonard pawed the ground with his front hoof, stirring up a cloud of dust that blanketed his back. And then he let out a loud snort, as if telling Pete that's what he got for thinking he could get on his back. Satisfied with how things had played out, Big Leonard casually walked right past the men and went back through the open gate to the pen, where he turned, as if waiting for someone to close the gate for him. I want him. I tossed my cowboy hat into the air. He's great. What a ride. 
With the bull loaded into the cattle trailer on the back of my truck, Tyrell and I headed for Carthage. Are you gonna use him in the rodeos, Roman? Yes, sir. He'll be a great addition to the club. I'm going to breed him to several different breeds of heifers. And I think I can make a pretty penny by selling his seed, too. He's gonna make Whisper Ranch plenty of money. He was well worth that six digit figure we paid for him. We'll easily make that money back in no time. This is a million dollar bull we've got here, if not more. Sure glad we have you running the breeding program, Roman. What an asset you are to our team. Thanks for letting me be me, Tyrell. If I didn't work for men like you and your brother, then I wouldn't have made it this far. You guys are the best. Following your example, by providing insurance and benefits to my household employees, has made me a great boss too. I can't thank you enough for giving this old cowboy a chance to prove himself. You have proven yourself. I will say that. And since you've done such a great job for Whisper Ranch, the board has decided to give you a bonus. A bonus? I couldn't imagine what more they could give me. They'd already given me so much. His smile told me he had been keeping a little secret from me. How about ten more shares of the conglomerate stock of Whisper Industries? Ten more? I felt like I might pass out, which was a bad thing because I was driving, hauling an expensive bull down the interstate. You know what that's going to do to my finances, Tyrell? It's going to put you into a higher tax bracket. So make sure your accountant gets you some more tax breaks, Roman Etheridge, billionaire. I cannot believe this. Believe it, because you have earned it, buddy. The generosity of the Gentry brothers and their family members, who they'd helped get started in various businesses, had no equal. They were the best people that I knew in the whole world. Man, you won't be sorry you did this, Tyrell. I'll keep on working hard for Whisper Ranch, even though it sounds like I'm already set for life. And then some, buddy. Your heirs for generations will benefit from what you've made of yourself. Heirs? I asked. I hadn't even thought about that. This money will keep on helping take care of my kids and grandkids. Great grandkids and on and on, he said. You've set up a genuine legacy for the people that you will bring into the world. Good job, cowboy. My heart swelled with so many emotions that it was hard to pin even one of them down as they swirled all together. Wow. I've really made it. That you have. Tyrell tapped his chin as he seemed to be thinking about something. You know what I think you ought to do. What? I think you ought to let that nurse know that you will walk through fire for her. That you'll go to the ends of the earth for her. Maybe she needs to know that about you. Maybe she could use some company over there in Indonesia. She has mentioned me joining her. But with her not knowing when she's going to get to come home, I haven't been able to come up with a time to go. Plus, I've got the breeding program to run, so I can't be gone for too long. I think that your staff has plenty to do with this new bull coming into the herd. You should have a week or two that you can take off. I'll have to talk to her first. Each day she keeps saying that it might be their last there. I don't want to book a flight and get there just as she's about to leave. Play it cool with her. Don't let on that you'll be going. Surprise her. You don't have to book a flight. You can take one of our private company planes. The wheels in my head began to spin. I could take a private plane, and I could take an engagement ring too. You know what, Tyrell? What? I think I'm going to do just that. What better time to propose than after showing up unexpectedly? I can sweep her off her feet, take her to a nice hotel where she can get cleaned up, and see if she'll let me whisk her away, at least for a little while. We can stop at this jeweler in Dallas that I've been using for years. He's got all sorts of unique rings to choose from. Your girl deserves something made just for her. Something that no one else will ever have. I am really going to do this. I gripped the steering wheel with both hands as excitement coursed through my veins. I am going to ask Bryn to marry me. When do you think you'll want to leave? Tomorrow. When she calls me tonight, I'll try to find out how many patients they saw today, 
and whether they have anyone staying in their little makeshift hospital. If they do, then I know she'll be staying for at least a few more days. I think she keeps saying that she could leave any day just to try and keep me patient. You're probably right. She's a nurse. Surely she's skilled at dealing with people who are running out of patience. I'll call the pilot and have him get the crew to stock the plane with the best foods and drinks so that you can treat her like your princess. Where is it that you'll need to go? She told me that she came into the Sokarno Hatta International Airport in Jakarta. Jakarta is the capital of Indonesia, and she's working on the outskirts of the city. The Doctors Without Borders group has a camp set up near the floodplains at the mouth of the Siliwang River. I think that hiring a guide to get me there would be the smartest thing to do. I'll let the pilot know that you'll need a guide to pick you up when you arrive and take you wherever you need to go. The crew will make all the necessary arrangements for you. You know, reserve a nice hotel room for you and Bryn and make any other reservations that they deem essential for your trip. Not long after that, I had a diamond ring in my pocket and was headed home to pack. Baby, here I come. Bryn. Drenched, I climbed out from under my tent. It had been blown down during the storm that had ravaged the area overnight. A light mist kept things wet but at least the winds had calmed down. Raven? I called out, as I saw the rest of the camp looking the same as my tent did, crumpled canvas lying in heaps on the muddy ground. Over here Bryn, he shouted as he stepped out of the hospital tent that somehow still stood. We've got three people in here. The rest unhooked themselves from the IVs after the storm started and ran off back to their homes. I guess they were more afraid of what the weather would do to them than what cholera would. Thankfully the light rain rinsed the mud off me as I walked toward him. Everything is in shambles. I didn't see how we could stay on and keep working. I watched a lot of the volunteers leave once my tent blew over, so I came in here. These people won't have anyone if we leave, Bryn. But how are we going to take care of them when we can't even take care of ourselves? It was too much to ask of anyone. I found my tent, and I think I can set it back up. He looked at the one I just left. Yours is full of holes so it's trash now. Looking at what I had crawled out of, I couldn't believe I had made it through the storm. That was the most afraid I've ever been. When the tent began tipping and coming down, I found this little space where I could stay. Water began coming in and mud with it. I wasn't sure I would make it until the storm subsided. Yeah, me too. He put his hand on my shoulder. But we made it. We didn't run like everyone else did either. Together, you and I can put enough together for us to be able to continue to help these poor people. He turned to look at the three patients who slept soundly on the cots. We can't send them away. They don't have the strength to walk. He was right. So I sucked it up and knew I'd do whatever I had to do. Okay. I'll go dig through my tent to see what's still viable. I know some things were washed away. But I'll get anything that will be useful. Since the patients are sleeping, I'll go see what I can do about my tent. We went our separate ways, and I felt like crying as I dug through the mud, finding that barely anything was left. Even the satellite phone was gone. Sitting in the mud, I tried my best to push away the urge to break down. Crying wasn't a useful act. It served absolutely no purpose. When my mother died, I had cried and cried begging God to let her come back. It didn't change a thing. My mother was still dead, and I'd had to move on with my life without her in it. Looking up at the gray sky that only promised more rain instead of sunshine, I knew I had to move on. Even though the others had left, we still had three people who needed us. I had to be strong. I had to stop being afraid. But losing the phone meant that I had no way to contact Roman. That killed me. I knew he would be worried. Especially when he would find out about the storms that had gone through the area that night. Getting up, I knew I had to get busy. I took the things I'd found to Raven's tent that he'd already gotten set back up. This is all I could find in my tent. Do you think I should dig through the other tents that are left? 
We have to gather some supplies, so yes, I think you should do that. I'm getting things cleaned up in here. He picked up the soaked blanket. I'll hang this up in the medical tent to dry. See if you can find one for you that's not too muddy, and then hang it up to dry too. I looked at the one cot then said, I'll try to find a cot that's intact too. Setting the things I'd brought on the floor, I turned to go and find more things. His hand on my shoulder stopped me as he said, Hey, can we talk? Turning to face him, I hoped he was going to say that this was too much for us to do on our own. Sure. His hand ran down my arm and he took my hand, leading me to sit with him on the cot. Bryn last night opened my eyes to some things I'd been blind to before. Like what? Like you. He looked into my eyes. You and I make a great team. I think so. I know so. We're great together. And last night when I thought that you or I or maybe both might die in the storm, something became crystal clear to me. My stomach tensed, as I didn't like the way he was looking at me. And I didn't like the way his hand trailed up my arm. Raven, you know that I am in love with Roman, right? He put his finger to my lips. Hush. Let me talk. I saw it clearly, Bryn. You and me, hand in hand, walking in the sunlight in a park with green trees and lush grass. Me and you, together. The way it was meant to be, for us. You didn't listen to me. I love Roman. You left him. No. I didn't leave him. I went to do a job. I didn't leave him. You left him and you came with me. You did that because somewhere inside of you, you know that you were meant to be with me, not him. He's just a handsome cowboy, Bryn. He can't come close to being what you need in a man. His intellect is nothing compared to yours. You need someone who will interest you and keep you on your toes. Raven, I really want to go back home. I don't like what you're saying. I don't want to be with you in any sort of romantic way. I'm sorry that I don't feel the same way you do, but I do not care for you like that. I think you're a magnificent and brilliant doctor. But I do not think of you in a romantic way. I never have, and I never will. My heart belongs to Roman. His shoulders sagged and he moved his hand off me. I'm sorry that you feel that way. I really am. You have no idea how much it hurts that you aren't reciprocating my feelings. It's been six long weeks, Bryn. Now I was done talking to him. I got up. I'm not going to talk to you about that. He grabbed my hand before I could walk out of the tent. Wait. I'm sorry. I'm frustrated. More frustrated than I've ever been. If you don't want to have a relationship with me, then do me one favor. I didn't even want to talk to him anymore. It made me so angry that Roman had been right about him all along. I don't owe you any favors. I know that you don't owe me any. But I need you to help me right now. I'm not going to help you. If you want to stay here, you'll be on your own. I'm going to walk until I find someone who will take me to the airport. I had found my backpack, which was waterproof. Everything I needed to be able to leave the country was inside of it. Don't leave me, Bryn. I'm sorry that you can't understand. I have to walk away from you. I can't work with you anymore. What makes me so mad is that Roman told me that you were after me. He told me that you wanted me in your bed. If he could see that then why couldn't you? You have manipulated me since I was 18. That's why I couldn't see it. I knew that you and I would be good together. That's why I took you under my wing. And we are good together. We could be amazing together. If you would give me a chance, you would see that as clearly as I do. I am in love with someone else. You're not even engaged to him. You two were together for what, a week before we left. No one would think anything bad about you for realizing that he's not the one for you, and that I am. You're not listening. He is the one for me. No, he's not. He's good looking, and probably good in bed too. But you haven't been with me. I am a doctor. I know things that will send you sky high. 
All you have to do is let me. I'm not about to let you touch me. Will you be mine, he asked. Just so that I can get some relief. I need you, like you don't even know. It's making me insane. You certainly are acting insane. I yearn for you, Bryn. If you won't give me anything else, please, just hold me. I'd had enough and turned my back to him, grabbing my backpack before I walked out of his tent. I'd never been so angry in my life. I now saw Raven for what he really was. He was a coward, for one. He wouldn't have pulled that, if anyone else had been around. As I walked, I thought about the years I'd spent being mentored by him. He'd done more things to manipulate me than I had let myself believe. He had groomed me to please him. And he thought he'd done such a good job of grooming me, that he could talk me into giving him some sort of physical pleasure. Which he had not, thankfully. The misty rain began to fall harder, and before I knew it, it was pouring again. Shivering as I kept walking, it began to rain so heavily that I couldn't see but an inch or two in front of myself. I had to stop. I had to wait for the rain to let up enough for me to see where I was going. I couldn't end up in the river or some flash flood zone. Emotions took over, as I had to wonder if I would ever see Roman again. I was in another country, in a downpour, and I didn't have any idea whether I would make it to the city. Bryn? I heard Raven shout from behind me. Then he had my hand in his, pulling me back with him. You can't be out here with the weather like this. He was right, so I didn't fight him, letting him lead me back to the camp. I thought he would take me into the medical tent, where the patients were. Instead, he took me into his tent. No, I said as I jerked my hand out of his. I'm going to the medical tent. I do not want to be alone with you. Bryn, stop it. He took me by the shoulders. We're both grown-ups here. What does that matter? Adults need things. As an adult, I know that you're aware of some of those needs. You need to stop, Raven. I am warning you. He laughed. Warning me? What are you going to do, Bryn? We're in another country, and there is no one to witness anything. So allow me to warn you. I will get what I want from you. The hell you will. I will get what I want. And if you ever say that I took you against your will, I will call you a liar. We're not in America. Those laws don't apply to us while we're here. If I wasn't so damn mad, I might have been afraid. But I was anything but afraid in that moment. If you touch me, you will be sorrier than you ever knew that you could be. He laughed. Bryn, have you never realized that everyone back at the hospital thinks you and I have been together for years? They do not. They do too. Why do you think that? Did you tell anyone anything like that? Have you been spreading lies to the people we work with? I had no need to do anything like that. It's the way we are together that got people talking. So you can now see that if you go back, screaming that I did something to you, no one will believe you. They will think that we were sleeping together while we were out here, but you didn't want your new boyfriend to think you had cheated on him. You are insane. I've said that to you. Lack of love has made me nearly insane. Only you can help me, Bryn. Be a good nurse and see to your patient. You. Are. Sick. I turned and ran out of the tent and into the pouring rain. I ran and ran. I didn't care if I did end up in the flooding river. Bryn, he shouted as he came after me. I will catch you. And when I do, I will make you beg me for mercy. Leave me alone. I slipped in the mud and fell to my knees. Moving my hands through the thick mud, I looked for something that I could use as a weapon. A rock, a stick, anything at all that I could use to keep him away from me. I heard the splashing of his feet behind me and got up, running until I slipped again, landing on my butt this time. Shimmying backward, I tried to keep moving, but when my hand found nothing but air, I knew I had to stop moving backward and move sideways. Otherwise, I would fall into something. What I did not know. Raven stop. This is crazy. His hand caught my ankle, 
and he yanked me back toward him, pulling me along behind him like some kind of caveman. You're really going to get it now, nurse. Your doctor is going to teach you that you will obey him, or the consequences will be dire. Stop. I shrieked as I tried to kick, but being dragged through the mud made my efforts useless. I won't stop. I'm going to teach you to do as I say. Even if I have to take your life. Roman Touching ground that morning my heart raced, knowing that I would see Bryn very soon. The weather had been against us for a bit, making me wonder if we were going to get to land in Jakarta at all. Thankfully the pilot was an expert, and weaved around to bypass the storms he saw on the weather radar. There was still a heavy mist going on, but that wasn't going to stop me from getting to my girl. Jason, the steward, handed me a large envelope. This has all the information you will need. Just give this packet to your guide, and he'll make sure to get you where you're going. Thanks, Jason. You guys have been extremely helpful. Without you all, I would have been lost. Not a problem at all. We'll also be staying at the same hotel you'll be staying in, so if you need anything at all, just ask the front desk to contact one of us. Great. Thanks. I walked out of the plane and found a small yellow car waiting for me right on the tarmac. A small man got out, waving his arms as if I might miss seeing him. Mr. Etheridge, I am here for you. Great. I handed him the packet the way Jason had said to. The crew is going to take my things to the hotel. I want to go straight to my girl. Yes, the camp where the doctors have been treating the cholera patients. I know right where it is. I just hope the roads leading to that area are passable. We had some terrible weather here last night. And more is coming. I got into the back seat as he took the driver's seat. You know, Jason told me everything but your name. I am Bimo. At your service, sir. Nice to meet you, Bimo. You can call me Roman instead of Mr. Etheridge. I'm not fancy like that. Roman, it is a pleasure to meet you. You are not to worry. If we cannot get to your woman by car, we will find a boat. I will get you to her and take you both to the hotel in Jakarta. It is a lovely hotel, too. You will love it. And not to worry. Most people from your country love the foods we have here. That is a relief. I have been a little worried about that. I have an uncle who owns many Indonesian restaurants all over the United States. If you grow to love our food, you will be sure to find some real Indonesian cuisine somewhere near your home. I am sure of that. That's good to know. I noticed the rain had grown so heavy that he had to turn his windshield wipers on high speed. Do you know how much longer these storms are supposed to last? They should clear out of here by the end of the day. While I was waiting for you at the airport, I was talking to others who said that most of the people at the medical camp left during the night. Some went to hotels while others got on planes and left the country altogether. Have you been able to contact your woman lately to find out if she is still here or not? No, I haven't been able to contact her. I've called her phone, but it doesn't seem to be working. That did worry me a bit. I was worried about coming here in the first place, because she said she had no idea when she would be coming home. If we've crossed paths in the sky, I'll be pretty mad at myself for coming all this way. But it's been six weeks since we've seen each other, so I thought I would risk it. If she has left, then I'll just get back on the plane and head home. The gambles we are willing to take for our women, he said. It is crazy what love can make people do. It sure is. He stopped just before we got to the next intersection. This street is flooded. My heart sank. So, we can't go any further. Not this way. But I know a way around it. He turned to the left, and we were on our way again. I'm glad I hired you to guide me, Bimo. Having a local to get you where you need to go is the key here, it seems. I tell tourists all the time that it pays to hire a good guide. Some people are just cheap. You know what I mean. Yeah, I know what you mean. The rain seemed to be getting even heavier. I'm beginning to hope she's not out there in some tent in this rain. I know, right? 
It's bad outside. It was even worse last night. The winds were crazy. To be honest, I can't imagine that there are any tents left standing out there. It was that bad. Now I was really worried. I hope she went to a hotel at least. I can have my wife start calling the hotels if you'd like to see if she's in one of them. That would be awesome if you could. Not a problem at all. He pulled up to the side of the street, texted his wife, then asked, What name would she be under? Bryn Davis. I thought about it a bit and added, Also, check Dr. Raven Green. He may have used his name to get them rooms. Okay, I'll let my wife know to ask for both names. Great. I still was uneasy, but at least everything that could be done to find Bryn was being done. You didn't hear of people going missing during the storms last night, did you? Their camp was near the river from what she'd told me, and that was worrisome. Not that I have heard of. But their camp is at the mouth of the river, and the river is flooding right now. I think that authorities would have been alerted if any of the medical people had gone missing. You're probably right. I tried not to think about things too much. Anxiety was already getting to me as it was. I just have to find her. We're getting closer to the camp. The rain is making it hard to see, it's so heavy. But I know it's here. He kept driving, and I looked out of the window. The street looked more like a little river than anything else. And then I saw nothing but mud. The street has been washed out, I'm afraid. He pointed straight ahead. The camp is up there, only a little further. I'll get out and walk up there to see if anyone is there. No. I wasn't going to make the man do that. I'll go look for her. If anyone is up there, then they should know if she left or not. Are you sure? he asked. I can go. You'll get soaked. You will too. Yeah, but I'll be okay. She's my girl so it should be me who has to slip and slide through the mud to find her. Plus, I knew I wouldn't be patient enough to wait in the car for him to come back. Pulling my jacket up to cover my head, I got out of the car and readied myself to begin my journey forward to what I hoped would lead me to the camp. It was impossible to see through the heavy downpour. Keep going straight, he shouted at me just before I closed the car door. Nodding, I took one step in front of the other to make sure I was walking in a straight line. It felt like I had walked forever with the rain pelting my back. Then I saw a shadow, and the closer I got, the more I could see what it was. A tent. Picking up the pace as excitement filled me, I got to the tent. Once I found the flap to the opening, I moved it then walked inside. Three people lay sleeping on cots with IVs hooked up to them. But no one else was there. I could see every corner of the large tent. Empty cots were everywhere, but no one other than the patients was in there. I had the idea that Bryn would never leave anyone behind. So I thought that she might be around somewhere. I went back out into the rain and walked around finding piles of what looked like tents that had been torn apart. My heart began thumping hard inside my chest as I had to think of the absolute worst. Who could have survived all this? To make matters worse, I had to take it slow because there was mud everywhere, and I didn't want to slip and fall. Bryn? I shouted. All I could hear was the sound of the heavy rain falling and splashing on the ground. I kept moving until I found a tent that was still standing up, and went inside. One cot was in the tent and some things were lying on the floor. Something shiny caught my eye, and I went to pick it up. It was Dr. Green's name tag. I was in Raven's tent. I had no idea if it meant that they were still there or not. But I knew one thing for sure, they weren't in that tent. So back out I went into the rain, where I kept calling out her name over and over again. Movement caught the corner of my eye, and I turned my head, finding two black masses moving on top of the muddy ground. They were covered in black mud, so it made it hard as hell to determine whether they were humans or animals. The closer I got, the more it looked like they were wrestling. The larger figure had pinned the smaller one to the ground, and seemed to be lying on it. Hey. I called out. Hey, I'm looking for someone. I had no idea what was going on. But it looked like they were people, 
so I kept moving toward them, even though they didn't seem to be able to hear me, over the sound of the rain. All of a sudden the figure on top had its back exposed, as the muddy shirt was ripped off him by the person underneath him. Hey! I shouted, as it now looked to me like they were a couple about to do things that I did not want to walk up on. Who the hell goes out in a storm to have intimacy? Freaks! I saw the back turn bloody as two hands raked across it, and then I heard a screaming sound. Damn skank. The voice sounded like it belonged to a man. I'll take your life. Get off me. Bryn? Everything suddenly became clear to me, and I charged at the man like a bull. You son of a gun. All I saw was red as I ran toward them and grabbed the man on top by the hair, yanking him backward. Wild eyes looked back at me, Raven Green's eyes. What the hell, he yelled. Roman. I heard Bryn scream. Roman. You came for me. The doctor's eyes turned from wild to pleading. Hey man, it's not what it looks like. It looks like you were on top of my girl. I didn't need to hear anything else. Balling my fist, I punched him in the face with a force so great that it knocked him out of my grasp. He moved like lightning to get away from me. But I didn't care what he did or where he went. I had to get to my girl. Scooping her up out of the mud, I held her close. She hung onto me, sobbing, he was trying to. I know, baby. I know. You're okay. I've got you. I held her tight in my arms and carried her back toward the car. Suddenly, out of nowhere, I felt something smack me in the back of the head, knocking me forward, and I nearly dropped Bryn. What the heck? I turned just in time to see Raven pulling the piece of lumber back to strike me again. You're not taking her away from me, he screamed at me. She's mine. Bryn pulled her face away from my chest and screamed, Leave him alone, Raven. I had no idea what had happened over the last day, but it seemed like all hell had broken loose. And Raven had gone insane. He laughed like a maniac as I kept backing away while he kept moving forward with the weapon in his hands. You won't be leaving here alive, cowboy. The hell he won't, I heard a man say from behind me. And then Bimo moved around in front of us with a tire tool that he must have gotten out of his car and hit Raven in the forehead with it, knocking him out. His body fell in a heap on the muddy ground. He looked back at me. That your woman, Roman? This is my woman. Get her to the car. He pulled some black zip ties from his pocket. I'm going to restrain this man so that he can't get away until the authorities come to pick him up. I've already called them and they're on the way. I witnessed assault. Is there anything else you want to add to his charges, miss? He tried to hurt me physically, she said, then broke into a sob before burying her face in my chest again. Roman take me home please. I'm so tired. I'll get you home baby. Carrying her back to the car, I put her inside, then noticed that she had something in her hand. What's that? I was covered in mud now, just like she was. My backpack. All my important stuff is in it. It's all I need from this place. She shivered, then added, someone needs to help the patients in the big tent. I'm sure the authorities will handle them. You don't worry about anything or anyone. Just rest. Cradling her on my lap in the little back seat. I didn't want to let her go at all. Still an angel. With all you've been through, you still find time to care for others. I'm never going to work with that man again. You were right about him. You won't have to worry about ever seeing that man again. I'm going to hire a team of lawyers to deal with him. Thank you. I should have listened to you. How I wish you had. Epilogue Bryn. We'd been back home for a week when I went to see my doctor to get a clean bill of health before I went back to work at the hospital. Physically, I felt fine. But the head nurse, who would now be my boss since Raven had been dishonorably discharged from his position at the hospital, wanted a doctor's note stating that I was cleared to come back to work. I walked into the house, coming straight home after my appointment, to find Roman sitting in the kitchen as if he'd been waiting there for my return. How did the examination go, baby? 
it wasn't too bad. They drew blood to make sure I didn't contract some rare disease while I was in Africa and Indonesia. And she said my mental facilities were good. She did say that I should see a therapist about everything that's happened to me. I think that's a good idea too. You may not remember your dreams when you wake up, but the way you move and shout while you're sleeping makes me think you're having flashbacks of that morning. I knew I needed help to get over what Raven had done to me and what he'd tried to do. I told her to set me up with someone she trusts. Good. He got up with his hands in the back pockets of his tight blue jeans. I went to Indonesia to ask you something. But I didn't think it was the right time with what happened. I laid my purse on the counter and went to get a bottle of water from the fridge. What did you go there to ask me? I pulled out a bottle of water. Want one too, honey? No, thank you. Opening the bottle, I closed the fridge then went to take a seat on one of the bar stools. I can't imagine why you would think you had to go all that way just to ask me something. I wanted to do it in person. He came around and stood in front of me. Some things have to be done face to face. The first thing I thought about having to be done face to face was breaking up with someone. But surely he didn't want to break up. You're kind of freaking me out, Roman. Don't freak out. It's a good thing. At least I hope you think so. I know that I think it's a good thing. Okay. So ask me. I put the bottle of water on the counter and gave him all my attention. I am all ears. His fingers moved across my cheek lightly, leaving a trail of sparks from his touch. I've never known anyone like you, Bryn Davis. You're sweet. But there's a whole hospital in town that's full of people who are just like me. That's just not true. You are one of a kind. Nah. I didn't like to think of myself as being any better than anyone else. Yes. His lips pressed against my forehead. I knew that you were the one for me from the moment I first saw you. I had to smile as I remembered seeing him for the first time. My broken cowboy. Moving my arms around his neck, I looked into his eyes. And now you aren't broken at all anymore. I like it when you carry me. I love it when you take me to our bed. You have healed remarkably well for what you have gone through. That's only because I had the best nurse in the world taking good care of me. Those massages were the bomb. I gave you some extra attention that no one else got. I recalled how his muscles had rippled under my hands when I'd given him those massages. It was sort of captivating, feeling all your muscles. It was sort of captivating having your hands run all over my body. I bet it was. I had to smile. I'm glad I went rogue with you. Me too. He kissed my lips softly. I want you to do more with me though. Like what? I was up to doing anything with him. I'd never been that way in my life. But the trust I had in Roman was beyond anything I'd ever felt with anyone. His hands moved to his back pockets again, and he pulled something out of one of them, then brought it around to show me what he'd gotten. This is what I wanted to give you when I came to Indonesia. My heart jumped the moment I saw what he held. But I didn't want to jump too far ahead. I didn't actually know what was inside the tiny box. A little black box. He chuckled. It's more about what's inside the little back box, baby. But there's something I have to ask you before I show it to you. I watched him take a step back, and then he got down on one knee. Roman? I covered my mouth with both hands as tears welled up in my eyes, blurring my vision. Bryn. He reached up, taking my left hand in his. A love like ours doesn't come around often. When we're together, I have no idea where I end and you begin. I feel like we are part of each other. I felt the same way and nodded, because I couldn't speak with the lump that had formed in my throat. Glad you feel the same way, baby, he said. When you know that you are only one part of a whole being, the idea of making a pact with that person comes to mind. Like a pact to spend the rest of our lives together. A pact that says that we will be there together in sickness and in health. I was about to lose it completely, so I nodded again. 
So, you do agree that we need to make a pact with each other? Nodding I managed to croak out, I do. Yeah me too. So, I got you this to show you that I am ready to make a pact with you. And this is just a little token to prove that one day, very soon, we will put this pact down on paper and we'll both sign it. It will bond us together, like gorilla glue. Like nothing can unglue us. No other man. No other woman. Nothing. You don't mean that literally, right? I had to ask. He threw back his head and laughed. I mean it figuratively. I want our pact to be unbreakable, because I never want to even think that I might lose you someday. I want to know that you're going to be there each morning when I wake up. I want to know without a doubt that you're going to be there with me each night I go to sleep. He was asking me not to go on any more trips out of the country, to work with the Doctors Without Borders program or anything like that. And I could not promise him that I wouldn't do that. My lips parted to let him know. But he put his finger to them. Hang on. Let me clarify something, because I saw a look in your eyes that said I hadn't said enough to you about all that. See, I want to wake up with you and go to sleep with you. But that can be anywhere in this whole world. When you go to help people, I will go with you. Because that's what two parts of one whole do for each other. They're there for one another, no matter what. While you're healing the sick or giving out life-saving vaccines, I'll be feeding the hungry, clothing the needy, doing whatever needs to be done. You will? I had never felt so happy in my entire life. You will go with me? Anywhere in this whole world. I had a real partner in life with this man. Someone who understood my passion and didn't want to stomp it out. Someone who didn't want to stop me from doing what I felt was my purpose on earth. Instead, he wanted to join me and help people too. I will. Then I will do the same thing for you. Anything you want to do, I will be there with you, helping in any way that I can. I know you will. He flipped the box open, and I saw a sparkle that nearly blinded me. This pact I would like to make with you is that of a marriage. I want to be married to the woman I was meant to spend my life with. Would you like to be married to me? You know what? I need to be married to you, Roman, my life partner, my soulmate. I would love to be married to you. Cool. He took the ring out of the box and slipped it onto my finger. Soulmates forever. I watched a tear slip down his cheek. He was trying to play it off with his joking words, but his heart was all in on this. Caressing his cheek, I echoed his last words, soulmates forever. Roman Holding her in my arms, I kissed her. As happy as I was at that moment, I knew there was even more happiness in store. When she walked down the aisle to me, I would be even happier than I was at this moment. And if God blessed us with children, I would be even happier than that. With Bryn there was no limit on how happy I could be. Everything with us seemed limitless. And I loved it that way. Scooping her up, I carried her, never letting our mouths part, to the living room. Hoping she would accept my lengthy proposal, I had set the living room up for the romance that would follow. A fire roared in the fireplace. The lights had been dimmed. The curtains were closed to shut out any outside light. And sensual music wafted through the air from the speaker system. On the floor in front of the fireplace lay a cowskin rug. Beside that, a bottle of champagne chilled in a crystal champagne chiller. Two champagne flutes waited beside the unopened bottle, ready to be filled so that we could make a toast to our upcoming marriage. But first, there was something I just had to do. Peeling her clothes away, I found her removing mine too. We laid on the rug. Her body glowed amber in the fire's light. She had never looked as beautiful as she did lying there, looking up at me as I gazed at the woman who would soon be my wife. Tracing her plump lips I said, You are the most remarkable creature I have ever known. And I am lucky to have you. I'm lucky to have you too. You are the one who is remarkable. Somehow, your instincts told you to get on a plane and come to find me. You saved me, Roman. You honestly saved me. 
because I would have fought that man to the death before he got a piece of my body. I know you would have. I hated to even think about that. You are as tough as they come, baby. And that man will never see the outside of prison for many, many years. She ran her arms around my neck, pulling me to her. Thanks to you, he won't. Our lips met, and I began the descent into the place we went every time we were together. A place where only she and I existed. We left the world behind us as our bodies connected. Nothing had ever felt so right. Moving in slow waves, there was no rush to get to the finish line. We both knew where it was, and we both knew that we would get there, eventually. Would you like to drink some champagne so that we can make a toast to this engagement, baby? Nodding, she reluctantly let me go. Fill the glasses. I'll be right back. She got up, walking naked out of the room. Popping the top off the bubbly, I filled the glasses then lay on my side, waiting for her to come back to join me. When she came back she held her cell phone in her hand. A blank expression told me that something was wrong. Did you miss a call? Nodding she came and sat down beside me. I handed her a glass and she shook her head. Listen to the voicemail my doctor just left for us. For us? I thought that was an odd thing to say. She was the one who had gone to the doctor, not me. I didn't see how she could think that whatever was on that voicemail would have anything to do with me. But I kept my mouth shut, not truly understanding the way women thought at times. She played it and I listened as the lady said, Hi, this is Dr. O'Bannon. Your blood work came back already. The lab at the hospital wasn't busy today, so it went fast. I could have just sent you the results in the mail, but I wanted to deliver this news immediately. I looked at Bryn with worry. Are you okay? Did she say that you caught something when you were out of the country? Listen, she whispered. I didn't want to listen. I just wanted to know if Bryn was going to be okay. But I had to listen anyway as the doctor's message went on. Bryn, I would like to be the first person to congratulate you and your cowboy. You two are going to be parents. You're having a baby. My guess is in about seven and a half months. My jaw dropped and I wrapped her in my arms again. We're having a baby. I asked, incredulous. She nodded her head, a tear slipping down her cheek. We are. Looks like we've found our happily ever after. The End Sneak peek for Fake It For Real, a friends to love her second chance romance, Accidental Love 3. Chapter 1 Finn Through the haze of a fading hangover, I felt the presence of someone else in my bed. I knew I was in my bed because the smell of freshly cleaned linens filled my nostrils as I inhaled deeply. It was one of the things I always did upon waking. Smell the sheets, and then try to piece together the events of the night, once I had deciphered if I was home or in someone else's bed. Around three nights each week, I would find myself with the same predicament, wondering who slept soundly beside me and where I had ended up after a night of drinking way too much, losing all my inhibitions. The person beside me stirred then draped one long arm over my side. I always went to sleep, facing away from the person I had gone to bed with. It made slipping off the bed, and getting the hell out of a stranger's bedroom much easier. And many times I'd had to do just that. Of course, when I woke up in my own home, slipping away was not an option. But I always had my driver waiting for the woman to walk out the front door, so that he could drive her home or to wherever she wanted to go. Moving slowly out from under the slender arm that laid across my side, I got out of bed without making a sound and headed to the bathroom to clean myself up. The mirror was never my friend on mornings like these, so I avoided my reflection at all costs until I had showered, shaved, and done the rest of my business. An hour later, I emerged from the bathroom, looking like myself again, ready to face the world and the young lady who was now sitting up in my bed. I looked at her face and could not recall a thing about her, other than fleeting scenes of a night with her that didn't seem that memorable. Morning. Did you sleep well? She ran a hand through her messy dark locks. I think so. I drank a little too much last night. I don't normally do things like this. Do you? 
all the time. I threw her my signature charming smile to ease my words. So, let me walk you through the process of one night stand etiquette. We wake up. We get dressed. We exchange pleasant goodbyes, and we don't expect a thing from the other party. She looked a little taken aback. Finn, are you sure you want me to just walk away from you after how much we connected last night? Rats, she remembers my name, and I've got no clue what hers is. Oh well. That man you met last night is not the real me. That guy only comes out at night and after a few drinks. I'm actually a total bore most of the time. Do yourself a favor and don't think too hard about what happened. We had a good time, but now it's over and might not ever happen again. Or it might happen again if we end up at the same place and we both want the same thing. But that's highly unlikely, at least in my case it is. Okay then. She pulled the sheet around her and got up, moving about the room, retrieving her clothes that were scattered about, and then going to the bathroom to put them on. I was glad she wasn't the kind to try to argue that what we had was special. Mostly because it never was. Not to me, at least. Waiting patiently, as I had nothing else to get to anyway, I sat down on the settee at the end of the bed and checked out my cell phone. There were some random pictures of us dancing and laughing and then there were some more decadent pictures of our night in bed. Holy crap, did I really let her do that to me. Alcohol makes me do things I wouldn't normally do if I were sober. But boredom leads me to the stuff more often than I should. I let alcohol take the lead, following along as an alternate personality comes out in small amounts until it takes me over completely, and then the hedonist in me comes out. I do whatever I want to, so long as it doesn't involve hurting anyone. What had once been a once a week habit, had turned to something that happened every other night. I had inherited that from my carefree father. I was his only child, and he'd had me late in his life, though early in my mother's life. She'd been his 20 year old maid, and he'd been in his 60s when the two spent a few nights doing the horizontal bop, as my father called it. Of course, he'd never married my mother. He'd never married anyone. He preferred freedom over all things. He did take care of me and all I needed though. I was the one person in the whole world that he'd made a commitment to, and he had stuck by it for my entire 32 years of life. He'd sent me to college at UCLA, where I got a bachelor's degree in art history. I hadn't cared what I went to school for since I would never have to work. Richard, that's what I called my father, as he didn't like to be labeled in any way, not even in a fatherly way had chosen my major. He said it would make me more interesting if I knew about art and the history of it all. I supposed he was right. I was popular at his friends' parties because they all had expensive art that they knew next to nothing about, and I could tell them all about their outrageous purchases. People with more money than they could ever spend tend to spend money on things that they believe will add to their fortunes one day. Art was one of those expenditures that anyone worth their salt as a millionaire or billionaire had plenty of. Looking at the painting I'd scored at the last auction my father and I had attended, I took in the priceless piece of art. Well, there eventually was a price put on it, as the auctioneer enticed bidders to start the action at $70 million. And it kept creeping up several hundred thousand dollars at a time. Two hours later, I told my father that I would love to have that painting for my bedroom. So he upped the ante by a million dollars, and I went home with an Amadeo Modigliani oil painting that he'd done in 1917, titled New Couch. The title was French, and it meant nude reclining, and boy was that broad reclining. A hand landed softly on my shoulder as I admired the work of art that hung on the wall facing my bed. She'd emerged from the bathroom without me detecting her movements, which meant she was accustomed to sneaking around. I didn't like sneaky people at all. Did you paint that, Finn? No. I got up to see her out, texting my driver to be at the front entrance, ready to go. It's a rather famous painting done by a rather famous French artist. I won't bore you with the details. Oh. A French artist, huh? Explains the woman's hairy armpits. Gross. I thought the hair under the French woman's arms was on the beautiful side. When a woman felt beautiful all on her own not having to shave every speck of hair from her body, I appreciated that. 
Not that I'd met any woman who was like the one in the painting. I had the idea those sorts of women no longer existed in today's world, at least not in the world I inhabited. Not interested in getting into the history of the painting, I asked, Are you hungry? Starving, she gushed as she leaned in and took my arm, wrapping herself around it. Are you taking me to breakfast? No. I'll have my driver take you anywhere you want, though. You don't want to come with me. No thanks. As we walked down the stairs, I saw her scanning the entrance. I was totally blasted last night. I had no idea you lived in such an amazing home. She batted her false eyelashes at me. I had no idea you've made so much of yourself, Finn. I didn't, I said. And then I heard my father as he came into the foyer from his office just off it. I did. He held out his hand to the woman on my arm as we paused in front of him. And this young goddess is? She giggled. Oh my gosh, aren't you handsome? She held out her hand and my father took it, kissing the top of it like he did with every woman he met. And so formal too. My name's Sydney. Sydney Stone. And I am Finn's father, Richard Murphy. It is a pleasure to meet you, Ms. Stone. It's a pleasure to meet you too, Mr. Murphy. Mr. Murphy was my father. I am merely Richard. My father was in his 90s, but he acted like he was still a young pup. I found it funny. She's on her way out, I interrupted their little exchange, for my father could make that idiotic crap last a lifetime if I let him. I'm having my driver take her to breakfast. It's past noon Finn, he let me know. So he'll take her to lunch then. I moved toward the door, ready to say goodbye to last night's woman and move on with my life. Thanks for the good time Sydney. You too Finn. Should we exchange phone numbers? I shook my head, I wasn't that type of guy. Not on the first date. Not that it was a date at all, but more like a hookup. So, not on the first, second or even third hookup. After that, who knows? Not me. I've never had more than three hookups with anyone, ever. So, don't be offended by anything I say. I say it to all the girls. Have there been many? She asked with wide eyes. I suppose you could say that. Should I be worried about anything? She ran her hand in a circle over her nether regions. You know what I'm asking, right? I get tested regularly and am in excellent health, and we used protectin. So, you have nothing to worry about from me. Good. She breathed a sigh of relief. Well, I guess this is goodbye then. One last kiss? I settled for pecking her cheek, as that's all anyone got from me before we parted ways. Have a great life. You too. She looked around as she stepped out the door. Seems like you've already got a great life though. I know right? Bye now. I closed the door before she could say anything else. When I turned to go and see what the chef could stir up for me to eat, I found my father still standing right there. Oh hey. Patting him on the shoulder, I stepped to the side and tried to walk away. Hang on Finn. He reached out, grasping my arm. We need to talk. Come into my office. Richard, I am famished. Can we talk in the kitchen while Egon makes me something to eat? It won't take long for me to say what I need to say. Then you can get onto the kitchen. He led the way to his office, and I followed. Taking the seat on the other side of his desk as Dad took his chair behind it, I asked, What's on your mind, Richard? You are on my mind, Finn. I have been taking stock of my life recently, and have found that I come up short in certain areas. Areas that you have patterned yourself after your patriarch. Not sure what that means. I looked up at the enormous chandelier that hung high above his desk. Do you never worry that one day, this thing will come crashing down while you're sitting here toiling over whatever work it is that you do, and smash you into bits? I have never worried about that. The men who built this home for me were the finest craftsmen in the entire world. I trust their engineering and laborious work. I wouldn't sit under anything this big. Can we hurry this up please? I had never liked coming into my father's office. Good things rarely came after being summoned into it. Nodding he said, 
Since you like to follow so closely in my footsteps, I feel it necessary to counsel you on where a life like mine will lead you. It's not the best place to be, Finn. It's lonely. I have never settled down with one woman. And now I am alone in life, and it's not the best feeling. You probably could get yourself some company if you wanted. I saw no reason for him to be alone. He had stopped socializing when he'd entered his 80s. The man never exactly said how old he was, preferring to refer to his age by the decade, the 80s, the 90s, etc. Carousing around the party scene to find a suitable woman to spend the night with is no longer an option for me, since I grow tired so easily nowadays. And hiring a woman is out of the question. I don't see why you say that. Terry's father hired a live-in mistress. Terry's father is only in his 60s. In other words, son, he is still a functioning man, and I am just the opposite of that. An old person's body can't do what a younger person's body can do. They make pills for that, I recommended. If you're too embarrassed to buy some, I'll get them for you. That is not what I am looking for in my life anymore. And one day, you will find yourself feeling the same way that I have for years now. Intimacy is a natural part of life and no one should be ashamed of expressing themselves in an intimate manner. Especially when that pleasure is found without needing a commitment. That said, there is only a certain window of time for which that is true. If you live life the way I told you is best, then all you have to look forward to are years of being alone. It's not the best. It's the worst way ever to live. I happen to love my life. I loved mine. Up until my body said no more. Now, it would be nice to have a companion to hold hands with. Someone to wake up to each morning instead of an empty pillow. Someone to just talk to and grow old with. So, young women are out for you. I asked. Is that what you're saying? Because we can make a visit to the old folks home and find you an old woman who would probably love to get to come live here with you and do all that stuff you said you want now. I don't want some old woman who I don't even know. You just aren't understanding me at all, Finn. It's time to find a good woman and settle down with her so that you two can begin living your lives together, instead of alone. That way, when the years have aged you both, you will have a bond that can't be broken. Sounds painful. I'd rather not. It's not as if a leopard can change his spots. Chapter 2 Cecile Sitting on top of a picnic table, I watched as my class of third graders played with each other during recess. My phone made a soft ding, so I pulled it out from the pocket of my skirt to see who had texted me. Mary, another third grade teacher at the school I worked for, sat next to me. Someone interesting texting you, Cecile? Well, I thought he was interesting but from this text, I'm not thinking that way anymore. I rolled my eyes but psyched myself up to tell her everything. So, the backstory on Pete is that he and I were set up by a mutual friend who thought we'd have a lot in common since I'm a school teacher and he's a college professor. We went out to dinner last Friday night. He took me home and asked if he could come inside. When I declined, he nodded and said he understood. He didn't call the next day and I didn't call him either. I've heard nothing from him the entire week, but now that it's Friday again, he texts. What does the text say, she asked as she leaned over to see it. Oh, I see. A booty call, basically. How'd you like to forego the dating crap and get right to the good stuff, she read off my screen before scoffing. And I suppose that's the address to where he lives? Did that man really write that he hopes you'll show up, wearing something attractive for him? Another man who's after only one thing. I didn't bother to reply to the nasty text. Are there no gentlemen in Los Angeles anymore? You know, I'm not sure if there are any left anywhere. Everyone wants to just play the field and avoid commitment like the plague. The longest I've dated a man in the last few years is 10 dates before he just stopped calling. I eventually saw him out with someone else. The last guy the first dated wanted to spend more time in bed than he did actually talking to me. He would take me out to eat, and then ask if I wanted to watch a movie at his place. We'd go back to his and then he wasted no time getting to the making out, followed by carrying me to his bedroom. 
It sounds romantic, Mary said with a gleam in her eyes. I've never been carried to bed by anyone. As romantic as it sounds, there was no romance there at all. I think he carried me so that he wouldn't have to actually ask me if I wanted to have be with him. He did nothing else romantic for me at all. And he most definitely did not want anything long term. The last time I saw him was when I took a toothbrush and left it in his bathroom, so that I would be able to give my teeth a good scrubbing before leaving his apartment the next morning. You left something of yours behind? she asked with wide eyes. Wow. That was a big risk if you didn't talk to him about it before. I found that out the hard way. He changed his number and moved away only a couple of days after I left him the next morning. That's a rookie mistake, Cecile. We had gone out each Saturday night for six months. I thought that was more than long enough for me to be able to leave behind a toothbrush. Guess I was wrong. You were probably his Saturday night girl and he had others for the other nights, she said knowingly. That's how my brother works. He takes Sundays off for family. Other than that, he's got a different girl for each night of the week and so far none of them have found out about what he's doing. I hadn't even thought of that. Maybe I want an old school kind of man, the kind that the good Lord no longer makes. Maybe I should start looking for an older man. She snarled her lip. I'm not into old men. I'm not attracted to any. But if I could get to know one, I might like the way he treated me, then the attraction would surely come. I don't know. Maybe I should just wait for guys around my age to grow up a bit. I've just hit my 30-year mark. Surely, men in their 30s start to grow up and look for something that will last. My brother is 36. Well that doesn't bode well for me then, does it? I couldn't deal with the dating scene in Los Angeles any longer. All I know is that I am out of it all. No more games. No more crazy stands. No more being asked if I want to just sleep with someone before they even ask my name. I'm out. No more dating for me. Not for at least a year. Shock filled her face. A year. An entire year. None. I knew I had to stop trying to find the right man when he just didn't exist yet. I can't take another man wanting only one thing from me. At this stage of my life I need more than a partner. I would settle for just satisfying intimacy. I have a hard time finding even that. That's probably because you have no real connection with the men you've been with. Real feelings have to bring on better connections, and better connections have to mean better intimacy, right? It just has to work that way. And I am ready and willing to wait for that to happen for me. So, no more dating until I actually know the man first. And of course I have to like him. I've been going out with just about anyone, so long as someone thinks I'll hit it off with the guy. So far, I've gone along. But not anymore. You sound like you really mean that, Cecile. I do mean it. I'm so tired of all the fake stuff. I mean, why bother to take me out to dinner if all you want is a one-night stand? I really was done. A year. At least one year. No men. But what if Mr. Wright comes along and you ignore him because of your little hiatus from men? She had a point. I won't ignore all men. If someone catches my attention, then I will see where that goes. But he's going to have to do a lot of talking, some mental connecting, way before we connect our bodies. But I seriously doubt that will happen just at the moment I've finally sworn off men. She patted my hand, looking concerned. I can't imagine that it will affect me that much. I mean a man who wants nothing from you isn't any good anyway, at least not for me. And you just proved that for yourself with what you said. You haven't even had satisfying intimacy, Mary. We deserve more and we deserve better. I'm tired of acting as if all I want is intimacy as well. It's not true. I want so much more than that. Like a hand to hold as we grow old? She asked with a nod. I do want that. I want someone who will hold my hand when I have our babies. I want someone who will bring me chicken noodle soup when I have a cold. I want someone who will be happy just sitting with me on our worn-out sofa, 
watching television while we eat takeout food. Yes? Now you see what I'm getting at. I want to be happy with someone for many reasons, not just one. Intimacy is good and all, but it's not everything. We need more than that. We need someone who we can share everything with. And someone who wants to share everything with us. Mary nodded in agreement. You know, I dated this one guy for a few weeks, and he refused to tell me what his middle name was. When I finally got him to tell me why he wouldn't, you'll never believe his reason. What could knowing his middle name possibly do for you, Mary? Well, he thought that if I knew his entire name, then I could sign his name to anything I wanted and ruin him financially. The real kicker was that this guy had nothing. He drove his mother's car. He lived at his uncle's house, and he worked the night shift at Panjo's Pizzeria. We have certainly found us some real winners, haven't we, Mary? I had stories like hers too. When I was in my early twenties, there was this guy the first went out with one time. He refused to let me see where he lived. And he said that it was because he didn't want me to try to stay with him. He'd had that happen to him too many times, he said. Apparently, women would come and not want to leave. Or so he said. I thought he was crazy. He sounds crazy. I stopped seeing him after he told me that. And then I got really curious and did something so unlike anything I'd ever done before. What did you do? She asked curiously, a bubble of excited laughter about to escape. I stalked him one night. I put my palm on my face, shaking my head as I laughed. I borrowed a friend's car and followed this guy home. And what I found made me sick. What was it? When he pulled into the drive of a nice suburban home, three kids ran out to greet him. They hugged him and said how much they'd missed him while he was away at work. And then a woman came out with open arms and kissed him on the cheek. Mary's jaw dropped. He was married with children. I nodded. I had never quite gotten over that one. Not just married with children, but happily married, with children who adored him. And he'd looked as if he adored them all too. It made me sick. How could he be out on the dating scene, when he had this wonderful family waiting for him at home? It made no sense. And what was worse, he'd lied about having to be away for the entire week. He'd worked right here in Los Angeles, with his home less than 30 minutes away. I know because I followed him home from there. What a jerk, Mary said as she snarled her lip. Did you get out of the car and tell the poor woman what he was doing? No. I couldn't have ever done that. She looked so happy. And there were the children to consider as well. Whatever he was doing, that was on him. I was sure that one day, his wife would figure him out. Do you think that she ever did find out about his secret life? I have no idea. My ideal about love were a bit battered and bruised when I drove away that night. Everyone I tried dating after that guy had their own things too. One after another, bad guy after bad guy. You know what, she asked. It sounds like you're attracted to bad boys. I'm not, I said quickly. Well, it sounds like it. Maybe you just like that weird charisma bad boys all seem to have. Or the devilishly good looks that seem to guy with that kind of man. Angels and demons have been known to attract. The demon loves to pretend that he's good for her. But then he thinks is good for everyone. And breaking an angel doesn't bother a demon one bit. Most times, they actually blame the angel for falling for a man like him in the first place. Ain't that the truth? I asked as I laughed. I am a sucker for attractive guys. Aren't we all? I'm going to have to stop going after the looks that turn me on, and start looking deeper than that. Maybe talking to men who are a bit more average in the looks department is the first step I should take in finding a good man. If all you've been seeing are attractive bad boys, that could be your problem. She smiled. I know that's mine. I love those dang rebels. But then I hate them when I get replaced by another girl whose heart they'll surely break as well. You know the thing is that every single time, I fall for the looks and charm. Even though none of them have satisfied me in bed, I keep on being pulled in by guys like that, hoping that one day I'll find that one man who was made just for me. Well, 
that's most likely not going to happen if we keep looking at guys like that. I had this friend when I was in college at UCLA. He was the most notorious bad boy on campus. The first time I saw him, he was hitting on this girl, and she was all infatuated with his looks and charm. The next day, I saw him using the same lines and tactics on another girl. And the day after that, it happened again. So, when our eyes finally did meet, I just shook my head at him and walked on by without saying a word. We ended up being good friends, with absolutely no benefits. I guess that seeing him in action made my alarm bells go off and stopped me from falling for his lines and charm the way the others had. She nodded her head. You knew better already. I nodded back. Exactly. I knew better than to set my sights on Finn Murphy. I wonder how he's doing nowadays. End of sneak peek for Fake It For Real. A Friends to Lovers Second Chance Romance Accidental Love 3. Thank you for listening to this audiobook. Audio copyright 2024 BFA Publishing. Please like and subscribe to support this channel. It helps more than you know.